A quick reminder, yesterday we talked about vaccines and vaccination. There was a very interesting presentation from Professor Hill, who explained to us uh, how vaccines were developed by AstraZeneca for COVID. We talked about new vaccine concepts in the afternoon. We were reminded of how important centers, community centers and community players are weaving together this uh, beautiful uh, Peruvian bridge, uh, the picture shown by Mrs. Castro. Today we're going to talk about European networks, international partnerships. We're going to talk about cure, progress and extension for acute infections. And obviously, we will talk about collaboration and uh, the One Health approach. The two moderators this morning will be I don't know if Audrey Richard has arrived. Yes, she has. Please, please join me here on stage. Audrey Richard is uh, Operating Director of ERENA and the European Infra Research Infrastructure on Highly Pathogenic Agents. Mr. Wedraogo will be the co-moderator for this third session. He specializes in microbiology and is the uh, Director of the Bobo Dioulasso Center and coordinator of the Reference Center for Resistance to Antimicrobials in Burkina Faso. Just a few words. Because the useful research cannot be conducted by one player alone, the COVID epidemic showed how useful exchanges between scientists were. They're not just useful, they're necessary, absolutely vital. We're going to talk about the role played by European networks, international partnerships, clinical research projects, uh, public health projects. And this is going to highlight why we should organize skills and technical platforms in networks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here and for having invited me at ANRS. The first presentation will be Isabelle de Fourny. Isabelle de Fourny is the uh, president of MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. She joined them in 1990 in Yemen. After five years, uh, she became one of the uh, operative directors in Paris and she became the uh, manager in 2015. She was elected president of this uh, non-governmental body uh, in 2022 and she has a background uh, in the, the development uh, of the uh, new approaches to fight uh, acute malnutrition. Her presentation today is going to explain how Médecins Sans Frontières organizes research and the challenges uh, that uh, they face uh, on a daily basis. Good morning. Thank you for having given me the opportunity to speak about how we think about research uh, within Médecins Sans Frontières. Because uh, we have been very active in the field of research, uh, although we are not being acknowledged for that, but rather for the care we provide for patients. I am a doctor and I've been the president of Médecins Sans Frontières for one year. I am not a researcher by uh, trade, I don't have a background, but I've always uh, wanted to work in this field. Médecins Sans Frontières was created uh, 50 years ago by a group of doctors and journalists. In the meantime, the association has grown enormously. There are several centers coordinating and supporting various programs across the world. The uh, operative center in Paris uh, is in charge of more than 100 projects in 30 countries and two thirds of which are in unstable, politically unstable areas. We have nine, we have a uh, 9,000, uh, we have 9,000 staff members uh, and every year we care for 2 million people, patients in consultation. And in 2021, 243,000 patients were hospitalized. Most of our resources are, come from private donations and are dedicated to the project uh, to the tune of 263 million euros. 
medical services are varied and we care for patients suffering from infectious diseases, malnutrition, chronic diseases such as diabetes, or patients who need psychic, uh, psychological support or who are victim of uh, sex offenders. And uh, this is an important part of our projects, uh, including gynecology and uh, childbirth, uh, 43,000 of which we uh, supported in 2021. Now, where do we work? Uh, we, our ambition is to face uh, inequalities uh, in access to care. It, we, we're talking outbreaks, uh, natural disasters, uh, wars and conflicts uh, with population di being displaced. And the other pillar of our social mission is uh, the, the fact that we can uh, testify and talk about some situations to grow awareness or maybe even report events. Uh, and uh, this can be based on epidemiology data, which are both collected or the result of research. In order to meet the need for quantitative ne uh, data and support our programs, 30 years ago, we created Epicentre. Many of you are certainly familiar with Epicentre. Epicentre is an association managed within Médecins Sans Frontières, but it has its own governance. And uh, the advantage is that it brings together doctors and researchers. And uh, the questions uh, which are asked by our medical colleagues uh, can find an answer or a solution within this centre. And also, we fund our research activity thanks to private donations, and this allows us to choose a subject for research with no external influence. We are free to choose our subjects. The uh, headquarters are in Paris, uh, but Epicentre conducts uh, working, uh, so, uh, research work in uh, Uganda and Niger and uh, across all the Médecins Sans Frontières projects. And I'd like to invite you to the scientific annual uh, scientific day at Epicentre, some of you are familiar with it, it will be the 8th of June in Paris. So what kind of challenges do we face? When, with which situation are research issues uh, going to uh, have a practical uh, outcome? We have a very special relationship with the authorities whether they, it's legitimate or not, and the power struggle is not necessarily in our favor. Often enough, uh, we are facing uh, the fact that uh, healthcare related issues are progressively becoming a political issue, and COVID has shown it. And this translates into a reduced margin for maneuver, reduced access to training, or problems with our interventions. Some uh, research fields or some of or, or, or the context of so the places where we uh, go are dangerous. And I would like to pay tribute to two of my uh, colleagues, Yema and Suleiman in Burkina Faso, because they were killed last month uh, working as humanitarian doctors. And also we have the dominance uh, of uh, infectious diseases, sometimes large scale epidemics and outbreaks. And I'd like to highlight the prevalence of denutrition or malnutrition, children malnutrition. One child out of five, uh, under five, suffers from uh, delayed growth due to malnutrition. Finally, the third aspect, the almost uh, pervasive absence of medical data, epidemiology data from uh, surveillance or data regarding the weight of the diseases. And this lack of data is uh, creating issues when we're facing some very specific situations. For instance, I'll give you an example. When we have to explain why it would be relevant to introduce uh, a vaccine against pneumococcus uh, in Sudan, South Sudan, or when we want to support our diagnostic uh, approach uh, faced with people who have fever. And I can tell about the uh, lack of data regarding the uh, virus uh, responsible for sickle cell disease. And this influences uh, the access to care for malaria. 
And I'd like to give you some examples. We have etiological studies, uh, such as the one regarding the febrile neuromeningeal syndrome for children, which our research is conducted in Uganda, or the cause for diarrhea for children under two in Sahel. Another study consisted in uh, attempting to estimate the incidence, the burden of severe acute malnutrition based on prevalence data. This is useful to uh, plan uh, the uh, deployment of resources and UNICEF uh, has uh, decided to jump in on this particular project. And finally, we also have a, a study in progress considering regarding the incidence of the infection and disease uh, due to Lassa virus uh, contamination in five countries of West Africa. This will help us understand better the burden of this disease, which should be more often suspected than uh, it is. When you're looking at a patient with septic complications, especially uh, pregnant women in Nigeria, we should think about the Lassa fever. So the data is going to help us plan a possible study on a uh, vaccine being currently developed. The second kind of problem that we face, uh, the second kind of challenge that we face, is the lack of uh, tools for prevention, screening and treatment. The tools we have are not adapted to the way we work. The market, unfortunately, is not interesting enough for uh, considering the current uh, research and development economic model. So we have to do our job uh, with tools that are not easy to use. We have uh, logistical issues. We have problems with the, uh, the storage of vaccines in the right temperature and the cooling of vaccines. And uh, the fact that we have to adjust to circulating uh, strains uh, like the Markbo disease or Ebola in uh, South Sudan, or products which are not only produced in limited quantity or situations when we are out of stock in the event of an outbreak like is happening right now for the vaccine against cholera. We are trying to find a solution by investing more in research. We contributed to the development of a new vaccine against rotavirus uh, developed by the Institute of India. It is an oral vaccine which is well adjusted to the uh, situation, it's thermostable, very uh, inexpensive, uh, small storage volume and better adapted to the strain circulating in Sahel. Another example, we became partners of the Thailand uh, Equipe Thailandaise de la Moru. We uh, tried the triple combination of drugs to anticipate the emergence of resistance to uh, anti-malarial drugs. And finally, the lack of uh, or the shortage of uh, available vaccines. A study was conducted in uh, Angola and uh, Congo Republic uh, in 2008 to compare immunogenicity of each of the four pre-qualified vaccines with a dilution to the fifth. And uh, the results allowed us to uh, change uh, and improve the uh, WHO recommendations. Sometimes uh, our challenges uh, are due to the fact that management strategies are lacking when we are facing a large population of patients. For instance, uh, when we try to address acute malnutrition issues. Uh, recently, there was a study in Nigeria to compare the um, monthly distribution of nutritional products to versus uh, a uh, weekly uh, distribution. And weekly distribution means more resources and more work. Uh, and the inferiority was not demonstrated. So unfortunately, the trial will not be non-conclusive. Another interesting example regarding systematic amoxicillin prote uh, prescription for children who suffer from malnutrition with severe complications. This prescription is recommended by WHO and we conducted a study that challenges the recommendation and the result is the following. Prescribing amoxicillin has no incidence on uh, nutritional recovery, but we have uh, observed that it means that people have uh, make more use of uh, uh, doctors uh, and hospitalizations in the arm that did not receive the amoxicillin prescription. Okay, I lost one page. Okay, I'll have to improvise. Sorry, trying to gather my thoughts. 
When looking at the results of this study, we find that uh, the results uh, have to then be implemented depending on the uh, very special situations where they took place. One last study regarding uh, healthcare models, uh, comparing different strategies to prevent acute malnutrition, severe malnutrition, in partnership with the World uh, Food Program. And um, the study revealed that uh, distributing uh, preventive uh, nutrients uh, with cash is the most efficient action and it was adopted by WHO to become a recommendation. Unfortunately, it's barely funded. Emergencies. Emergencies are not a reason to reduce quality and scientific rigor. Several times we were able to uh, organize research in the middle of an emergency or an outbreak. In Guinea, there was a, an outbreak of cholera, and yet we were able to show that we could uh, continue. We showed that both doses uh, of vaccine could be used against cholera, and we showed uh, the uh, short-term efficacy of the first injection. And obviously, that's interesting news uh, when you're facing an outbreak. Another study consisted in using ciprofloxacin uh, when there was a meningitis outbreak, because in the case of uh, meningitis uh, outbreaks, it takes time before the vaccines can reach the villages. And so using ciprofloxacin rapidly has uh, reduced the incidence of the number of uh, meningitis cases. This is an initial trial. It warrants confirmation uh, with other trials on the field. And we also have the example of the hepatitis E vaccine during an outbreak in South Sudan. That's, an that's another interesting example of a study being conducted during an emergency. Something else I'd like to uh, highlight. Professional development for the staff uh, working uh, in research. We're not just uh, aiming at helping them pay for a PhD, but we also want to train them to become leaders or trial managers, uh, taking in consideration the context of the situation. So it means that we have to acquire a better understanding of the context and the negotiation. We, and I think that's important, we encourage women to uh, become uh, researchers. I just came back from West Africa, and the, the, the percentage of women in our projects and our research centers is far too low. And also the relationship uh, with the community is very important. We have staff dedicated to the relationship with the community involved in our projects, research projects. And I'd like to pay tribute to all the people who uh, support us, the administrators, the back office, the people who play an essential role in sometimes very complex situations. Sorry, I'll have a look at my notes. I'd like to talk about uh, a few cha uh, internal challenges that we are facing. So I'll start with the internal challenges. Uh, the first one is a permanent subject for discussion and debate, the funding that we dedicate to research. 10 million euros per year, a little less than 10 million euros per year, which we use to fund our projects, but also These are long-term uh, funds uh, to develop research centers. Another challenge regards dissemination and future use of the project results. Communication and scientific uh, publication are important, but they can't be considered as a final stage and the ultimate aim of our project. What is the real impact of a study? What is the, uh, when is the project uh, 
considered as a success and uh, closed. Research is only a small part of the uh, decision-making process, and obviously there are so many players interfering uh, in the way results are implemented. So if you want my opinion, the problem is not solved yet. Something else we worry about, what role can we play in uh, the preparation for pandemics? And this is a hot topic. For more than 50 years, we did not participate in any large-scale preparation plans. Uh, we prepared uh, for the unexpected. That's more what we like to do. And based on our experience in our training, we identified the skills needed uh, f in our center and for research. So we always uh, gave precedence to the capacity to react because events never happen where you expect them, never the way you expect them to happen, and never with the intensity you would have expected. And based on this observation, which may sound a little simple, and without anticipating on the decisions made, and by, poli made by politicians, on our own level, we try to maintain and develop our own expertise on how to react in, uh, when facing an emergency and how to think when we are involved in an emergency. Something else I'd like to talk about, our relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. At Médecins Sans Frontières, we have always had different approaches, and uh, this was uh, became obvious during the COVID pandemic, for instance, as far as accessibility to vaccines was concerned. The, uh, obviously, people had tended to uh, reject and deny the importance of the pharmaceutical industry because they make a lot of money. But sometimes it is necessary to find a way to collaborate with them. We really have to have an impact on the target product profile, i.e. the uh, main uh, specifications for the uh, screening and treatment uh, resources so that they are adapted to the conditions in which we work. And finally, it is also worth mentioning that some studies can be carried out independently from the drug developers and manufacturers. For instance, where for the uh, rotavirus and the yellow fever vaccine, the studies were conducted with industrial partners, but those industrial partners played no role in the negotiation, nor in the uh, product design, nor in the result publication or data analysis. So we can have our own space, but I know it's difficult both for researchers and authorities to uh, work that way. Partnerships. Partnerships, well, it could mean anything. Partnership for us is about working together for a common aim. And we are in contact with local partners. We work with uh, sanitary authorities uh, in the countries where we uh, organize our interventions. And this makes it easier to uh, keep the results on the national level. Partnerships uh, are sometimes a challenge. Uh, and. Uh, we can uh, find a way to give back the results uh, to the population or organize pro research projects with a better quality level using uh, social resources and going more in depth into subjects such as how to find a modus operandi that is more adapted to the local population. And regarding funding, this is another kind of partner, we have to go towards a wider consortia, and this is probably going to need a case-by-case -case, uh, application. The last challenge I'd like to talk about this morning is decarbonation for healthcare activities, research and healthcare activities. You know that uh, we unfortunately release uh, greenhouse gases and uh, we are thinking, everybody is thinking about how to reduce uh, greenhouse effect gases. At MSF and Epicentre, we are committed to reduce by 50% our carbon print between now and 2030. There will be a panel discussion during the uh, Epicentre scientific day in June that I mentioned earlier. In conclusion, it appears very early on in uh, the Médecins Sans Frontières story that we are uh, organizing a nomadic uh, 
healthcare activity. We have brought together our care and research uh, work within the same uh, structure, which means that we have to keep an eye on the uh, the fact that uh, there is a matching between uh, our wishes and uh, what is done and epidemiology and political decisions. But this requires long-term commitment and research is being inherent to humanitarian action. You don't need to be a good researcher only. You have to be able to decipher the environment, uh, the complex environment that we work and live in, the power struggle in on the political, legal, social and economic level makes the situation very complex. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci à vous. C'est très intéressant. Thank you very much. That was interesting. Because obviously when we think about Médecins Sans Frontières, we don't necessarily think about research. We don't realize that there is a research activity, including uh, during emergencies. Are there, are there any questions? There's a gentleman here and then somebody at the back of the room. Yes, I have seen you. I have seen you. And Mr. Yesdan Abala as well. Yes, Dan, would you like to start? Yes, Dan, go ahead. Okay. No, okay, I'll go. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask a question, which is uh, slightly outside of the field of research. You talked about instabilities. Uh, there are many different reasons for instability. But in the current geopolitical situation and evolution, of the uh, military influence uh, in some African countries. Has that changed? The way we organize sanitary uh, interventions or healthcare interventions. I know we work with local teams, but um, I'll give you a simple example, Wagner. Wagner, do they have an impact on your work? You talked about two doctors who were killed last month. Is this going to be challenged? How do you manage? I myself am the president of an, an NGO. So what do we do? Do we negotiate? Do we leave? Uh, do we refuse to negotiate? I mean, we could spend the whole day talking about that, but I, I'd be remiss if I left here without mentioning it. Well, thank you. Of course, the uh, safety and security issue has an impact on our project. It also has an impact on the local population. We, the way we work is that we try to get people to know us. We try to negotiate a space for us to work. We try to negotiate a kind of authorization for us to do our work. And we do that with all the local players. Not always easy and not always feasible. There are many countries where we we don't go uh, anywhere. We really have to pick the places we want to work where we can be safe. Because safety is the uh, most important factor when it comes to deciding where to work. In Burkina Faso, two of our colleagues were killed while they were traveling to healthcare centers. All activities are in standby in Burkina Faso. We're not going to leave. We're not going to leave Burkina Faso or Sahel countries, but we are reviewing the situation. We want to renegotiate with all the local authorities and players to find the best possible way to work, where to do it, where not to go. And again, there's a matter of needs. But the need is not the reason why we decide to go to a place or not go to a place. It's the safety of a staff that comes first. But I agree with you, this is very complex. And what we do when we are uh, facing situations where there is violence and uh, people are not safe, we try to document uh, retrospe retrospective violence and violence against the local populations. It's not always easy to do because sometimes the local authorities won't allow us to do that. We tried to do it in Chechenia and uh, it didn't work. We, we, it was refused. In Nigeria in 2016, it took quite a while for us to be able to describe uh, retrospective mortality due to malnutrition in uh, populations who were displaced from their 
original uh, area of residence. Um, you wanted to say something about Burkina Faso, Mr. Wudrago? No, I think that Isabel's uh, answer was quite satisfactory. It is necessary to take contact with the local authorities. They will define the priorities, so you have to organize and uh, negotiate the position uh, and the role played by MSF. Uh, and it is a uh, challenge in terms of safety. Yes, yes, Dan, yes, Ampana, and then this gentleman here. Thank you, Isabel, for this presentation, and thank you for being here. We all know that uh, research is part of the uh, solution to a crisis. Uh, but you talked about preparedness. Everybody talks about preparedness. Uh, it's the uh, buzzword. You talked about consortia as well. I heard from your presentation, I mean, we need you. We need you and, and MSF and NGOs in general. We need you for that, for the preparedness. Because so far, we only reacted uh, when the emergency was there. And I felt like you did not really agree with that. You said, well, this has to be done on a case-per-case -case basis, that we uh, are more reacting than uh, acting. Uh, did I understand you well, or am I mistaken? No, no, you understood me well. I mean... <laughs> It's a never-ending discussion. It isn't finished. I'd like to uh, lay the emphasis on the fact that we first and foremost want to uh, have a reaction capacity, but it means a lot of work and it means a lot of preparation. We have uh, emergency stocks. We try to uh, get hold of diagnostic uh, or screening tests and the drugs we need. We try to think about strategies. We try to identify uh, the skills we need. So, you know, everywhere we go and work, teams that have uh, what we call IPREP, emergency preparations. So we have uh, organized our preparedness everywhere across the world. But again, our, the idea for us is to be able to face an unexpected event and react fast, regardless of the intensity of the event. So it's not quite the same thing. It's not really the issue of uh, preparedness for research to have the right type of vaccine, the right type of screening kit, the right type of antibodies when you need them. The uh, the question remains open. We can't be ready for everything, and we sometimes have to make choices, and we're afraid of having invested too much in one subject or in one country, and then nothing happens there and the event happens elsewhere. But unfortunately, that's not something that we can uh, really uh, manage. Uh, the, room, the question is still open, and some uh, of our staff are working on projects to prepare for epidemics and outbreaks. So we're open to the discussion, but it isn't over. Sir Charles Confort from Cameroon, thank you, Isabel, for this presentation. I'm interested more by um, the ciprofloxacin study as a prophylactic agent. How much time do you give to the patient? How long do you give it to the patient until the vaccine arrives and why ciprofloxacin rather than the molecule which is often used? Uh, have you uh, carried out a cost efficacy ratio study, ciprofloxacin versus the other drugs? I'll try and answer all the questions. Giving an antibiotic is an idea that was based on the observation that regardless of the speed at which we react, there is we need, it takes time before the vaccines uh, are delivered. <coughs> and in some cases, when we're facing epidemic uh, outbreaks of um, meningitis, it is uh, easier to give an antibiotic uh, because otherwise there are too many deaths. Now, ciprofloxacin, I know that its efficacy was reviewed 
to uh, fight uh, the uh, germs responsible for meningitis, so we know the efficacy. We also look at, looked at the efficacy when we give a single dose. Very simple. The big question that remains unanswered, I mean, meningitis outbreaks can unfortunately affect a huge number of people, so you'd have to distribute massive quantities of uh, antibiotics to the local population, and that raises the question of possible resistances to antibiotics. But we have shown that the incidence will be decreased by 40 percent, which is significant. But it warrants a uh, bigger study, maybe other antibiotics, and think about whether we can use uh, the antibiotics uh, widely in a massive way and uh, not taking consideration possible antibiotic uh, resistances. So with the WHO, we had thought about this administration of antibiotics to malnourished children because uh, we are in some situations we distribute omoxicillin in a massive way to children suffering from malnutrition to avoid infections. Are there more questions? Otherwise, we can move on. No more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Isabelle de Fourny. Merci. Intervention suivante. Next uh, speaker. The next speaker will be uh, Piero Oliaro. He's going to talk about uh, setting up of multicentric uh, clinical trials in Europe during an epidemic. He will provide the example of the mosaic trial. I think this gentleman is. Uh, Connected uh, remotely, uh, Piero is a foreign member of the Academy de Medicine, professor of uh, infectious diseases in the Oxford University, and also the scientific director of ESARIC, an international consortium for respiratory acute infections, and the uh, Oxford uh, Institute for Pandemic Sciences. Uh, he worked for 25 years in the research program for infectious diseases at WHO. He is interested uh, by the uh, stakes of clinical research in the context of an epidemic because there have been uh, failures and therefore we need to understand the systemic reason which underlie these uh, failures so that we can overcome them. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Piero. Merci. Thank you. Can you all hear me? I can you hear me loud and clear? Great. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizers and Yazdan for inviting me. It, and I apologize also for not being here in person. I think it's safer to stay home and work from home today in these times of strike and not get stuck in public transport. So I'm doing this presentation on behalf of my colleagues All of my colleagues at ANRS in particular, with whom we are collaborating uh, on the Mosaic project in particular, but uh, on other projects as well. Now my colleagues include Josephine, Elise, Amanda, Peter, Laura in person in particular. So we need to look at the challenges behind uh, clinical trials in Europe in particular. We need to look at the problems that may, we may be faced with. When you miss the boat, uh, well, generally, there are dire consequences and you pay a dear price for missing the boat. That is something that uh, we know fully well. We've seen this happen over and over again in past epidemics. Setting up a clinical uh, research uh, often happens too late. Once the epidemic has uh, peaked already and the number of infections has started to wane. Well, COVID is not the right example. It, those were unique uh, circumstances. We were dealing with a pandemic with 
a peak number of infections. Most epidemics are different. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation where the epidemic response may have started very early on, but there's also clinical research going on, but that happens at a later stage. And those of us who've been involved in the research response uh, to the 2014-2016 Ebola epidemic, I'm sure everyone remembers it. Those were difficult times. And when we fail, well, we fail together simply because we were unable to set up uh, the clinical research effort uh, in time. And we were involved in a number of studies, but those studies were only set up after the number of infections has started to climb. And this means that we actually, it only happened once the infections and the number of infections has started to wane. And this means that we were unable to put together sufficient cohorts. So, obviously, things have changed by 2018 when the Ebola outbreak emerged. But this is something that we should always keep top of mind. So, there are strategies that are available to us uh, so we can set up an effective and efficient response in terms of clinical uh, research uh, in the event of uh, an outbreak. During the outbreak, of course, but there's also a lot of work that needs to be done before and after the outbreak. We need a multimodal approach, first and foremost. We firmly believe that we need to set up a system to set up observational and interventional studies. We need a framework that will be conducive to both types of studies. We need to put things together so we can achieve sufficient clinical evidence. I'll get back to that in a minute, but we need a system, uh, a self-standing system for observational studies. We also need uh, an alert system. For example, when new variants uh, or new infections or show up, we need to sound the alert. Also, we need a system for clinical characterization of uh, diseases. We also need to describe the impact of the different treatments that we're testing. And for that, obviously, we need to set up a multi-country collaborative framework so we can test new products. In particular, we'll test the products that are already available to us. In a minute, I will discuss the Mosaic study, which is uh, currently underway. And there are other studies as well that are ongoing. Most of the diseases that we are dealing with do not have their own well-established methodology. So we need to come to an agreement on the parameters, first of all, for characterizing the disease, but also uh, characterizing the impacts of our interventions. Another very important thing, we need a baseline system. We need uh, a regulatory environment. We need the right political conditions. so as to uh, promote and enable the setting up of uh, such activities. Now, if we're looking at mpox or monkeypox, using that as an example, an example of the multimodal approach I was uh, referring to, something that we really believe in. When I say I actually mean we, I mean we, the at Oxford University and every other partner that we're working with. Already we started before COVID broke out. We already 
contemplated setting up a program for expanded access. I mean, uh, uh, compassionate reasons. Now, a program for expanded access to Tekavirimet for MPOX in Central African Republic. Unfortunately, COVID broke out and we were unable to get started until 2021. But uh, the extended access program activities are underway and so far we have treated 25 patients. The previous presentation, well, while listening to it, I received uh, new photos of a case that we're currently treating in the CAR. So we initiated uh, a diagnostic study uh, working together with FIND. So there are major challenges in the Central African Republic, but also in Europe and elsewhere. Early diagnosis, early diagnosis of MPOX is one such challenge. And we are testing out the performance of three uh, RDTs, uh, rapid detection tests and two molecular rapid tests as well in the Central African Republic. We have also set up a randomized control test called platinum, so tecovirimet versus placebo. So the platinum test is in the UK. So far we have recruited 30 or so patients. Of course, we also have the mosaic study that we will discuss in a minute. Uh, we can together with a NRS in the Geneva Teaching Hospital, as well as other teaching hospitals in Europe. So these are three studies that we can learn from, not just in terms of clinical characterization of the disease, or between clade to be in clade one, but also the impacts of treatments. And also there's something that we've been doing for a while now. It's a clinical characterization protocol or CCP in collaboration with the, uh, with the Nepal University. And we have four confirmed cases of MPOX in the UK. So, MPOX. At the moment, there are about 86,000 infections in the world. Mortality is very low. Only 99 reported cases, including 26,000 in Europe and five deaths. I've said it before, but I will say it again. We said this uh, very early on when the epidemic started. The world woke up suddenly to monkeypox, but monkeypox has been around for ages. And we haven't done much to fight that disease. And there's a, there is a vaccine treatment available now. It's been approved for monkeypox, but not available in Africa. Uh, unless the circumstances are very specific. But that is a case that we will discuss in a minute. So clearly there are inequalities between regions across the world. I also want to say that we were quick to set up a number of activities and yet The populations treaty, treated in the different studies are, are still limited. So we keep asking ourselves the question of whether or not we'll be able to assess efficacy of tecovirimet as a treatment. You can see a number of curves on the screen. So red means the whole world and green <coughs> means Europe. And you see the different clades. For example, on May 11th, and that's very early on, as the epidemic was uh, uh, was only beginning. We started recruiting young patients into this uh, uh, CCP observational study in the UK. 
On July 4th, Independence Day, we recruited uh, the first uh, patient uh, into the mosaic study. At a time when WHO declared uh, an emerging situation at the end of July, mid-August, uh, uh, the platinum study began enrolling patients. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, an equivalent uh, study began mid-September called STOMP. But in Europe, we had to wait until the end of uh, September before the European Union started uh, uh, purchasing Tecovirimet. It is only in, in late September that the EU began purchasing Tecovirimet as a more systematic treatment for that infection. So the different uh, uh, studies for MCLAD 2A, 2B, and CLAD 1. A quick explanation, if I may. There are two main CLADs for MPOX virus. CLAD 1 is found in Central Africa, in the DRC in the Central African Republic, and etc. And clade 2B is found in Western Africa. And it is uh, All right, I turn things around. Apologies, said the speaker. Let me start from the top. A clade 2B <coughs> was the source of that global epidemic. So there's been a number of RCTs, including platinum. I talked about that and the Canadian equivalent. And the step in, they haven't started enrolling patients yet. And STOMP is the equivalent study in the U.S., uh, initiated by NIH in the U.S., but also in other Central and African countries, including in South Africa. So WHO has a protocol which is rolled out uh, in the form of three different studies. One such study is called epoxy, and it's in Europe. Unity is the equivalent study in Switzerland, Brazil, and in other countries in the future. So they're busy recruiting patients. And the third version is called MOSA for Africa. And that's still being developed. They haven't started enrolling patients. So there's a number of observational studies as well uh, for provision of tecovirimat. Uh, it's part of the expanded access program. So those uh, studies include Mosaic, CCP UK, but also the CGC program in the US. Apparently, they treated as many as uh, 7,000 patients with tecovirimet. WHO has set up its own MEURI system for monitored emergency use of unregistered investigational interventions for treatments such as tecovirimet. And as I said before, there's a study that is ongoing with the Pasteur Institute in the Central African Republic. So let me say a couple of words about Mosaic. Mosaic is a study that is taking place in Europe, including eight uh, European Union countries, plus the UK and Switzerland. It's being sponsored by Oxford University and coordination at EU level is done by ANRS. ANRS, uh, M -I -N, as far as Switzerland is concerned, coordination provided by the university hospitals, the teaching hospitals in Geneva. So uh, 167 cases have been confirmed. Enrollment in three different countries, France, Switzerland, and the UK. And very soon we will start analyzing the results. And we will also share them. So here's the idea. 
The idea is to look at the clinical presentation and the progression of MPOX clade 2B. Whether or not it is being uh, treated using tecovirumab. So the patients enrolled may be hospitalized or not. But the virus, uh, the inbox virus, has to be confirmed by a laboratory. They're, the patients are only enrolled if they, uh, if the PCR test is positive. So, we were planning to enroll as many five hundred patients initially, but this is where. The rub lies. There are challenges that we are faced with. First of all, the system is extremely complex. It's a centralized, harmonized system. But that harmonization, um, that the harmonization is not a hundred percent. This means. It's a very time-consuming process. Uh, securing the permits takes time. And also, every time we make a change, every time we bring in an amendment, it takes a lot of time. Uh, the median number of days was 46, ranging between uh, 41 and 52. That's how long it takes to get approval. And unfortunately, Approval for some countries only came after the number of infections has started to wane. And as you can see on the screen, in the course of one month only, we had prepared the protocol. And the protocol had been approved by the, by the central mechanism. In other words, we sub we made this submission via the central mechanism called CTIS, and the study had already been approved in Switzerland. So, as I said before, one problem is that in Europe the study was considered as an interventional study, even though Teco Verimet has been approved as a treatment for MPOX in Europe. And this has led to a number of complications. Uh, organizational problems, and also the approval system is extremely complex. Mr. Oliaro, I apologize, but we're going to need you to, to wrap up soon. OK, I'm almost there. So what are we suggesting? How can we move forward? We need to harmonize the different uh, national requirements. There's a bunch of technical obstacles that we can overcome, that we can mitigate. Also, it's an expensive system. Staffing is expensive, and is, the cost is particularly high for partners such as universities and nonprofits. And we also need to get back to our. We need to review our definition of uh, an observational study. Okay, I'm going to cut this short. And just a couple more slides. I believe that it is essential uh, when fighting epidemics, it is essential to lay the groundwork. We need a preparatory phase uh, during which we, we do capacity building. Uh, we need to build research capabilities. And also during the execution phase, we need to quickly initiate clinical studies. We need to move in quickly as the epidemic is starting to emerge. And also we need to implement guidelines. We need to ensure fair access to medications, the medications that uh, 
we discovered based on the studies, and also we need to make the whole system long-term and sustainable. A quick word by way of conclusion. There's something we need to keep top of mind. Everything that we are doing, all of our research efforts, lead to products. And if we find that the products are effective and efficient, they need to be made available to people uh, in a fair way. What we need is equity. What we need is justice. And so it's important in terms of clinical research, but we also need to make sure that we create an environment that is conducive to, to making sure that the products that we end up with are made available to people and are affordable. And many thanks to our different partners. And that's it for me. This is not a unicorn. Thank you very much. Est-ce qu'il y a des, des questions pour uh, Any questions for Piero Oliaro in the audience? No questions. I don't see anybody raising their arms. Uh, what about the moderators? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, we do have questions. Should I? By all means. Uh, Dr. Oliero, you specifically talked about the impact studies that uh, were set up in 2022 during that international outbreak. Uh, you didn't really dwell on everything that was done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, this is a situation that we're all familiar with, but could you tell us what you've learned from the pandemic and have you been able to harness that knowledge while dealing with that new monkeypox crisis or are those lessons not applicable because it's an entirely different scale? Very good question. Thank you for asking. Tough question, though. Um, Here's, here's the answer, short and sweet. The lessons that we may have learned during the COVID pandemic have not been implemented in the monkeypox context for various reasons. Uh, number one, you can't compare apples and oranges. When you have a pandemic, uh, there is a high number of infections over a long period of time. Uh, you can't compare a pandemic with an epidemic, which is which happens within a much shorter time frame in fewer countries. So you have fewer patients available. Also, there are lessons we've learned, but that we have not implemented when it comes to preparedness and response to epidemics. There is uh, one aspect that I touched upon, however. There's a regulatory framework and also there's an envir there's a political environment and neither was conducive to an effective response. Neither was conducive to harnessing that knowledge. Obviously, there's a difference between individual suffering and a deadly epidemic. If we'd already had clade one, then the situation would have been entirely different. Another question, and then I'm afraid we'll have to move on to the next speaker. As a subscript to the previous question, How do you make sure that uh, research outcomes actually turn into uh, medical products or medications that are actually affordable and accessible to those regions of the world that need them the most? Thank you for that question. That is a, an issue that I touched upon very quickly at the end of my talk, but it is key to everything we do. As I said before, We carry out studies, and uh, as we do so, 
we we need to have discussions with the various uh, stakeholders. There are different players that we need to talk to to make sure that the product is available. Number one, also it needs to be available at affordable prices. Uh, take uh, take a very much, for example, that is a product. And in the U.S. system, that product is being stored or stockpiled. We're talking thousands and thousands of doses. And that treatment was not available in Europe for a very long period of time. I don't forget about Africa. And that product has not even been registered in Africa. So we've worked on Tecoverimat, and there was an opportunity to talk to uh, labs, manufacturers, and we have received donations, but donation, there's only so, they only go so far. So it's a systemic problem, and we need to work on it long term. And we need uh, government intervention. Thank you very much. Let's now hear from the next speaker. Congratulations to Piero Oliaro. All right, next speaker, Alice <coughs> Duclos. Alice Duclos is, a, is a research director at the Research uh, Institute for Development in Montpellier. She's a health anthropologist. She mostly worked on HIV in Western Africa in Southeast Asia. She worked on drugs, uh, gender, um, EIDs, uh, such as COVID-19 and Ebola. Currently, she's working on the pandemic preparedness, risk reduction, addictions in West Africa. Uh, Today, at a time when emerging epidemics m require a multidisciplinary approach to research, we're just going to talk about the challenges if for social sciences, particularly in West Africa. Anthropologists have a deserved reputation that they have too much to say. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having uh, asked me to uh, deliver a presentation on this topic. I have a question mark in my title because this is a question still unanswered. The uh, discussion is still open. I'd like to review the current uh, situation for human and social science research and why it's relevant. I'll show you some examples of projects and I would like to discuss uh, the future perspectives and the way ahead. I'd like to come back on the uh, historic model regarding research, VA, HIV research, because the model is uh, mostly attributed to ANRS fundamental research for the scientific community dedicated to uh, an application uh, in this by the sanitary authorities uh, in the countries, in southern countries with a structuring effect for research partnership and a real scientific community that developed uh, in both south and northern, southern and northern countries. And from starting from the HIV, we went on to develop social sciences in the field of uh, healthcare to support uh, the development of an ethical reflection and research with uh, associations, which has become a community research. So we shift to a different scale with uh, the extension of a pandemic um, threat. And some of the things, many of the things that I'm going to introduce have actually been implemented and put into practice with COVID. And this is also what has helped a and I has moved to emerging infectious diseases. Now, what are the challenges? Uh, the uh, extension of the uh, subject to other diseases uh, where there is a social expression of risk, the opening to the uh, issue of animal health and relationship to the environment. And in social sciences, there is already a lot of literature on the subject. And it's also we need to involve uh, the different disciplines uh, from social sciences. 
For zoonosis and resistance to antimicrobials, we have to have a, uh, a horizontal approach and we have to bring together a common basis, i.e. designs, concepts on which we uh, have uh, shared definitions that we agree on. And we have to open ourselves to non-scientific knowledge, uh, experiment, patient association, professional communities such as vets. There is also the challenge of uh, timelines. We have to align ourselves on emergencies, meaning that we have to mobilize our capacities in an emergency. But we want to work on the long term and therefore we have to think about and ask questions about preparedness, avoiding one shot uh, repeated work to think more in terms of uh, long term strategy. The research, the field of research evolves a lot all the time. We have seen this morning NGOs that have been working for more than 20 years in the field of research. We have a uh, United Nations body which uh, are trying to define research strategy with which uh, to uh, organize collaborations. There is also the uh, issue of methods because WHO really uh, lies the emphasis on the fact that we should be able to provide evidence which is not directly linked to a, a statistical meaning but especially a qualitative meaning and we have to renew equal opportunities in science uh, with a need for symmetry and uh, ever since uh, human social uh, human and social sciences community have developed in the South, we have to find an equal distribution of research uh, and uh, possible uh, gaps between people collecting uh, data in the South and people publishing the data in the North. <coughs> social sciences uh, and multi-sites. I'd like to remind uh, the uh, global research strategy that developed for COVID. February 2020, COVID and WHO organized a meeting to define the uh, research priorities by disciplinary uh, field. A research group uh, was set up for social sciences. They met twice a month and they launched appeals. They coordinated the uh, research on masks, uh, triage practices, healthcare professionals, and the role played by communities. <coughs> this uh, horizontal multi site uh, was uh, used in several countries. Uh, there is a cumulative relevance of data on uh, rare phenomena and vulnerable populations and there is a, an essential comparative value in my discipline anthropology i mean this is what i i make a living with we work on comparison and uh, comparison allows us to understand uh, why the context is going to give the biological phenomenon a different shape now there is the issue of scale and in order to achieve a certain level of representation and a certain level for comparison, uh, which means that we have to make uh, reasoned choices uh, regarding the sites based on uh, research uh, as a hypothesis. Now, there is also another way to manage the multi-site, a vertical approach, a strategy defined on the global level. How do we interpret it on the regional level, the local level? How is it applied by the national institutions and administrations and in local life? How is it organized and how does it circulate between the various levels? I'd like to add something uh, for Yazdan's uh, sake regarding the project uh, for preparedness uh, for pandemics. The idea was to understand what we mean by global order. Global order, does it mean practices, concepts? The project uh, started in 2019, just before COVID. <clears throat> and there was a beautiful case study and we were able to observe the differences between what was planned and what was actually achieved and uh, experience was more used as a model i'll give you an example people were uh, there was a lockdown in uh, epidemic centers of people with symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, COVID and that in Africa was mainly due to the previous experience with Ebola and we analyzed the weight of uncertainty or the weight of scientific ignorance and how it was managed by 
you know, build, building the ship while you're already navigating on the ship, as the WHO likes to say. So we also have to work on the uh, itinerary of uh, displaced populations. And finally, we are facing another kind of challenge that we call in uh, French deterritorialization. We remove the, uh, we, 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 we walk away from the territory concept. And location of the impact is absolutely essential. In the Ariakov program, we worked on information. And uh, the example that I'm going to mention regards the way in which the message, which was disseminated by a uh, uh, Professor Raoul on YouTube uh, claiming that chloroquine was efficient was uh, interpreted in four countries. And within 10 days, we could see all kinds of uh, chloroquine derivatives, uh, fake or non-fake, distributed by uh, street vendors in Burkina Faso, in local markets in Cameroon, and in the Marabou uh, market in Senegal and Benin, uh, and people started uh, self-treating themselves uh, in a more or less institutionalized way. And this brought about other countries. Sometimes it was used with amoxicillin, and uh, this raised a number of questions regarding possible resistance to antimicrobial drugs, which may have uh, happened following this uh, self-administration. Regarding the multi-site, there is also a point regarding the articulation with local healthcare authorities. Following Ebola, as of 2020, the African WHO office created a sanitary emergency office divided in two hubs, one French speaking in Dakar for Central and Western Africa and one English speaking for Eastern and Southern Africa. During COVID, Africa CDC also emerged and they have uh, offices divided in sub regions and the West African office is managed by the uh, West African healthcare organization in Bobo Dioulasso. And it's the scale that really makes a sense for the region and for the social science uh, work in the South. We work on how to adjust to the context and it allows us to Combine in the multi single site results uh, the uh, relationship to the local administration and the relationship with the sub regional level with multi site organization. Two words regarding the constraints and the, the challenges of a multi site organization. I mean, it's, it's for social and human sciences, it's the same like in other disciplines, except that we're not very numerous, so we need more researchers. The networks can help us develop inter-team relationships and mobilize our researchers. And that brings, provides me with a transition for the next topic. I'd like to start talking about a historical network, a, a network with a few researchers that emerged spontaneously <coughs> during the Ebola crisis <coughs> and outbreak. It was created by researchers who worked in the neighboring countries in which the social representations on the outbreak were already being created before the outbreak happened. Because the outbreak did not happen in all the countries and the scientific exchanges on the uh, approach and the quick dissemination of data and uh, subjects for research, the need to understand and make people understand what we could contribute. So we organized a, a conference with 150 people. We supported the uh, researchers in the weakest sites because in Guinea there was no social science research laboratory. Now they have the surfing multidisciplinary uh, laboratory. So that weakness has been overcome. But we developed uh, collaboration projects, uh, study days uh, and uh, we went over the whole process from the design to sharing of the results based on the anthropological approach. Damara Givernic, who is uh, Gilles Vernic, who is an anthropologist for Institut Pasteur here in Paris and could not attend this morning, had enough energy to bring together the networks that had been working on Ebola, including the English speaking ones, but also players, researchers who worked on HIV who worked on uh, resistance to antimicrobials. And together, they built a network over three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, 
to in order to obtain uh, a support for a project uh, H 2020. And uh, there were 11 and then 17 institutions. And the aim was to get to know each other, know exactly who works on what, develop relationships, encourage collaboration, reinforce the teams. And they worked with a registry and uh, access to the uh, research uh, results uh, for our partners. They worked on key subjects such as uh, social inequalities, vulnerability, and the governance approach uh, in the response to, uh, in the reaction to uh, a pandemic in such a way that social dimension was taken in consideration. Sona Global also released uh, validated method uh, tools uh, which uh, were used as models subsequently to explore social vulnerabilities and uh, the community uh, involvement. They also published uh, transversal papers and organized webinars on social sciences progress uh, during the pandemic. The uh, CRCF and IRD were closely involved uh, in the training with our colleagues from the University of Amsterdam and we developed four training curricula, two on epidemics, two on resistance to antimicrobial drugs. Two for social science researchers uh, whom we wanted to inform on this very specific subject, uh, emerging uh, infectious diseases and outbreaks. And the other curriculum was uh, dedicated to the partners uh, so that they could understand the uh, relevant uh, topics in social sciences and those on which they could collaborate with researchers. These curricula can be downloaded from the Sona Global website. And our colleagues uh, in Amsterdam went even further because they actually uh, shot a video MOOC on the social dimensions of AMR. It's really good. The SHS Ebola network uh, started redeploying and it was reinforced to become an anthropology network for emerging epidemic epidemics. We see that social, from social sciences, we limited ourselves uh, to anthropologists uh, because that was the uh, discipline really that we need to apply. We're sorry that the other disciplines, uh, so, uh, science, social sciences disciplines were not represented. In Western Africa, IRD uh, supported an international research group with five African sites uh, and the support of two laboratories in France, LPED in Marseille and Transvilimi in Montpellier. And again, the idea was to develop uh, social sciences, uh, both on the quantitative and qualitative level, getting to know each other through uh, registries, having access to uh, results, exchanging results and sharing project uh, research projects. And we thought we had to develop uh, to res resources in French, the curricula in English, but we wrote a book in French. And here you have all the subjects covered in the handbook, including uh, method methods, uh, because uh, they were updated the following COVID. And uh, we, here, we have here the main topics, but always limited to human health. It's also a resource used, a uh, material used for training when we want to train uh, researchers and uh, lecturers in social sciences. There was a uh, training cycle for 25 researchers uh, from uh, Western Africa. It was held in Senegal, but there was also a training in Burkina, in the Pasteur Institute here in Paris. And there will be soon a training uh, held uh, in the Madagascar um, Pasteur Institute for researchers who work in the field of social sciences. I'd like to say a few words about a research group that was div that emerged within a platform where they coordinate uh, the response to COVID in Western and Central Africa. With the new WHO organization, this platform coordinated the work for French speaking countries because in between IRD and WHO, we thought that 
among the pillars, uh, we needed a uh, an operational research uh, pillar to encourage and foster exchanges between players and researchers so that the uh, strategies are better informed by research and also because we want research topics to emerge from local needs. So there were needs emerging uh, regarding vaccination and uh, the uh, halfway uh, strategy uh, in 2020. Lastly, how do we reinforce social sciences uh, through a future network? The networks I have mentioned already are existing, but they are limited both in terms of discipline and also regarding human health. So I carried out a, an opinion poll with 12 researchers who worked in southern countries uh, or from southern countries. I'll just go over it very quickly. They want to uh, upscale knowledge and skills and they often refer to what was done by ARS in the past and how much they appreciated that. They also expressed uh, the need to train young people, but northern country and southern countries together because that lays the, the basis for future collaboration. They also talk about methods, maybe using uh, in social sciences, uh, social observatory models that would be updated at each epidemic or outbreak, and also encouraging uh, transdisciplinarity. Uh, some people have experience uh, in animal health uh, and one health, uh, such as CIRAD. And finally, the expectations regarding the disciplines we really need for legal sciences, how to review the international sanitary regulation and connections with the local uh, legislation where the whole economy of research would be developed, for instance, as it was for COVID. And finally, in the aim of uh, avoiding fragmentation, the HIV model was uh, extended to tuberculosis and hepatitis, but we don't want silos to develop disease per disease in a very fragmented way. Finally, exchanges with the operational players, because nowadays in the One Health platforms or the platform for the use, uh, the appropriate use of antibiotics locally and nationally, we have a uh, social science researcher who's fairly isolated and we want to solve that. So how do we, where do we go from now? What about the way ahead? We have seen the scientific advantages of role played by networks. Networks are where people can think and exchange and support research projects. It is useful to connect the projects, mature the projects, work on uh, the division of subjects, uh, identify the topics to investigate developing the uh, complementarity between the sites. And once the projects have been uh, conducted and we're facing challenges due to a political situation, for instance, there are ways to uh, reorient the project. And clearly, we need more visibility. On top of the uh, reaction capacity, we need more visibility for Western Africa and Central Africa. We have a model with the SONAR Global and MARA to articulate projects uh, in a um, global or almost global network. And we should also have regional or sub-regional networks depending on the language spoken or the geographical considerations. And ANRS uh, is located in the same area, so we could use that as an example. Maybe it's a utopia, but I would like a network south, south and north, north of French speaking countries. And that's where the uh, question mark comes into play. I wanted to give you food for thought. And I thank you for your attention. And I thank the researchers and the institutions for all the work uh, in progress. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions des modérateurs? Are there questions from the moderators or from the audience? Before we ask uh, the uh, audience, I have a very naive question. We talk about preparedness all the time, preparedness for pandemics, uh, research and development. Can that be done also for social sciences or do you only work on the response but not the preparedness? Well, we work on the societies even before the outbreak happens. But the, the point here is that we want to articulate uh, the knowledge and the uh, 
fundamental questions and the emerging epidemics and generate some certainty regarding the future epidemics, what kind of questions will be asked. And the, the whole point of uh, preparedness is to articulate the uh, fundamental research, adding data which can be, re be relevant for uh, human health, but also one health. And uh, preparing uh, additional uh, research modules that can be activated uh, during an acute phase or immediately after the crisis. I didn't have time to talk about that, but a very important subject is recovery and the social responses uh, in the community following an outbreak. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience for the anthropologist? Please go ahead. Do we have another microphone? We have an issue with the microphone. Oui, bonjour, Franck Remoy, IRD. Merci, Alice, pour ce développement de. Thank you very much, uh, Alice, uh, for this beautiful work and developing the networks for anthropology. I have a question regarding networks such as the RAE network that you mentioned at the end. Do you think we you can open this kind of uh, network? for two researchers working on arboviruses uh, or malaria because they have uh, skills. You mentioned Burkina Faso, Senegal, Ivory Coast. Maybe it's the same people working on the anthropology of arbor arboviruses and uh, malaria. So do we, do you think you can open the network? to those uh, people. Well, thank you very much for this question. It is one of the stakes, one of the challenges. Do we need to remain focused or do we want to open up our network? And it's difficult to define a, a border. RAE and Sona Global are open to members who can work on many different subjects to create a common think tank And defined teams uh, will uh, focus on a given subject and will be able to talk, think about the common aspects and th those aspects uh, where there is a difference. So it's really a key issue. How far can we go? How far can, should we go? Because the opening may uh, lead to the, the subject being diluted. And the, the term emerging uh, infections makes no difference. The uh, question mark can be renegotiated as the uh, news uh, evolve. Ah non. Alors nous ne pouvons pas entendre tout de suite euh, l'interlocuteur suivant parce qu'il est il va arriver. Uh, the next speaker is late uh, due to transportation issues. So we have Nathalie Bergo, who will now deliver the next presentation. Yes, I'd like to introduce Nathalie Bergo. She has a master's uh, for research in human sciences, specializing in uh, European project uh, projects. Uh, she works for the Hospice Civil de Lyon. She manages different actions in which the uh, Biological Resource Center is involved, the National Center, uh, Reference Center for Viruses and Respiratory Infections, and the sequencing uh, platform EPI. Regarding the European project, she coordinates actions for the Les Hospices de Lyon, and she manages a working group on biological samples and coordinates activities in connection with the philological analysis uh, of the discovery trial. Today, uh, Nathalie contributes to the creation of uh, virology uh, laboratories in 10 European countries, and these uh, laboratories uh, can uh, use the same uh, efficacy uh, method uh, in for uh, clinical trials so that we can obtain comparable results in a very short period of time. And she's going to tell us about uh, how to uh, create a network between laboratories to accelerate and reinforce the response to the emergence of respiratory viruses. Welcome. Oh, et merci à l'NRS de nous avoir accordé. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, many thanks for giving us this time, so we can introduce that uh, 
this small network of ours. We have set up a network of virology laboratories around a shared technique. Now, here's the background that was that took place as part of the discovery trial that you must have heard about. Brainchild by the brainchild, the professor Florence Sader, to uh, evaluate the uh, safety and efficacy of anti COVID treatments. This is a French trial. We expanded it uh, to other European countries as part of the EU response project. So, the goal of the EU response project was to create a European network of adaptive trials to fast track anti COVID 19 response and ultimately to fast track our fight against other infectious diseases. The Hospice Civil de Lyon, whom I represent today, were, as I said before, involved in two aspects, uh, um, biological sampling together with the Biological Resource Center, of which I am a part of. And when it comes to analysis work, we served as the virology expert for that trial. As a result, we were in charge of the analysis work together with the National Reference Center for uh, respiratory viruses and infections. Anything having to do with sequencing, we worked with the GNP platform. So the ultimate goal of our small network of that European project was, of course, to get ready. It's about preparedness. We wanted to fast track and strengthen a response to the emergence of new respiratory virus. The COVID crisis is something that we all experience and we're trying to learn from it. I know it's not always easy, but we are starting to learn a few things. During COVID, we realized that there were many different studies. That's a good thing. And lots of outcomes. That's a good thing as well. But looking at all those results, we, we realized that comparison was extremely difficult, particularly when it comes to measuring antiviral efficacy. The techniques used may be different. And there may be gaps between outcomes, between results. So as part of the discovery trial and that EU response project, we decided it would be a good idea to work on obtaining comparable and reliable results within a short period of time. We set that up as part of the discovery trial. But like I said, the idea is to have a uh, sustainable network that can be responsive, that can be responsive should a new virus emerge. And of course, we need to provide a quick response. We need to be ready. We need to be able to compare results quickly. So how do we achieve that objective? We made choices. We decided to base ourselves on a PCR, polymerized chain reaction technique that can harmonize viral loads. We thought that was important as a baseline. Of course, we thought we needed to identify a laboratory of reference. The starting point was the discovery trial. So we decided we would have one laboratory of reference per country involved in the discovery trial. And again, the idea is to harmonize procedures, techniques as part of that laboratory network. So what was our starting point for networking between virology or laboratories? Well, we based ourselves uh, on the experience of the National Respiratory Analysis Center, looking at SARS-CoV-2. We looked at respiratory SARS-CoV-2 samples. So the idea was to obtain a normalized viral loads based on cell quantification of the samples so as to remedy the poor quality of samples. Because we were looking at a specific quantity, a well-defined quantity of cells. Le reposant sur une harmonisation. So we needed to achieve comparable results through standardization. So using standardized viral loads, and I'll talk about uh, the calibration in a minute. So the first step was to identify those virology labs. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pretend that was easy. We knocked on a lot of doors. Obviously, we worked with EU response partners, but also clinical investigation centers that were part of the our discovery trial. Anyone that could give us information or references or contact details, etc. 
and then setting up a contract. And when we moved on to the contract phase, we realized how easy things had been until then. So we needed to convince the laboratories to work with us, and then we had to enter into a contractual relationship. That's not always easy. So we needed a commitment from those labs, both short-term and long-term. Short-term, we needed to implement that technique with a well-defined protocol and uh, achieve those viral loads as part of the discovery trial so we could get started. So that was a sort of a testing phase, okay? Over the long term, we wanted the laboratories to remain operational. That's the goal, right? To fast track and strengthen response to the emergence of respiratory viruses. So we needed them to stay operational so that they could embrace new techniques in the future uh, using the very same protocol. We thought it would be a good idea to start a public-private partnership, and we added an extra layer of complexity to the contract because it was important to us. For It was important to us to have a system that would be robust, so we decided to work with uh, viral quantification experts, Biomérieux in particular, and we started uh, a very close partnership with that industry player. And our collaboration has been extremely protective. They provided the viral quantification kits that are robust. So they made them available to us. We benefited from the expertise of their training team, uh, what they call the MBST. They have a molecular business support team. And they... Uh, trained and supported all of the labs. And also we benefited from the expertise of their R&D department. And these people were involved throughout the networking effort. And thanks to them, we were able to harmonize the outcomes. We worked in partnership with the CNR, the National Reference Center. This led to the sharing of experience, just like any network, any EU project. I know that sharing experiences a prerequisite, but let me tell you how important that is, and everybody benefited, whether Biomérie or the CNR, National Reference Center, or the labs. Those discussions were extremely fruitful for everyone. Also, uh, Biomérie's visibility internationally has really helped us to convince the labs to work with us over the long term. Of course, we thought that Working with industry meant that if a new virus emerges, we would be able to respond quickly. And the kits could help us target emerging pathogens and that those uh, quantification kits would be available uh, quickly. If we worked with an industry player, oh, you want me to speak faster? So in practical terms, from training to validation, how did it all work? We upstream. Ahead of time, we worked closely with Biomérieux to set up a joint protocol for evaluating the body performance. And the CNR, the National Reference Center, worked on an inactivated virus panel that we sent to the labs. Initially, the panel was tested between Biomérieux and the CNR Reference Center to determine the so-called technical validation criteria. So we sent the kits and the panel to the labs. Every lab was trained by Biomérieux, by their MBSD, the molecular team, uh, and the training approach was bespoke based on the platform, the technique, the protocol, and the knowledge about the platforms. And then we moved on to the testing phase. We asked the laboratories to test the panel to see whether or not it matched the criteria. We had many discussions with Biomérieux, and sometimes they let us just they let us do our thing. And this led to validation of the labs, and they worked on samples, patient samples. So this network is comprised of 12 laboratories, national laboratories, and also hospital laboratories that have been identified. So three different types of contract. We don't have much time, so I'm not going to talk about that. So three different types of contract for 12 labs. It's a lot of work. We trained 10 different labs in partnership with Bio Merieu. We evaluated those 10 labs, and so far, eight of them have been approved. So the work is done in the way. We now have a network of laboratories capable of providing reliable and comparable virology results within a short space of time. You're familiar with the difficulties. Anything having to do with contracts, by definition, is complicated. So we started the network in times of pandemic. Uh, 
we did what we had to do. It was a, it was a difficult time. The idea now is to move further, go faster. So because of GDPR, I'm sure that everyone had a hard time. We need to maintain that momentum during the whole waiting periods. Sometimes you need to wait for the contract to be set up. There's nothing else you can do but wait. But you need to maintain that impetus so that the network members can remain motivated. We explain things over and over again. Maybe you start with an NDA. I thought that was amazing. Everybody agreed. Uh, it's easy and quick to sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and at least you know who, uh, who the other person is. It's sort of a, a point of entry. And also because there are people coming and going. It's always good to know exactly who to talk to at La Plafond. This work during this pandemic, hopefully there will be no other pandemics, but at least we're ready. So we need to ensure quality and visibility. We set up an annual quality control system. We're going to suggest that the labs uh, participate in other clinical trials. And we will reevaluate the labs uh, if they switch platforms. And then it's about communication. We need to provide information, uh, intelligence. We need to maintain the connection uh, via a newsletter, for example, and the usual webinars and publications and internet page and etc. Always keep in touch. If you have any questions, anything specific or scientific questions on virology, don't talk to me. Talk to Maude Bouscambert Duchamp. This is her email address. Uh, many thanks to Maude. Without her, without her trust, we would never have been able to create that network. Also worked with Alexandre Guima, who's standing by to help you. And I'll, of course, get back to me if you have any questions on the network itself. Uh, I will spare you the list of everyone we'd like to thank. This is the list of your European labs that trusted us. Thank you to ANRS, Inserm, Biomerieu, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Sorry for overspilling. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Please stick around. Oh, you're the boss. You do what you got to do. Our American speaker just flew in from Boston. His plane was three hours late. He needs a cup of coffee. So if we can just wait for him. Wonderful. Okay, before the break, a couple of questions. I think this is very interesting, what you just talked about. I found that very interesting. This was an emergency setup. Those were emergency conditions. You needed to respond quickly. And I remember I was on the other side, on the media side, and every time we were waiting for the outcomes of the discovery trial, and it felt like we had to wait forever, and then you had to fast track your efforts. Would you say today that you're ready? Would you say today that uh, the system works and that uh, should there be a crisis, you can respond quickly? I wish I could say yes, and I wish I could say yes right away, but I wouldn't go that far. But we're working on it, we're working on this as hard as we can to be ready. All of the tools and networks have to be made sustainable. I believe that's key when it comes to a fast response to the emergence of uh, respiratory viruses. I know we've said this before over and over again, but we're working on it. Uh, any questions for Natalie Bergo? We, we can talk to Natalie during the coffee break. Okay, so let's enjoy a quick coffee break and then we will hear Thomas Janish. Thank you very much. We're going to close the uh, session three. Thomas uh, Jenish has uh, arrived. He was late. His plane uh, landed late. Is he with us? Yes, he is. Okay, Rodrigo Richard will introduce him. Please join us on stage. Okay, is it is it a problem if I run it in? I, I don't think so. Okay. Is it uh, okay? Can I do it like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for the last presentation of this session about um, 
European initiative and international initiative. We have also heard of that. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Thomas Jenisch. Is that the correct yeah. pronunciation? Thank you. Uh, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist and clinical scientist. For the last 15 years, he has coordinated multicentric ob observational clinical research projects on arbovirus infections like dengue or Zika. He's also involved in large multicentric pregnant women and children's cohorts in Latin America, as well as in data sharing and harmonization of, of infectious disease cohorts, building on the ongoing Zika birth cohorts. Dr. Jenisch was trained as a medical doctor in Germany and has obtained a PhD in international health. He, has, he was recently recruited as the director of the New Arbovirus Research Consortium, located at the Center for Global Health at the Colorado School of Public Health. Today, Dr. Jenny will, Dr. Jenish, sorry, will tell us about the International Multidisciplinary Research Consorts, Consortium Zika Alliance. The Thank floor you is yours. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, how uh, do I move the slides with this? I or? believe so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to talk to you about lessons learned about the importance of natural history cohorts and repurposing of cohorts in the context of emerging infectious diseases. I hope you can all hear me well. I had some delay due to a flight that was delayed in Boston last night, so, but I'm excited and happy to be with you here today. So I will first talk about the importance of natural history cohorts themselves. I was invited at a meeting at the NIH in Washington a few weeks ago about vaccines and monoclonals against Zika virus. And it became very clear and obvious that there are so many unanswered questions. So now we have the interventions, we have the vaccines, we have the monoclonals, but the natural history cohorts still have not delivered. Why? Especially when it comes to the endpoints that are needed to evaluate these new interventions, we still don't know the true range of clinical phenotypes. Their variability over geography has been substantial and unexplained. And uh, the strength of the causal association with the Zika virus infection during pregnancy would have to be determined for each of the endpoints separately. There's also the importance of the neurocognitive development in children, which we haven't solved. And, and Overall, of course, these natural history cohorts are so important also because they provide ref epidemic hit in Latin America. And we wrote this paper. So the meeting on harmonized protocols was done well during the peak of the epidemic, but then the first pregnant woman enrolled was after the peak had subsided. And we all suffer, all Zika virus cohorts from NIH, from CDC, from the European Commission, suffer from the fact that not enough cases could be enrolled in the end. So we approval to expedited shipment, rapid pathways for ethical approval, service for lab equipment, procedures for biobanking, and of course, a peacetime research strategy. So what I'm going to tell you now in the next slides, I'm going to go through the projects that I have been coordinating over the years, mostly funded by the European Commission. And many of them, there were sister projects, one from Germany, one from France. And actually, we had our um, final um, evaluation of one of the big Denke projects in, in the Institut Pasteur, the main old building on the other side, a few years ago. So that was the item study, in the, the integrated management and uh, um, of uh, Dengue, an uh, international research consortium on Dengue risk management and surveillance. I'm going to start there. And this is the sites that we were working on, on Dengue from 2011 to 2017. The background map is that map that was produced to uh, assess the risk on a five times five kilometer grid for Dengue transmission. You see there are some on the coast of northeastern Brazil. So these are the sites that later on came into the focus of attention for Zika. So I can tell you, I lived through this process three times, being there, being on the ground, and then the funding was not available or came too late to actually pivot to the next emergence. And this is what I want to, what, 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 where I think we can do things better. So the items consortium was focused on 
evaluating dengue warning signs. We had worked on a previous consortium on the dengue classification that was then adopted by WHO in 2009. That's on the right side of the slide. In the middle, you see the box with the warning signs, and on the left, you see the box with the case definition. So we worked on all these three areas. And uh, I like to show this slide as it shows kind of the simplicity of the study design, the acute febrile illness study design that sharply contrasts with the reality, what it looks like in doing research in low and middle income countries, a busy ward in a children's hospital in Cambodia. So going back to this, to, to this picture that is in the Dengue Guide from 2009, the main areas we worked on were diagnostics, prognostics, classification and endpoints. And the item study and its um, careful clinical characterization of Dengue over time serves as a template that I think we need to employ that worked well for dengue, but we don't have the same amount of information, for example, for Zika. And that's why we are short describing all the range of clinical phenotypes and endpoints we need to deliver for those who are working on the interventions like vaccines and monoclonals. So we have a whole list of publications that came out of this study for um, classification and endpoints in the diagnostic area as well. The last one I will briefly talk about in the next slide. It just came out in Lancet Global Health in January. And then in the area of prognostics, we were working on different warning signs that um, all have various prediction powers for severe dengue. So this study that just came out in Lancet Global Health has a very careful characterization of dengue versus other febrile illnesses. So we can show over time, each day, what the prediction or what the distinguishing power is of each clinical sign and symptom that is shown here in this graph. We also have a very good idea of the that here you show, we show the odds ratio of each of these clinical signs and symptoms to distinguish dengue from other febrile illnesses over time. One, of course, is there's no signal, and then the uh, higher odds ratios are uh, associated with dengue versus the lower ones are associated with other febrile illness. So we are able, over time, to really describe the clinical evolution of this disease very detailed, and that's what we need for other emerging infectious diseases as well. So I told you we were present in these locations in Latin America. That's when Zika hit. And those are the locations that were then included in the Zika Alliance pregnant women cohorts. But in the beginning, we were still doing acute febrile illness cohorts. That was the study design for dengue. And in Zika Alliance, we promised to do both acute febrile illness cohorts as well as birth cohorts for pregnant women. Just that the acute febrile illness cohorts, in a way, we came too late. We used the remaining funding from items to do some of that work, but then um, we, we were not able to capture enough cases later on. The, the NIH, in contrast, has channeled money in existing projects and was able to recruit at the time, more cases than the European Commission projects were able to do because the administration just took too long to put this in place. And that's a, that's a lesson to be learned here as well. So those are the sites. What we had to do for this febrile illness cohort in, in Zika was just to slightly change the enrollment criteria from fever and no localizing signs to rash and no localizing signs plus addition of some other clinical features in the CRF that were previously not adopted, so conjunctivitis, arthritis, arthralgia. And with that, we were even able to then pivot to the incoming chikungunya epidemic. So the repurposing really worked well from an oper operational point of view, but the uh, funding just lagged behind. So this is another figure that shows how rapidly the Zika epidemic disappeared. And I think chikungunya is a very similar example. So those are explosive outbreaks. You run behind, you can't even catch it unless you have everything in place. 
We also described that actually Zika was displaced by the chikungunya outbreak in Recife for reasons we don't understand so well. But this allows us to look at these three arboviral diseases that are clinically very similar. Of course, they have different long-term outcomes and consequences. Dengue much more severe with, with leakage and, and potentially bleeding. Chikungunya with long-lasting arthralgia and arthritis. Zika not severe in the average patient, but then for unborn children. And what we are working on right now is um, with the clinical characterization that we have to come up with algorithms in the absence of laboratory testing that can really distinguish or partly distinguish between these diseases. So the richness of the data sets allow us to do that to some degree. Now, when we were working on Zika still in Latin America, COVID hit. So we have another repurposing of the cohorts from Zika to COVID. And we asked the same question. And in the case of COVID, of course, globally, there's lots of data sets available. In, in, in these arbovirus um, epidemics before, the data sets had to come from those studies funded in Latin America or Asia. So we asked the same question, is there any signal that COVID can cause congenital abnormalities as we had set up the birth cohorts for, COVID, uh, for, for, for Zika to really detect and describe the risk of congenital abnormalities after Zika virus infection in utero. So again, we were able to mount this cohort sub-study in some of the Zika Alliance sites and there's a number of publications that resulted out of, out of that repurposing, again repurposing. The lessons to be learned from repurposing that I want to drive home are local teams are multifunctional, there's no backup B team for another disease. So you have to work with these teams and they are fully involved in the new outbreak if it comes. There are synergies but there's also overlap and a lot of um, additional work for the local teams. There's a need for tools that are ready to go. Case report forms, protocols, IRB clearance, training of local IRBs, harmonized data entry, data quality monitoring. And the future repurposing of cohorts should not, ex should not happen by accident, but actually as a design feature in these cohorts. Now I want to briefly go over the results we have in the Zika Alliance cohort. Um, we have around 3,900 eligible pregnant women. We have two groups that have only enrollment visit or one visit that have really high abortion and stillbirth rates, which tell us that that might be those where something was already wrong when they got enrolled. So for, for the rest of the results, we concentrate on those that have more than two follow-up visits because the stillbirth and abortion role, uh, rate was a lot smaller just to we went for termination of pregnancy even if it wasn't allowed or not legal in Brazil and that might cause higher rates that then would give us a bias in the assessment of congenital abnormalities. On outcomes, um, we have to treat abortion and stillbirth very carefully but we have a lot of other outcomes and that amount to 5 to 10 percent in the total cohort. So this will enable us to do a meaningful analysis. However, we are still lacking diagnostic data and that has many reasons. So the diagnostics first was carried out separately in each of the Latin American partners and then centralized in Ex-Marseille University. And the shipping regulations and the delay because of COVID um, played into that and we are still analyzing data or still um, analyzing diagnostic data. We had to come up with an algorithm of confirmed, highly suggestive, probable, possible, indeterminate, negative. And that is because there's so much cross-reactivity in the serological tests between Zika and other flaviviruses. And this is the same for the other big cohorts that were implemented, the NIH ZIP cohort and the CDC cohort. So this is a problem inherent in evaluating Zika or flavivirus cohorts that it results in a lot of sensitivity testing of these um, categories in the diagnostics. We have a lot of indeterminants still, depending on which country is um, analyzed, and we are hoping to get this, uh, the pink color that you see 
analyzed very soon so that we have the major bulk of pregnant women actually in one bin or another. In addition to molecular testing, we are very interested in zero conversion because zero conversion in the past has shown to add about 25% additional cases. So the problem with Zika cohorts is that Zika has on average a very low viremia and that results in, in, in the potential of not detecting um, all cases that were really there. And this is why we need zero conversion as an additional tool. However, if we look at the zero conversion patterns we have in the Zika Alliance cohort, I'm showing you a few of them. So using IgAM testing, there's, those are examples with the true infection where we have zero conversion through all the tests that we employed, including the molecular test, the TMA, which is a PCR-like test that is used in, in um, blood screening that is even more sensitive and robust than PCR. Um, we have query true in zero conversion where the molecular test did not show a positive result, but the IgAM showed a positive result and all the other tests were already positive. So it could even be a reboost or another flavivirus infection. And then we had recent Zika virus infection showing from the serological patterns, not during a follow-up, but possibly before. And then there's also those that are potentially cross-reaction with a dengue infection. And in this case, in this pregnant woman, we even had that dengue virus IgM at the same time when the Zika virus IgG zero converted from negative to positive. So it's complicated, the serological analysis. It can yield additional positive cases in the light of the shortcomings of the PCR, of the average low viremia. It's an important tool, but it's not an all or nothing. And when we look at the patterns overall in 452 pregnant women that we've analyzed so far, we have a small percentage where we have additional information by zero conversion resulting in positive cases, but we have a lot of gray and in between as well. So that is a challenge, maybe specific to Zika, but it's a diagnostic challenge that is uh, limiting our ability to really diagnose this uh, emerging infection. Very briefly, do we have a biomarker for past exposure in utero in, in neonates? No. Like it's not like toxoplasmosis where after birth you can have an IgG that persists, that is a marker of past exposure in utero. That's not the case in Zika. We have shown that using neutralization assays and basically all we see is that the IgG disappears after six to nine months, so it's passively transferred. And so as conclusions now for Zika Alliance, there is a need for categorization of diagnostic certainty because of low viral load and limitations of serological tests. Zero conversion is a useful tool, but um, there's also um, fallbacks. IgAM often reverts back to negative after two to four months. The classification with harmonized results across uh, the pregnant women cohorts from different origins will allow us to estimate risks of congenital abnormalities better. That's what we hope for will happen in the next years. And this is why we have to use the data sharing that we have in the EC consortia and between the INSERM cohort that, uh, that is actually associated with Zika Alliance and even the WHO IPDMA, the Individual Patient Data Meta-Analysis. And that is, all of these challenges have resulted in another consortium recoded that I coordinate. It's clearly on data sharing. And briefly to show you that those are the work packages where we really work on data sharing of cohorts. This is important for Zika cohorts, for other emerging infections, here also for COVID. And that is something I, I would very suggest that we look into for em disease emergence in the future so that our cohorts that we set up are upfront harmonized and are um, repurposable for other emerging infectious diseases. So that's my last slide. What needs to be in place for a rapid natural history cohort research response? And I've talked about most of these things. I'm not going to read them to you. I leave that slide up here. And thank you very much for your attention.
Merci beaucoup, Thomas Jenis. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Are there any questions from the moderators or from the audience? Do you, do you have a microphone? Not yet. Maybe I can I can ask one before you get the the microphone. Are you up for a couple of questions? Sure. Despite the <laughs> jet lag and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because if there's time. Sure. There is there is something <laughs> <laughs> there is something that you have mentioned. Oh, it was also in your biography about data sharing and harmonization, and. Um, what 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 are the biggest challenges for harmonization in the in your line of work? Because this is something that we talk a lot about in research: the data sharing, the harmonization. So a lot of people are working on it, and but what what do we need to do to achieve it? Well, there's prospective and retrospective harmonization. There's different areas. The retrospective harmonization is just a lot of work and hopefully we get some AI tools to help with that. Prospective is a lot easier, but then the groups need to agree on common data dictionaries mm -hmm. and uh, common tools, case report forms, and that's what we are working on here right now. So we need those kind of modular tools depending on the next disease X coming in, if it's more neurological or liver pathology or respiratory, that we can just take these things from the shelf modules and then put it together r rapidly and in the background in the back end of these toolkits it needs to be interoperable with standards that have been developed so that later on you can then pool these cohorts when you see we don't have enough cases in this one cohort to really answer the scientific questions but you say that you need to 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 reach a consensus for that between between partners does yes. it mean that for i mean for some reason the starting data that people need or like there are some big discrepancies depending on or is there are there are they big are? discrepancies and the concern of cohort investigators usually is then is delay so i need to discuss my data dictionary with this other group it take me another 2 3 weeks before i yeah. can start and, but that these two, three weeks, I would say, are very well invested because they save like two, three months later on. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. Monsieur. Hi, uh, I'm Michael from uh, the TRT5 CHV uh, group. We advocate for people living with HIV, hepatitis, and uh, other STDs. We had uh, a great um, presentation this morning from Isabelle de Fourny. I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to, uh, to watch it from uh, where you were, but. She mentioned issue, issues and challenges um, in humanitarian situations. And in times of emergencies, as we are facing more and more emerging epidemics, uh, when we join forces to create new networks, new tools to, uh, for prevention and so on, do you think decarbonization is important and how to implement it without hampering research? It's a question for you and for all the speakers from the, we heard this morning and two years down as well. Are you going to reduce the fundings for researchers who don't want to uh, reduce their carbon footprint? <laughs> I think that's a reaction. I mean, I just I flew from the US here. I, am, <laughs> I think that's, that's why I said the question is for all the speakers that we heard this morning. Yes. So I, uh, no comment. <laughs> no, I, I, I think you're right. And, and I think, um, so when we book flights, there's now a, a carbon offset opportunity. So hopefully the funding agencies allow or even mandate that these tools are used. That would be great. Um, but um, we have learned during the COVID pandemic that we can do things by Zoom. We have also learned how much more effective and rewarding it is to be in person and have really yeah. now we know we value that in-person meetings a lot more maybe we, we we all do a little bit less in-person meetings but those we go to we really think it's it's worth it so that's what i hope we can do and i'm happy for this <laughs> yes don i had a question but on this point you know you you were not here yet this morning i don't know if isabelle left or she, she's still here Isabelle de Fourny, who is the head of MSF France, said that their target was to decrease by 50 percent uh, uh, this by 2030. And I, I thought that was interesting. So I'm like you. I think that person-to-person uh, -person contact is very important. And we should not say we, we are not going to do anymore. But maybe we should try to have a target and de decrease. Uh, and, and I think that this point 
some of our researchers, I can give you the example of Xavier Anglaret. He is not anymore traveling, not at all. So I think this is a reality of our researchers. It's not just a political will, and we should uh, listen to it. So I have a question. First of all, uh, despite the fact that you travel by a plane, <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming, uh, Thomas, and sorry for being, uh, being uh, you know, just take you off the plane and on the, uh, on the presentation. Uh, also, thank you, because you do a lot for data sharing, I know. And it is a big issue, not that the people don't want to share. It is because we have a lot of administrative mm -hmm. uh, uh, issues and uh, all the jurists thinks that this is, I think that researchers are in advance when, uh, when we compare to the jurists. And I can tell you that uh, the INR, people working in INRS who work a lot, this is, has become one of their hurdles, big hurdles. And I know the huge efforts, but things doesn't advance because first of all, we do not have enough jurists and then the jurists want to take zero risk. So my question to you, because I know that you have sent a lot of emails to me saying this is not advancing. Is France the worst country? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> not at all. Um, I think actually with, with France, we are advancing and I'm hoping for our meeting tomorrow. So I think that this is one of the countries where, and thanks to your pushing as well, Yastan, we, we are advancing and it could be a model. Um, it's, it's it, the, I think in the US, they have a little bit of an advantage because things the, the data sharing legislation is not as strict privacy wise as the GDPR here. And, and the NIH takes a very kind of descriptive uh, um, mandatory role. The NIH sets up a data repository and everything has to go in there and there's no discussion around it. And then they have, when they have a, a new call for proposals, they have like two, three content proposals and then they have a coordinator, coordinating proposal that is then responsible to do the data sharing for these two, three content proposals. There's a new one revamp on, on this toolkit for emerging infectious diseases just came out by the NIH yesterday. So I think they have a different approach and have some advantages, but given the situation in Europe where GDPR is, is quite a, a high level of data protection, um, we are doing our best and uh, France is definitely one of the countries that is pushing it. Thanks, yes, done. <laughs> merci à vous, merci beaucoup Thomas Genich. Thank you very much Thomas Genich. Thank you very much and thank you for to the moderators uh, for this uh, session. Thank you for being here and for participating and thank you to ANRS for having invited us. Thank you Yazdan and thank you Eve for the invitation. We move on. And uh, we start session number 4. And um, I would like to ask the moderators for session number 4 to join me here. Véronique avetan Fenoel and Nicolas Huot. Véronique avetan Fenoel is a professor of virology at Institut Cochin in the retrovirus infection and latency department. You've been working on HIV reservoirs for the last 15 years, and you are the P investigator in several cohorts, ANRS, MIE. And Nicolas Huot is, a, is in charge of research at uh, Institut Pasteur, HIV information and persistence. Session number four, we are going to talk about cure, extension to acute infections. We will talk about pers viral persistence of the various different viruses, SARS-CoV-2, HIV, within the body, how it uh, starts, what are the consequences, and uh, why we uh, have to know this phenomenon inside out. I'll give the floor to the two moderators and the speakers. Please uh, allow for a few minutes uh, for questions at the end of your presentations. Thank you very much. Let us welcome Professor Laurent Abel, Head of Research at INSERM. He's in charge of the Human Genetics of Infectious Diseases Laboratory at the Institut Imagine in Paris. He is also works at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. He received the main MRFIM prize in 2022. This is our keynote speaker. He will discuss human genetics of infectious diseases. We're very fortunate to have an expert 
such as him, who's worked on many different infectious diseases, such as uh, uh, TB, Hep C, and more recently COVID. Thank you, Laurent, for being here. Thank you for this kind of introduction. Many thanks to ANRS for inviting me to discuss the human genetics of infectious diseases. What's the main question that is at the basis of our laboratory work, our laboratory research? Well, we find there's extreme variability uh, uh, between the different individuals infected by the same germ. The vast majority of those germs, well, there are so many different germs, but very few individuals will actually uh, develop uh, a severe infectious disease. So let me give you two examples. TB is a disease that has been around forever, but it's still very much on the agenda. It's a major public health challenge, as you all know. And for TB, as you know, those individuals that are infected by the TB bacillus, about 25% uh, of the world population, out of them, about 5 to 10% will develop a clinical disease. And this means that the vast majority of individuals actually manage and they live with the bacillus. And the other infectious disease that, are, that has kept us so busy in recent years is obviously COVID-19. And here again, we have a minority of individuals, less than 3% of individuals infected will develop a, a critical form of the disease that will, re, that will require uh, intensive care. Obviously, a number of risk factors have been identified for both diseases. They may have to do with the germ, with the individual themselves, such as uh, uh, sex or age or a number of acquired immunodeficiencies. But all of those risk factors are not enough to explain that extreme variability between individuals. So our initial approach is about human genetics. We seek to identify the genetic variants that will, to a great extent, explain that variability. Uh, and this helps us identify the, uh, the genes and the immune response channels that play a key role in the response to infection. So let me start with tuber tuberculosis and also with a rare cousin of TB called uh, Mendelian, uh, Mendelian susceptibility syndrome uh, to mycobacterial uh, infections. It's a rare syndrome, mostly in patients, mostly in children who uh, develop severe infections caused by uh, environmental mycobacteria. Infections by BCG or environmental mycobacteria. And these are healthy individuals. Otherwise, they have no non-immune deficit or deficiency. So this syndrome, MSMD, we try to dissect it, genetically speaking. And we've been able to identify mutations in about 20 genes. The corresponding molecules can be seen on the screen in blue on this diagram. And the common denominator is that they're part of the same pathway, interferon gamma, IFN gamma. So this leads to either a shortage of IFN gamma uh, production at the top of the diagram, so upstream from that production of interferon gamma. And the other problem is a lack of response to interferon gamma. All of the receptors uh, such as uh, RAA, RA2, etc., anything downstream from that receptor. So what's interesting is that when you dissect that syndrome, MSMD, we lay the groundwork, the initial genetic groundwork for uh, TB, because all of these mutations uh, are conducive to TB when you live in endemic areas. But like I said, that are on, it's, it's a rare syndrome that only explains a small number of TB cases. But this is one of the principles behind TB. TB can also be a genetic disease. So like I said, it's a rare occurrence. But what's interesting is that sometimes something rare becomes a little more frequent. And if we look at the defects of TYK2, so tyrosine kinase 2, this is a molecule, a kinase that is involved in uh, the uh, interleukin-23 and interleukin-12 uh, signaling pathways. So this is a, when you have a TIC2 uh, deficiency, um, usually it's an autosomal recessive problem. It's been described in laboratory conditions, and this is characterized by infections. 
intracellular germs in particular, but sometimes they have viral <coughs> infections as well. And interestingly, in those patients, you see that two of those patients presented as TB patients, strictly speaking, and they had that uh, complete uh, uh, type 2 deficiency. Like I said, this is something that is extremely rare. Of IL-23 is signaling. It's also involved in signaling of type 1 interferon. And this can play a part in COVID. We'll get back to that later. But also involved in interleukin-10 signaling. As far as we know, <coughs> clinically speaking, this is pretty silent. So uh, when you have a complete deficiency, there's there's no response whatsoever to IL-3 or IL-12 and IL-23 or type 1 interferon. In addition to rare mutations, which are all early stop mutations, we actually looked at the much more frequent variant, a non-synonymous. Oh, and we tested it in our TB cohorts and our MSMD uh, cohorts, and we showed that this variant is extremely enriched for homozygotes in our TB cohorts and our MSMD cohorts, and this leads to an odds ratio higher than 50. So a very strong impact. Very strong effect of being homozygote for this particular variant. So how frequent is it, this particular variant? P1104A. Uh, it's most frequent in Europe, as much as 14, 5, 10, minus 6. So here, the frequency is much higher. So higher than 1% in many regions of the world. And the, the only two regions where it's pretty rare is Sub-Saharan Africa and the Far East. So we have explored the functional impact of that variant, and we've been able to show that uh, homozygote patients for this variant had a normal response to a type 1 uh, interferon and interleukin-12, but there's a specific deficiency, a specific response deficiency to interleukin-23 featured here on the left-hand side and on the right hands when it comes to gamma interferon production in whole blood. So the functional defect provided by uh, being homozygote means a, a, a failed production of interferon gamma, and this is mediated by interleukin-23. So we've been able to uh, replicate the impact of that variant in the European population. That's interesting because that's where it's the most frequent. And we use that cohort you may, called UK Biobank in the UK, so about 500,000 participants. And out of those participants, uh, a little over 100,000 uh, answered a question regarding their history of TB. So we had more than 600 patients who had a, a history of TB and about 100,000 who said they didn't have TB, TB before. And we find that uh, a P1104 uh, a variant uh, patients are enriched. And you got to understand that when it comes to the control group, Members of that control group are probably little or not exposed to TB because they live in the UK, and we probably underestimate the effect because uh, a lot of uh, controls have probably not been exposed, let alone affected by TB, by mycobacteria and tuberculosis. So uh, this homozygote uh, variant explains about 1% of patients in the European cohort. Now, uh, uh, all DNA of many Europeans, uh, there's an increased uh, frequency until about 2000, uh, increased to 10% in frequency until 2000, 3000 years ago, and then the frequency dropped to the current 4%. And by using other evolutionary genetics methods, I'm not going to talk about that too much, uh, they've been able to show that on the one hand, this variant probably appeared, emerged about 30,000 years ago, and uh, underwent severe selection in recent years, over the past 2,000 years in Europe. And this is very much compatible with TB, because TB was found in Europe at the same time. So, uh, wrapping up on TB, uh, the homo Zygosity for P1104A um, is probably the first common cause that explains about 1% of TB cases in Europe, probably 0.5% in many regions, except, again, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Far East, because, again, the variant is not found at all there. A mode of action, this is a, a failure to produce interferon gamma, which is mediated by uh, interleukin-23, and the major role played by 
IL-24 in bacterial immunity has been recently confirmed by the identification of patients who have a complete uh, receptor, interleukin-23 receptor uh, protection, and they all have MSMD. And this shows the importance of this cytokine in antibacterial uh, defense. So there are therapeutic uh, consequences because if you have that deficiency, you can use recombinant interferon gamma, particularly when antibiotics are not enough to treat the disease. And another interesting aspect from an evolutionary and therapeutic point of view, that same variant, the exact same variant, a bit like um, a number of other variants have the opposite effect for a number of inflammatory or autoimmune uh, diseases. They, there's a protective effect uh, against uh, diseases such as uh, uh, Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And this is compatible with the assumption according to which the increased incidence of these types of diseases may be due to selection of individuals who had a stronger immune response because they'd been exposed to infectious diseases up until recently. Also, this protective effect is, uh, is something we can explore to develop anti-tag-2 uh, agents. If they arrive on the market, they will require the same precautions as anti-TNF drugs because this can be in a predisposition for TB. Moving on now to COVID. As soon as the pandemic broke out, we put together an international consortium called the COVID Human Genetic Effort. And very quickly, we were able to enroll many patients. People infected with COVID and with different types of phenotypes. So we explored their genetics using exome sequencing, genome sequencing. We analyzed the data and looking for rare variants with strong impacts. That's what's specific about our lab. And then we validated the variants, functionally speaking. In the meantime, well, we carried out a quick study uh, in the spring of 2020. We focused on 13 genes that we already knew. We had already identified those genes as being mutated in other viral pathologies that are being studied in labs and that are involved in the interferon, type 1 interferon signaling. So these are the genes you can see on the screen. And as we explore a first set of over 600 patients, we were able to show that about 3.5% of patients carried loss of function mutations in eight of those genes. The genes in red, for example, the two... Uh, interferon one um, receptors, including homozygotes, who had a full, uh, a full response deficiency. Uh, second step, we focused on exploring chromosome X because of the male predominance of severe forms of COVID. And as you can see on the screen, we were able to identify one particular gene, T. LR7, toll-like receptor 7, a gene which is also involved in producing type 1 interferon by uh, plasma cytoid uh, dendritic cells, PDCs. And we've been able to identify that between 1 and 1.5% 1 of males presenting severe forms of COVID-19 carried deleterious variants of that gene. But in a different sample of three or 400 males with uh, mild symptoms who were asymptomatic, none of them had that variant. And this was also identified by other groups. But this time we identified uh, chromosome X as uh, the most important signal. After a longer enrollment period, because, as you know, a strong uh, uh, COVID-related pneumonia in children is pretty rare. We collected over 100 child uh, uh, recruits. So, and in those children, we identified that 10 percent, about 10 percent, carried recessive, recessive mutations involved in other interferon uh, type 1 uh, signaling. So TLR7, for example, so three of them were homozygous for those mutations and a full uh, type 2 deficiency, and also one STAT2 and one IFNR1 mutation. 
Again, those are mutations in the genes that are involved in the interferon signaling system. And now we have a larger sample, over 3,000 patients with critical forms of COVID, uh, hypoxemia, intensive care, a uh, little over 1,300 uh, controls with mild symptoms or zero symptoms whatsoever. So if we identify, we identified zero gene that single-handedly had an impact in the whole genome analysis, we've been able to confirm and identify the effect that we find on those genes, which are involved in the type 1 interferon signaling, because as you can see, uh, when in a recessive situation you have 25 people who carried the homozygote mutation in patients as opposed to zero in the control group. So it's a pretty strong effect, and also the heterozygote effect does uh, mean a slightly lower risk, but the impact of age on that genetic defect is important. In other words, uh, those who carry homozygote or the heterozygote mutations for TLR7 are much younger, about 35 years old on average. So 49 years old for those who have heterozygote mutations, but the rest of the cohorts had an average age of 56. As we suspected initially, the genetic forms are mostly found in the youngest patients. Uh, by youngest, by youngest in COVID, I mean... Uh, 55, 56 years old, they're not all children, far from it. And the last uh, important uh, discovery uh, came out of that first uh, outcome and previous outcomes as well. Again, in mycobacterial diseases, because I said before, uh, when it comes to MSMD, we have all of those genetic in errors of the interferon gamma signaling pathway. And in some patients who do not have that genetic defect as early as 2023, we found 2003, we found that those uh, carry those individuals carried uh, uh, auto antibodies to interferon gamma. But again, the mechanism is completely different. We found the same thing in other diseases, and this means that we asked ourselves the following question. At the end of the day, uh, interferon, type 1 interferon autoantibodies, could they not play a role in COVID? Now, those autoantibodies were well known. We've known them for 40 years that have been described in patients that were either treated uh, with interferon alpha or beta or long-term treatment or uh, autoimmune diseases such as SLE or a rarer disease called APS1 this is due to an air a gene deficiency. Uh, this is a gene that uh, plays an important role in the thymus when it comes to tolerance and development of other genes. And all of those autoantibodies were considered as having zero clinical impact. There was only one publication uh, uh, with severe, uh, one patient with severe uh, varicella and otherwise they were considered as non-pathogenic, quote-unquote. And when we tested those autoantibodies, the first work was done quickly as early as spring 2020. We, we were surprised to find that 10% of our 1,000 patients actually carried those, auto anti, those autoantibodies, but in the asymptomatic patients, none of them had the autoantibodies. And whenever we were able to secure plasma before the infection, those autoantibodies were found in the plasma before COVID emerged. So this particular outcome has been broadly replicated. Oh, allow me to clarify, those, those antibodies are neutralizing antibodies. We did the tests very quickly, and in the, in the initial round of testing, we tested neutralization with interferon alpha doses that were pretty high, uh, 10 nanogram per milliliter, so super physiologically, quote unquote. So you may not know this, but contrary to type 2 interferon, which is gamma interferon, which stands alone, there are several type 1 interferons, 12 alpha ones, 1 omega, 1 kappa, 1 epsilon, and 1 beta. And if you look at the different types of uh, interferons that are neutralized by those antibodies, well, all of the alpha interferons are neutralized, and most often the omega interferons as well, and much more rarely the beta interferon is neutralized. So these are autoantibodies that mostly target alpha and omega interferons. So the second time, we worked on two important things. Number one, we developed more sensitive tests. 
and this time they neutralized 100 picogram of interferon alpha. So this kind of dose is much more under par with what you find in the human body. And this increased the prevalence of these autoantibodies, and we tested many more individuals, both patients and members of the general population. And this gives you an idea of the share of patients with critical forms of COVID who carry those antibodies as uh, on the basis of age between 10 and 20 percent. And here, these are the patients who deceased. The share is pretty stable, 20 percent of the patients who died of COVID actually carried those autoantibodies. And interestingly, if we look at what's happening in the general population, we were able to test over 34,000 people uh, of all ages. And the curve looks the same whether it's 10 nanogram or 100 picogram, it all depends on the absolute value. So by by definition, this is present in the general population until age 55 uh, to the level of 0.5 or 1%. Not negligible, but that year is stable. And as you can see, there is a remarkable increase in prevalence after age 50, 65, uh, reaching 46% around age 80. Again, this is a reminder of the major effect of act of age, actually. The older you are, uh, the more severe forms of COVID you will find. And maybe that's a potential and partial explanation for that increase in prevalence. So we find to do our analysis of the impact in terms of our relative risk uh, uh, between 10 and 20. It all depends on the combination of uh, autoantibodies that we're considering. The most severe forms, well, these are patients who have both anti-alpha and anti-omega antibodies uh, at a dose of 10 nanogram. But on the right-hand side, see the estimates in terms of mortality? The lower curve in gray is the general infection fatality rate observed for COVID. Uh, above that's male specific and then you have the antibody auto antibody um, carriers and as you can see having those auto antibodies actually is is a risk factor when it comes to covid related mortality and we were able to test a number of patients who developed severe covid forms even though they were vaccinated properly and the <coughs> antibody response to vaccination. Uh, sample of 40 patients, we showed that 24% of them carried those autoantibodies. So again, that are residual risk factors. Uh, the interferon type 1 response pathway is absolutely key when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 infection control at the early stage. As you well know, these are molecules, these are uh, that uh, come in uh, very quickly uh, within two or three days of infection uh, to stop uh, uh, propagation of the virus. But if that barrier doesn't work or doesn't work well, and this can be due to genetic defects or uh, genetic defects or autoantibodies, uh, then you move on to the next step. And you can develop a, an inflammatory response in the lung, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, that's not a matter for interference anymore. Um, there are many of the things we can do, for example, find other genetic defects that have yet to be detected, but also working with other autoantibodies. First, you need to look for the cause of those autoantibodies. Some of those causes are genetic. That, that is true for a lot of autoantibodies. Uh, and also, either germline-based or somatic-based. This can explain why things get worse as you get older, and also the role that those autoantibodies have in other viral diseases. This has already been shown for severe complications of uh, uh, live uh, uh, yellow fever vaccines. For a small um, sample, we showed that 40% of them had autoantibodies for severe flu. Uh, 55% of those individuals have autoantibodies, and based on preliminary results, which are very interesting in a number of other viral diseases, so possibly this is an explanation for a number of severe viral diseases. So what about the, what, what's the outlook, medically speaking? We tried to develop large-scale testing for autoantibodies. So in the general population, particularly people age 55, 65 plus, I'd like to remind you that 4 to 5 percent of people aged uh, 65 plus uh, carry those autoantibodies so that we can set up either specific preventive 
those interferons for which there are no in, no ant autoantibodies, for example, beta or lambda. That's open for discussion. Uh, there are lots of people I would like to thank, because obviously I did not work alone. I worked to a whole bunch of different people. You can see their names on the screen. At my lab, of course, my colleague Jean Casanova. Uh, many thanks to Paul Basta, who did most of the work on the autoantibodies, Shen Ying Zhang, Emmanuel Zhangui, and many thanks also to all of the cohorts for their contributions to the studies, uh, the French cohort in particular, French <coughs> COVID, COVID F, Constance, Etablissement Francais du Sang, the French Blood Institution. And uh, I have, uh, I am done. And uh, if you have any questions, I am on hand. Thank you very much. Laurent Abel, that was a very interesting talk. You, you mentioned that. Are there treatments at the moment against uh, Autoantibodies, no treatment per se uh, when it comes to autoantibodies, but there may be treatment to try to avoid the complications or the risks uh, that these autoantibodies uh, entail. But obviously, you need to look at this disease by disease. Now, this may be true for COVID or other viral infections, but you can well imagine. Now, we can't exactly administer, directly administer uh, interferon for those autoantibodies, at least not alpha. Not the alpha ones, but for example, type 1 interferons for which there are no autoantibodies, for example, beta, which is the case uh, for most people. Interferon lambda, that was the proposition for treating COVID. There was a recent publication on that. You know, wait and see. But obviously, this has to be administered at a very early stage. As soon as you know you're infected, you need to be treated. If you arrive at a hospital, it's already too late. Thank you very much. One question from the moderators, maybe? Et dans la salle aussi, okay. And also questions from the audience. Well, I have a question. Did you extend your research to other infectious diseases, HIV? We know that interferon plays an essential role in the very early days of infection uh, when the reservoir is being established. So have you carried out a study to assess prevalence of autoantibodies in people being infected? Not for HIV. That is a disease that we don't work on in our laboratory. Maybe others will be will, but we don't. I have mentioned a few infectious diseases such as influenza, and we are currently working on other viral infectious diseases. The preliminary results are quite interesting, but they're too preliminary to be um, quoted. But yes, it will be interesting. We will talk about them when we have more certainty. I have seen hands going up. Uh, who has a microphone? Could you please introduce yourself? Marilyn Bonnet, IRD, thank you very much for this presentation. We have uh, information on the uh, genetic polymorphism of mycobacteria strains, but it was interesting to see the immune response in the host. My question is about COVID. Do you have any data regarding the prevalence of autoantibodies in the populations? There was a lot of transmission, but low lethality, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Very good question. So far, I don't think that we have a large quantity of data, or rather, a large size of data in sub Saharan African populations. We have some, and in the patients we studied, severe patients with autoantibodies, a few were of African uh, descent or origin, but we don't have general population data in order to assess the uh, autoantibody, the frequency of autoantibodies in African populations. We don't have that. One question. Yes, Dan, please. I, I think there is somebody here wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's very interesting. And Francoise Barré-Sinoussi is sending me texts saying there is not enough of basic uh, scientific articulation. She's listening. She's listening. Oh, well, hello, Francoise. Yes, I'd like to say hello. So one question regarding interferon. The first thing I wanted to say is we have to really pay attention to the study published in uh, New England regarding lambda interferon. It's not a very good 
uh, trial, says the speaker. Yes, but regarding judgment criteria, because they mix together hospitalization, emergencies, death, and they say that antidepressing depressing drugs seem to work. Now, I have a question I have asked before and never un really understood. Is there a reason why Lambda works and Beta doesn't work? Benjamin Terrier has already ex attempted to explain to me that there might be a reason why one family of interference works and the other one doesn't. What are you talking about? People who have autoantibodies? With people who have autoantibodies? Well, we do, there shouldn't be autoantibodies against beta or lambda, and if there isn't, then beta interferon acts like a stimulating factor for the other interference. It stimulates alpha interference, which uh, in turn will be neutralized by the autoantibodies. Maybe it does stimulate other molecules that could have an antiviral function. But I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer why lambda interferon works better. Maybe it uses a completely different pathway that has nothing to do with alpha interference, and alpha interference will be neutralized by people with autoantibodies. But how, how, the mode of action, I can't explain. And again, you have to make sure that we, you don't have autoantibodies against those uh, interference. Lambda is type 3, alpha is type 1, so it's a different family of interference altogether. But I don't have anything much more precise than that. Michael for collective CHC, saying CHCCR 5V. People who have three uh, 21 chromosome Down syndrome patients, they produce type 1 interferon at very high levels. Uh, and uh, how do you manage SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 in those people with Down syndrome? Well, for TB or any other infectious disease, well, I don't know exactly how we manage patients suffering from uh, Down syndrome. I, I don't know, I wouldn't know. Yes, it is right. On chromosome 21, there are many genes, uh, and including uh, immunity-related uh, genes that have an impact on interferon production, and they seem to produce high levels of interferon. If I remember well, those were our patients in whom we found slightly more elevated uh, autoantibody frequencies, and you know they have higher levels, so they react really almost like somebody who's been treated with interferon. And the fact that they have uh, baseline uh, higher interferon uh, levels could be a risk factor for them to develop autoantibodies against those interferon. But uh, I don't know exactly what to say. Were there resistance to SARS-CoV-2 for the uh, infectious disease specialists here? Any of you knows whether they have a higher susceptibility? Well, I wouldn't know. We did not have a uh, Down syndrome patient among my patient. I, I don't know whether they are more susceptible to uh, COVID-19 than others. One more last question for this session. Yes, Bernadette Muller. Thank you, Laurent, for this beautiful presentation. Always very interesting. Could you interest Bernadette Muller in term? Short question. COVID patients who uh, carry autoantibodies, did they suffer from any viral co-infections? Very good question. But as I said, the uh, autoantibodies have been known for some time, and they've been considered as non-pathogenic because the patients who had them did not develop any specific viral infections. Otherwise, we would have spotted them before. There was one case reported with a severe case of varicella with people carrying autoantibody with person a person carrying autoantibodies but that was it for the other viral infections that these individuals have come across nothing happened no difference it took covid-19 to actually draw attention to this role but i guess we are looking at other viral infections uh, which were not so well elucidated so far if we look well we will find something thank you very much laurent Next speaker 
Eric Delaporte. Eric Delaporte is a professor at the Montpellier Teaching Hospital. He is in charge of infectious and tropical diseases. He also lectures on infectious diseases at the Montpellier University. He is a director of the mixed unit in Sermon University, Montpellier University. He is in charge of the operative research team for HIV and infectious diseases and coordinator of CTNRS for Cameroon. He has more than 25 years experience in the research programs in Africa. Not only has he worked extensively on HIV, but he also works on epidemic risk and their control and multidisciplinary research on Ebola and coronaviruses. Professor Delaporte is going to tell us about a viral reservoir and is going to use the example of Ebola. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the inter to the organizers for giving me a chance to take stock of the situation on Ebola reservoirs. So thanks to the follow up of the survivors in uh, Guinea and the Republic of Congo. Now, this observation is relatively recent. The virus has been known for over 40 years and in 2014, before the uh, West African disaster, there already had been 28 <laughs> outbreaks, but no treatment, no vaccine, no standardized diagnostic tool, uh, clinical observations. Well, people died basically. And uh, very limited data. Well, bats, obviously, but nothing else. Nothing really conclusive. And then uh, people thought, uh, well, it's never going to be a public health uh, issue. And to uh, repeat what the colleague from MSF said this morning, the epidemic happened where it was not expected at an intensity level that was unexpected in Western Africa in 2014, 28,000 cases and uh, started from Guinea, went to Sierra Leone, Liberia, and other spread to other countries. We feared a world pandemic at the time, and then everybody got moving on the international level. And in France, the task force was created under the auspices of Jean-François Defrécy. And this task force did a great job to simulate research uh, and uh, patient management. HIV networks. I come from a very HIV uh, background, and so does my team. But it was Jiki uh, with Xavier Garret, Prevanc with Yastan. We discussed it yesterday in terms of projects, research projects. And we invested on how to manage survivors, people who were recovering, uh, first of all, to treat them. And then when we conducted an identification visit with Ibrahim Diallo and Ibrahim Selati, we found that uh, Ebola was. Um, tantamount to death and there were survivors and for the survivors well nothing was uh, ready and you know the uh, priority was emergency so they gave them a bag of rice a little money and they went home and uh, they were stigmatized and they did not do well so we started working on this and we involved the associations and the association workers uh, we developed a uh, management package and we uh, set up a cohort follow-up study to understand what happened to the survivors and we were able to include 800 survivors out of the one 1,270 people who survived in Guinea. We did this for several years together with our Guinean uh, colleagues, uh, Yusso, Touré, Keitan, and all the people in the unit who stopped working on HIV. Well, rather, they continued working on HIV, but they also worked on Ebola. So the cohort was followed for four years. These are the uh, first papers being published really reviewing the situation. We started from scratch. It's very difficult to create a database when you start from scratch. The symptoms were the following. The patients were not doing well at all. More than 75% showed very relatively serious uh, symptoms and they could be standardized uh, with uh, manifestation uh, that resembled uh, PTSD depression, uh, fatigue, sometimes some manifestations uh, suggested that the virus persisted within the body, uh, pain in the uh, joints, uh, in the eyes, uh, people who had hearing uh, impairment, uh, and uh, we watched the evolution of the, the symptoms. There was a percent, there were percentages, but over time the evolution showed that those symptoms tended to decrease. Now, uh, this is a focus on ophthalmology. Uh, Esther Reyes was a, a PhD student uh, who said, I want to do something. And she went there and she actually 
was the first one to review the situation regarding ophthalmology during an outbreak, and she showed that there were many uh, uh, eye-related symptoms such as uveitis, cataract, inflammatory reaction that led to uh, blindness in many cases, or almost blindness. And that also attracted the attention to the fact that there might be an Ebola virus uh, reservoir. We followed the cohort for 48 months, thanks to a reacting uh, instrument in ARS. And we uh, observed that over time, people improved. And one third of the patients we followed uh, still had symptoms. And uh, we had neurological, ocular, musculoskeletal symptoms, which again were evocative of a potential reservoir of viruses uh, within the patient's body. Other studies were conducted. The Prevail study was organized by ANH in, in Sierra Leone, and they had a control group, which was, was an advantage uh, over us. Same uh, prevalence level, uveitis, fatigue, joint um, pain, and progressive uh, decrease uh, in the symptoms uh, over time. We looked at fluids. There was a big project uh, to study fluids. We collected the semen, urine, feces, uh, cervical, vagina. The fluctuation in the uh, quantity uh, of viruses, a uh, lot during the first phases, 93% uh, likelihood of having a positive semen at three months, and then 60% at six months, and then 500 days after the acute phase, uh, it decreased. And that's a long duration. Regarding the other fluids, uh, apart from uh, breast milk, rare but up to 500 days after discharge, we had uh, one case that uh, still had uh, persistence after 500 days. So, you know, it really is evocative of the persistence of Ebola viruses. We also were able to uh, assess the antibodies and uh, in our unit a test was developed a very specific and sensitive test uh, doing x and after five years uh, most people still have antibodies uh, to an antigen uh, and there is a very slow decrease in the antibodies but if we look at individual trajectories in the red curve we see that some patients have a reboost a re increase uh, in the uh, antibodies, which probably uh, is due to a new stimulation. And that's interesting when you look at the individual trajectories. Now, something important for our studies, for, uh, in parallel, there were also ancillary trials, uh, follow-up cohorts during the epidemic. This is a trial conducted by Yves Lévy's group <coughs> with Aurélie Genman and Christine Lacaparas, and they relied on a mobile laboratory that was um, created by Hervé Roll because you know you had to freeze cells, deep freeze cells, so you had to have logistics. And they uh, conducted a trial on surviving patients from Guinea, and they showed that after two years, the inflammation and the activation were still there, that there was a specific response to uh, EBOV, and the markers uh, were evocative of a chronic infection with Ebola virus. It was the first immunology study that showed persistence of stimulation in the cell, on the cellular level. <clears throat> that was really something important uh, regarding the possible persistence of Ebola virus. Persistence versus latency. This is a trial from CDC. Now, it's interesting. They took samples from uh, semen uh, patients in Sierra Leone, and they showed that over time there was viral replication, although it decreased, it was still there. And that is obviously an argument in favor of persistence rather than viral latency. In summary, regarding these studies from the first major epidemic, Ebola epidemic, to the follow-up, there are clinical manifestations in the survivors with the virus persisting in sites such as the testicles, eyes, the urogenital tractus, the brain. So the very specific locations where the virus will persist. <clears throat> and we do not want to give uh, 
a lumbar puncture to all the, our patients and we needed to find another technique. So we performed the clinical uh, observations, uh, visceral involvement, uh, renal impairment, not so often in our cohort. Also the consequences uh, due to post-traumatic stress, depression, pain, asthenia. So that was the picture. And in the team, Jean-François Etard, that uh, the disease uh, was not you are infected, you die or you don't die. It wasn't that simple. There are symptomatic forms, but asymptomatic forms also, 3 to 17 percent, depending on the degree of exposure and the risk of contact. Now, that's important because if if we want to talk about reservoirs, it means that the reservoir is not limited to symptomatic patients. There are asymptomatic patients and therefore there's a higher number of potential reservoirs. The consequences which were showed during the first epidemic, one, the fact that there could be a reboost effect, a reactivation of the infection. There were more than 15 survivors, uh, two cases uh, were described and the two cases were described in uh, Western humanitarian workers, uh, one treated in Atlanta and the one who was a nurse treated in Scotland. Now, there were no other cases described neither in Guinea, nor Sierra Leone, nor Liberia, which means that possibly there may have been other cases which were underdiagnosed. Uh, the uh, virus reactivation were underdiagnosed. So the two cases, one was a humanitarian worker who had a new uveitis 14 months after having been uh, treated and the nurse, the Scottish nurse, uh, suffered uh, from a meningitis nine months ha after having been treated and survived. In both cases, they had benefited from uh, a uh, monoclonal antibody-based uh, therapy. Again, another consequence, transmission. Because the patients are asymptomatic, they carry the virus in their semen. And uh, here we have uh, referenced um, 10 cases uh, of uh, transmission, 17 months after the acute phase for one, <clears throat> re-triggering of the uh, transmission, chain of transmission. So two consequences of the reservoir. First of all, the disease is reactivated and secondly, it can be passed on again. So after the Guinea epidemic, uh, the, uh, we developed a new paradigm, not only the animal reservoir, possible amplification and uh, infected uh, human beings, but we have symptomatic human beings who can contaminate other people, plus a group of people ca potentially carrying a reservoir who could be at the origin of a new chain of transmission. So it's a complete shift of paradigm we discovered that Ebola could uh, also be contained in a human reservoir. This was the uh, most serious epidemic uh, ever in the Republic of Congo to 2018, 3,500 uh, confirmed cases, uh, very difficult situation. This picture was sent to me by the NI NRB uh, program. Uh, at the bottom, you have uh, a motorcycle that is being stopped at a checkpoint uh, carrying on the uh, pillion uh, the body of a dead man because uh, the motorcycle was taking the body to a funeral. Obviously in the Republic of Congo uh, we had to do something for the patients and the epidemic benefited from the progress made during the previous epidemic. There could be a vaccination of the contact people and for the very first time, there was a treatment with the uh, MURI protocol, the emergency protocol, and also something that was extraordinary at the time, the fact that we were able to conduct a four-arm randomized trial during the epidemic in extreme conditions, showing that sometimes a trial can be conducted in very difficult situations. And for scientific purposes, it provided very important information. There were four candidates, Zembak, a monoclonal clonal vaccine that was that had been used in in uh, Guinea, the remdesivir, and two other two mono, potential monoclonal treatments, MB114 and a cocktail of regenerative drugs. Now the trial showed that two of them allowed to reduce mortality, and now nowadays they are recommended for treatment, MAB414 and the, re, the cocktail of regenerative drugs. Why am I referring to this? Because again, together with INRB, we were asked to work on the survivors with the National Programme of Recovered Patients, the winners, the vainqueur in French, and that's why we call the protocol the Ebola winners. 
obviously this meant taking care of the patients, but it also raised the question in the treated patients, what will be the consequences on their reservoir, on the sequelae, because most of them will receive ant monoclonal antibodies. Re-emergence, Placide de Bala is in the room. He is going to deliver a presentation later. He could comment this paper because he published it in New England. He showed a, pa a case of a patient who'd been vaccinated and several months after vaccination, he uh, developed a, an Ebola virus infection. He was treated with MAB-114 and 165 days later, he had a reactivation, which was unfortunately lethal. That was the first case. It was the first time that a case was reported in Africa of an African patient with a reactivated infection. But in parallel, there were two more cases which are currently being published where the infection became reactivated, leading to a fatal meningitis. The case that uh, Placide describes in this paper actually started a trans chain of uh, transmission for uh, 190 patients, unfortunately more than 90, 90 patients. For the uh, trial, Le Vainqueur, which we are currently analyzing, we already have looked at the uh, humoral response. If you take table A, bottom left, top left, sorry, two antigens, on the top line, uh, the post ebo uh, line, patients, untreated patients. In treated patients, the humoral response is slightly delayed and it drops really quickly. And the lowest curve is MAB114, one of the two most efficient prototypes regarding monoclonal antibody treatment. So the humoral response is very different in the patients who have been treated with all due consequences in case of a recontamination. And also uh, when we talk about controlling the Ebola reservoir. Monoclonal antibody treatments and consequences, two papers on uh, monkeys, uh, primates, uh, macacus uh, here being treated with monoclonal antibodies, uh, and they showed that there was persistence of the virus in the ventricular system with fatal reactivation and relapse uh, a little time, sometime later. Another interesting case uh, published this year in MBIO showing the same thing, except that they sequenced uh, the GP and they found a mutation which could explain uh, the uh, increased virulence, but that's still a question mark with an acute form two weeks after treatment. So we do have animal models showing that monoclonal antibodies could have a detrimental impact on the reservoir. Finally, the last outbreak, the 2021 Ebola outbreak. Ever since this epidemic, a lot of work has been done to reinforce capacities. Uh, the SIR figure uh, was created with the Ebola Task Force. First element, multidisciplinary investigation. Immediately, they checked, uh, they worked with the veterinarians, microbiology, and in a matter of days, they were able to diagnose the Zaire Ebola virus strain. But mostly they started vaccination campaigns. They were able to sequence locally, and that was a surprise. More than five years following the previous epidemic, they started sequencing locally and they said, oh, that's strange. It's the same strain as five years ago. So there, there's a contamination. They started again. But surprisingly, it was the 2014, 2016 strain that was found five years later. The result was confirmed by two more laboratories, so there was no contamination of the samples. The epidemic was reactivated, not due to a spillover, but because uh, the strain came from a surviving patient. And so here we see the persistence and the consequences on the wrong run. <coughs> In summary, the sequelae, the persistence, the reactivation with possible new contamination chains. We have new chains of transmission with no clinical manifestations. Some viruses in the semen, new epidemic area, new geographical area. Obviously, people travel. So maybe this means that the uh, outbreak could start anywhere. 
And the negative impact on monoclonal antibodies is confirmed by the uh, post-treatment trial conducted in Congo. Nothing new, really. There's an old paper on the uh, treatments carried out in Argentina with uh, plasmapheresis driven from uh, recovering patients, leading to neurological manifestations after treatment. So there's viral persistence and the risk of reactivation. Follow-up of the survivors, that's easy from your office, but telling the survivors, well, maybe you still have the virus uh, in your body, maybe you can still contaminate other people, that's very difficult because they uh, become marginalized. Uh, and it's a sufficiently rare phenomenon still. It makes it very difficult to take care of the survivors. What do you tell them? Do you vaccinate them? Especially if they have been treated with monoclonal antibodies, you should not vaccinate them. It's not recommended. But you have to make sure they're not re-contaminated. I'm not a virologist, but you know, how do we control the reservoir? And an advocacy, we don't have an efficient antiviral drug to maybe clear those uh, patients from uh, virus uh, reservoirs. So monoclonal antibodies, okay, but maybe we are creating a huge human reservoir with all due consequences and the consequences that we fear. This is a collaboration work with the NRB. Placid is with us. He will talk this afternoon. Jashak Muyembe and Steve Aoka also. Sophie, the building that was built in the post Ebola period with Abdullah and Alpha. <clears throat> these are these are the new uh, two new uh, sites for INRS and IRD. And with my group in Montpellier, Martine, Nigel, Alice, Bernard, Jean Francois. Thank you very much. Merci, merci à vous. Très intéressant. Thank you very much. And the questions that you're raising at the end, well, we don't have the answer to those questions, which is a bit worrisome. Do we have any questions? Whether the moderators or the audience? Any questions for Eric de la Porte? Please wait for the roomy microphone. I'm here. And then the gentleman behind you. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm right here, Eric. You look at body fluids and you're looking for the exact location of the virus. Uh, did you look at tears? A person's tears? Isn't that a possibility for follow up? Yes, attempts have been made to analyze the tears, but. We, doubt, we didn't do a lot of work on that, and we didn't come up with anything. Obviously, eye exposure is significant in children and young, uh, and young adults who became blind from that inflammatory cataract syndrome. We thought maybe ophthalmologists could come in, and the answer was no. The IRB and the program said no. No input from ophthalmologists because uh, the conditions weren't uh, safe enough and they were afraid of contamination. To wrap up on the eye factor, when it comes to Ebola, the CDC has worked and uh, put together a number of patients, including from Guinea, so that they would be operated on and very regularly when you, uh, you found uh, the virus in, in the puncture sample from the eye, but not in the tears as far as I know. Hello, thank you, Eric, for this amazing talk. It reminds me our time in Gabon when we worked on SEMA. Could you please introduce yourself? My name is Jérôme Estaque from INSERM in Paris, together with Eric. We've known each other a long time. Uh, we spent some time in Gabon together, and the issue of stigma, you said the healthy carriers uh, are stigmatized. And uh, this was true for HIV back in the day. And also, the, what about the clinical manifestations of the persisting immune response? Once activated, it can last several years. What about long COVID forms? There are a number of forms of COVID-19 that uh, seem to have the same symptoms. And also, what about uh, the reactivation of meningitis and uh, 
And what about the HIV reservoir? At the end of the day, it's pretty much the same concept, even though the virus is much more lethal. Yeah, clearly. The same things keep coming up. Sometimes we have a silo-based approach, a virus by virus, but maybe we should have a, tra a cross-cutting approach. What about Ebola reactivation, immunosuppression? Placid is here. Placid Mbala is here. He can tell you more about HIV patients who also got infected with Ebola. Uh, the epidemic in Guinea, that didn't happen. And also, there have been a rare a rare number of cases, a small number of cases of reactivation, but the patients were not HIV positive. The first two patients were Westerners, and the other three are Congolese, but they were, they didn't have, and which is why the virus is found in those brain tissues. There was one case of reinfection, not several, right? No, it's true. Uh, unfortunately, most of those reinfections cause death in the Congo in particular. And as far as the other, uh, what about the other two humanitarians? Uh, it's over now. What about the CSF, the, or the LCR? Um, well, yeah, some people wanted to do a systematic lumbar puncture, which isn't easy uh, in an epidemic setting. That was, it's not easy and it's not ethical at all. Um, any other questions? Please wait for the Romy microphone. Eric Dortenzer from ANRS. Thank you so much, Eric, for reviewing all the studies done, all the way from Guinea. You, you focused on the reservoir. We understand the potential consequences uh, on public health. What uh, strategies uh, were implemented uh, in Guinea for prevention purposes, to prevent secondary transmission, to avoid reactivation? We know that there have been condom distribution trials, yes, that are WHO recommendations on using protecting sex, uh, using condoms up until one year later. Um, there are discussions going on regarding systematic vaccination to control the reservoir. And then, in the population, how do you evaluate how big the reservoir is? I'm not an immunologist, but maybe there are uh, immune markers that could help us target a particular population. I don't know. But at the moment, it's very, very difficult to educate survivors because the risk is very low and the stigma very high. But the risk of transmission, uh, ba the sperm-based risk of transmission, obviously, uh, y you need safe sex, so you need to wear a condom. And that's uh, something that's acceptable. We have a few more minutes so before lunch. And we're now going to award the best poster prize to Cecile Erak. She's not with us today, but uh, her poster is about establishing a physi physiological mpox virus infection model in Sinomolgus uh, macaques. Uh, I'd like to call Romain Marlin to the stage. Romain, are you here? Excellent. Please join us. He's a good friend. He didn't win, but he's here to replace Cecile, and he's going to discuss uh, Cecile's work. Say a few words about it. Thank you very much. Many thanks to ANRS MIE uh, for allowing us to present our work. And on behalf of Cecile, many thanks. Many thanks to the jury members in particular. Very quickly, I would like to talk about the work which is the basis for our poster, and then answer any questions you may have. I'll do my best to summarize that work. Here was the idea. Following the MPOX epidemic, we needed to develop preclinical physiological MPOX infection model. So we use the Sinomolgus macaque for that preclinical model. Step one, we evaluated the impact of the infection pathway on several animals. So either the intrarectal 
pathway or the intradermal pathway or the combination of the two, IR and ID, intrarectal and intradermal. So we found that in both ID and IR ID have a clinical impact, which includes severe fever, fever following exposure at the end of week one, post-infection, and also persisting fever uh, for about 10 days. Also, we found an impact on uh, DCBC, complete blood count, with the lymphocytosis in all animals exposed, uh, irrespective of ID or IR. And also, hemoglobin was affected in some patients. Also, we found an increase in the number of monocytes. So, monocytosis uh, to varying degrees, and the kinetics are different depending on the infection pathway. So depending on whether it's IR or ID, the clinical impact may be slightly different. Also, we developed a scoring system for lesions, and we found the emergence at the beginning of week two, the appearance of skin lesions and pustules, mostly in animals exposed intradermically. And also the combination of the two IR slash IT. And also for the intrarectal uh, mode of exposure, most of the lesions were around the anus. Uh, thanks to collaboration with our friends from IRBA, we were able to analyze the viral load. In particular, we saw that those pustules, those cutaneous lesions contain strong concentrations of viral DNA. We've also been able to monitor viremia, and we found the presence of viral DNA over time, up until 28 days of post-exposure. And we evaluated the presence of that viral DNA, particularly in bodily fluids, rectal fluids, but also sperm. And the... Uh, both IR and ID animals have a persisting viral load, a viral load that persists a long time, over 40 days post-exposure. So we're still monitoring that viral load. And uh, together with our friends from IRBA, we also need to uh, analyze things and uh, whether or not this is associated with the presence of uh, infectious particles, uh, whether whether the animals are also infectious. So we still have a work cut out for us, but over a few months we've been able to work hard and put together a preclinical model, which is extremely useful in evaluating the impact of the immune response and also evaluate efficacy of drugs or vaccines as part of, as part of a vaccine. Thank you very much for those explanations, Roma. We will continue session four after lunch. Let's reconvene in one hour. Thank you. Part two, these are our moderators. Nicolas Huot, Veronica Vetan fenoel Okay, let's continue session four with a talk from Sophie Trouillet-Assan. She's in charge of our laboratory at the Hospice Civil Hospital in Lyon. And she's going to discuss uh, personalized management of patients with uh, respiratory viral infections. Bonjour à tous. Uh, déjà, je tiens à remercier. Uh... Thank you very much, everyone. Many thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to attend today's seminar. I'd like to talk to you about customized management of patients with uh, respiratory viral infections. Uh, and also what we need to target in order to achieve such management. I think that my talk will uh, supplement uh, Laurent Bell's uh, talk this morning. So talking about respiratory infections, we're all fully aware that this is a major public health uh, issue. It has been so over the past uh, three years. Uh, we're thinking SARS-CoV-2, but there are many other respiratory viruses that are responsible for such respiratory uh, infections. Add to that fungi and bacteria, we realize how difficult it is to diagnose those infections. Clearly, that's incompatible with a specific uh, a PCR research uh, uh, as a routine measure in lab uh, circumstances. So we need, we need new uh, and 
fast uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, tools. So the difficulty in detecting those problems leads to um, excess consumption of antibiotics and abusive consumption of antibiotics. So challenge number one, how do you achieve customized management? Uh, you need to improve the diagnostics. And we're working on quick, robust, innovative tools to uh, find out more about the etiology. So the common point of all respiratory viruses and viruses in general, that's their ability to activate the uh, type 1 interferon response. As you can see here, those uh, viruses, uh, the viruses RNA or DNA will be detected by the innate immune cells. And this will lead to the synthesis of interferon alpha which will bind to the receptors of neighboring cells. This will lead to another signaling cascade and lead to transcription of ISGs. So interferon stimulated genes, which code for over 700 proteins that have antiviral properties. So clearly the type 1 interferon response uh, is uh, set up by the immune system at the very beginning of the infection. And this will help steer us towards the etiology of respiratory problems. So how do we quantify that response? If we look at the molecule itself, interferon alpha, it's very complicated to detect it because in pathological conditions, it is secreted at very low levels um, in the order of one femtogram per milliliter. So clearly, assays are not compatible with the tools available to routine labs. Lately, um, there are ultra-sensitive uh, uh, automated machines, for example, ELISA testing uh, developed on the SIMOA platform, but that has yet to be implemented routinely by labs or even research labs. So in recent years, researchers have tried to set up an alternative method uh, to try and have access to the type 1 interferon uh, response set up by the immune system, and they look at the level of transcription of those ISGs. This indirectly reflects interference into interferon alpha uh, synthesis. So we use this for to diagnose autoimmune diseases. So uh, upregulation of uh, type 1 interferon leads to some autoimmune diseases. And now we have an interferon score, which exists, and it's based on several in ISGs, and we look at the level of transcription of those genes. In Leo, for example, in clinical routine work, we set up that uh, score on the nanostream platform, which we use for multiplex uh, work uh, on several RNAs of interest. In collaboration with Biomerieux, in recent years, we have tried uh, to put together this uh, interference signature for platforms that are known for diagnosing a pathogen. So we put the host uh, RNA in the machine, and after 45 minutes, based on the initial blood draw, you can have that interferon score. How do we find out the how do we find out about the uh, type 1 interferon response? We first look at the viral infections, but before the pandemic, we put together a study called Antoine. We recruited children who had undocumented fevers. So they arrived at the emergency room in Lyon and other hospitals as well that are part of this multi-center effort. So we enrolled 983 children. Out of those 983 children, we did nothing different than our usual practice. We simply analyzed a number of markers from the blood draw. Out of the 983 patients in our clinical routine, we had only 139 patients for whom we had microbiological documentation of the pathogen responsible for the fever. So we were able to show in this study that uh, this under a microbiological uh, documentation often led to abusive antibiotics use. So we were able to analyze the markers for 101 patients who had uh, microbiological uh, documentation. 105, 105 had uh, a documented bacterial infection and the others had a viral infection. So the results show that if you look at the interferon score and if you look at the proteins, 
with the Samoa platform, interferon type 1 was broadly increased in patients with viral infections. On this graph, on the right-hand side, you can see that when we compare the discriminatory performance of the interferon score or the interferon alpha protein, and if we look at that performance and compare it to a C-reactive protein, which we usually use uh, in the ER, we are able to better discriminate the etiology in those patients. I'd like to take this opportunity to draw your attention to the f fact that there's a wide diversity of viruses that were documented in this cohort. Interferon alpha was greatly augmented irrespective of the virus involved. We published the work on March 18, 2020. That was the first day of lockdowns in France. So we took uh, an interest in uh, the interferon type 1 response caused by SARS-CoV-2. So we followed up on caregivers at the time of infection. So a longitudinal study over several weeks. In those patients, we drew blood and we also uh, took uh, nose swabs at each consultation. The first thing we wanted to do was this. This prototype that I talked about before. In 45 minutes. It's capable of documenting the type 1 interferon response, but does it also work for nasopharyngeal swabs? And the answer is yes. Yes, this tool also makes it possible to monitor the type 1 interferon response in 45 minutes using the same nose swabs that we use for the usual virological diagnostic. So what's interesting in those KKFs is that we were able to monitor the type 1 interferon uh, response. In red, you see the response in blood, and in green, in the nose swabs. And so clearly, those two responses were completely coordinated in both compartments. We were able to show in patients with COVID-19 that we were able to monitor the interferon type 1 response, that it was indeed different depending on the time point post-infection, and that we could get it directly from the nose swabs. And this opens up new prospects for diagnosis and management of such viral infections. So here's the question. If we look at the interferon type 1 response based on nose swabs, is that a universal marker for viral infection? So these are the results, the latest results from in recent weeks. We recovered about 200 nose swabs from patients hospitalized in Lyon at the Hospice Civil Hospital for which the doctor simply asked us to look for SARS-CoV-2 or influenza. So we looked for all the pathogens that we talked about using PCR technology. HV, I don't have a flicker, but when you see HV, this means that the patients were healthy, virus-free. And then you have the nose swabs infected by a wide variety of different viruses. And as you can see, there's a clear increase in the interferon score, which is measurable directly in the nose swab, thanks to this technology. But there's a great ability to uh, to distinguish between uh, virus and no virus based on the no swabs. So these are the different viruses that we found during that interim month that we collected data. So whether for SARS-CoV-2, influenza, or other viruses, we can see an increase in the interference score measured nasally. So I sincerely believe that this means new prospects for the future and the interferon type 1 score can serve as a universal marker of infection caused by different viruses and this can help us improve diagnosis of respiratory diseases. This is the same thing, but there's a paper that was recently published in the Lancet Microbe in recent months. It was really interesting. The authors tried to look at the host response. Uh, based on no swab, whether or not it's possible to develop tools to prepare ourselves for new pandemics. Let me explain. So they look at inter they don't look at interferon alpha or the interferon score, they look at P10. It's a protein coded by those ISGs. And and they come in at the very beginning of the emergence of SARS CoV two when PCR kits weren't available yet to diagnose SARS CoV two. So clearly there was a significant increase in IP ten which could be found 
in the no swabs. And so the message that could take away is this. If we look at the interferon response, whether based on the interferon score or other molecules, we are able to say, okay, you probably have a viral infection. We can't document it yet, but you are indeed infected. And I thought that was really interesting. So if we look at the host parameters, I think we are able to improve diagnosis of the viral infections, or at least just guides us towards the right etiology of those uh, respiratory infections. Now, personalized medicine. We obviously have to talk about severe infections. And while preparing for this talk, I found those results. And they show that for the past three years, if you look at uh, the occupancy use, if ne it's never dropped below 10%, 10% of SARS-CoV-2 patients. And I found that interesting. The second challenge, when it comes to achieving personalized medicine or even uh, improving management of those patients with viral infections, of course, we need to identify those patients that are at risk of developing such an infection. And now that you're convinced that in type 1 interferon is essential, is key to uh, viral infection control, now we looked at things longitudinally. We look at the response longitudinally. So these are patients in admitted to uh, ICU with moderate uh, forms of COVID. Now the uh, plasma interferon score now, for severe patients and then for moderate patients, clearly the response uh, uh, starts very early on when the symptoms emerge and then it wins. So one patient out of five that shows up at, at ICU does not show type 1 interferon. At least it's not found in proteins throughout, in the blood throughout their hospital stay. We published this very quickly as early as April 2021. Obviously, there are a lot of researchers that are trying to understand the reasons behind that uh, that uh, uh, missing a uh, type 1 interferon response even though they were indeed infected we tried to identify a number of factors we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a poor in inducer of that interferon response compared with other viruses but as we said before as Laurent Abel said before either there's a genetic deficiency or we have auto antibodies that can neutralize the alpha and omega interferons. Now, this is something that is well known now. About 20% of uh, uh, people who arrive in ICUs have those autoantibodies and are capable of setting up a type 1 interferon response. So the very latest results that we published are about patients who will develop a severe form, and 5% of them have autoantibodies. If we look at the relative risk of uh, a of uh, uh, flu positive uh, patients, if you're if you're 70 years old or less, the risk of developing a severe uh, respiratory infection is about 70 percent. This has been clearly identified. We are unable to set up an interferon response or control the viral infection, and so the patient develops a severe form of the disease. So this begs the question: How useful are? those recombinant interferons. We asked that question among the team using a model that we know is a reconstituted epithelium model. This is a model born out of necropsies or biopsies from patients, and it can mimic the entire st stage in the entire uh, respiratory uh, uh, tractus or process at the interface, the air liquid interface. So what do we do? We infected the human epithelium using either SARS-CoV-2 or influenza. We uh, put in the recombinant interference with the alpha, beta, mega autoantibodies capable of neutralizing, neutralizing those interferons. As you can see on the first bar, when you infect an epithelium, a human epithelium with a virus, of course the virus is going to grow and the epithelium will deteriorate very quickly. This these are the results 72 hours post-infection. And now, when you put in the recombinant interference, irrespective of the type, alpha, beta, etc., there is a drastic reduction in the replication ability of those viruses. It makes sense. That's what we call the antiviral response that cells set up. When you add auto antibodies capable of neutralizing alpha or omega interference, you completely inhibit the activity of those alpha and omega interferons and the virus grows again. What's interesting is if we look at the interferon, the recombinant beta interference, when we inject 
the autoantibodies, the virus, and the interferon beta, we are able to fully restore the antiviral response in the presence of those autoantibodies. Now, these are two very interesting examples. These are patients with diseases for which we knew that they tested positive for those autoantibodies capable of neutralizing alpha or omega interference. So these subjects were diagnosed positively with COVID. We know that they were they had a very high risk of developing severe infection later down the line. So, so whether the blue or pink uh, circles, uh, this is the interferon response. And the diamonds is the quantity of virus in the nose swabs. F from the beginning of the disease, if you look at the first patient, there's a lot of virus. And there's no interferon response, of course. The autoantibodies are preventing the secretion of, of interferon. The doctors administered beta recombinant interferon, the blue arrows, what do we see? There's an increase in the interferon response, which was inhibited by the autoantibodies. And this is followed by a drop in the viral load. So we are seeing a restoration of the antiviral capabilities by the administration of recombinant beta interferon <coughs> in the presence of autoantibodies. And this works really well. In vivo. There are quite a few studies, the recombinant beta interferon, to see how interesting it was. And the study is not really convincing. Either we're seeing positive results, and the outcome seems to show that yes, you should use that to recombinant interferon, or the study shows no results at all. And actually, that is what we saw, an absence of outcomes, an absence of results on the therapies that were tested. If you look at major uh, clinical trials, for example, on a number of products that were tested. I did a little, work, a little bit of work on sepsis a couple of years ago, and um, same problem, pretty much. There were major cohorts, large cohorts, and a kindred, for example, was tested. This is an immunomodulatory uh, a molecule or GMCSF, and this simply was no effect. And a kindred, for example, will inhibit the pro inflammatory cascade, and the GMCSF will, on the contrary, improve antigen presentation during infection. So, in sepsis, there really was no benefit. And I observed as early as 2005. The same thing that we find in papers on COVID. Let us remember that sepsis modulation is extremely mixed, heterogeneous. Now, postdoc uh, analyses were carried out on those studies. And if we look at certain groups, we find that anaconvra makes sense for certain types of patients, for example, subjects presenting with certain activation syndromes. Anaconda works for those patients and reduces mortality. For GMCSF, same thing. There was another analysis of that same study, and we see a benefit. Here, this is for patients who have a, an antigen presentation deficiency by the cells. So clearly, we're seeing an improvement in a certain subset of patients when we use GMCS. I also borrowed this phrase. The author said that the key to an immune system restoration strategy is to first stratify the patients before you administer the product. That's just a paper that was published last week. And it says that in sepsis, in order to use GMCSF for therapeutic purposes, you first need to base yourself on a number of immune markers, such as HLLDR at a monocyte level, for example. So, again, about your COVID patients. Potentially, if you look at the entire population with COVID, potentially, you can propose a COVID diagnostic, but you can also measure the interferon response, either by detecting the auto, the anti-interferon autoantibodies or directly measure the interferon response in the blood using the tools that I talked about before, the 45-minute platform. And we can identify patients with a low risk of severe infection. For example, if their interferon response is set up well, there is a very low risk of developing. On the contrary, the other patients are a high risk of developing severe infection, and then we need to administer interferon very early on. And this will lead to customized medicine. I hope I've been able to convince you that by looking at host markers as opposed to just 
microbial markers, maybe in the future we will be able to improve diagnosis of viral infections, maybe even have tools to, pre to get ready for new pandemics, and maybe even better administer antibiotics. Lastly, potentially we can also identify patients at risk of developing a severe form of the disease. If we know that they have an interferon deficiency, for example, we can work on the vaccination timeline, maybe strengthen immunization and have targeted uh, uh, therapy, therapies such as recombinant interferon and also finally achieve uh, personalized medicine. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for our entire team and not just Leon, by the way. Merci vous. Thank you. Are there any questions from the moderators or from the audience? Uh, there's one question. I don't know who is asking the question. Could you please raise your hand? Yes, I can see you now. And then the lady in front. Go ahead. Charlotte Charpentier, I'm a virologist at Bichat Hospital. Thank you for this presentation. It was extremely clear. I wanted to go back to the interference call. We can't really hear you. Maybe the microphone's not working well. Please speak into the microphone. I'd like to go back to the interference call. I am utterly convinced regarding uh, the help needed uh, to follow up the severity of the infections. Well, I'm puzzled about the diagnosis because I work in hospital settings and uh, we need to know the virus to decide whether the patient needs to be isolated. If And so you said you use it routinely. Could you please elaborate? I mean, at the diagnostic stage. For severity, I'm fine, but regarding diagnosis, would you please elaborate and explain how you would use it? Well, we're not using it yet routinely. Maybe I uh, I wasn't very clear. We would like to use it routinely. I don't work in a routine laboratory. I'm a researcher. I'm a scientist, and I uh, base myself on what my virologist colleagues tell me. Initially, they perform targeted search. They um, bring together VRS and COVID. And if it is positive, uh, if the interference score is positive, then they look for other viruses, which are normally not sought so much, possibly syndromic panels. Thank you. Professor Andri Yuma, coordinator, South coordinator for the NRS uh, site uh, in Abidjan. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, about the African resilience, because Mr. Laurent this morning said that there have not been enough uh, studies carried out in sub-Saharan Africa. But at the very beginning of the pandemic, people said it was going to be a slaughter, a disaster in Africa. And actually, there was high prevalence, but most countries had relatively, relatively limited prevalence. However, we are very frustrated regarding the factors to explain for the fact that uh, COVID did not really become endemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. So your presentation opens up your perspectives. We did have uh, serious forms in Abidjan. People died. But can we use biotech to start a research on uh, interferon and autoantibodies? Where the interference core is a, an expensive tool. On the other hand, it's you know one way to have access to the interference core consists in performing targeted PCRs, one or two ISGs, and it gives you access to the interference core. That's what we tried to do at the lab. Not necessarily a score with several transcripts. But uh, one score that could be maybe used and um, extended to go anywhere in all the countries, the south, the north. More questions from the moderators? I may, this maybe is a naive question, but using this for people who uh, are lacking uh, recombinant interference. Could this be uh, implemented rapidly or is it still something very hypothetical and, and not possible before the long term? 
Well, I believe that the key to get there consists in having available tools. That's what I showed earlier. It's not, it's not uh, sold yet. These are prototypes. To have access to personalized, uh, customized medicine, it's absolutely necessary to have robust layering tools. And it's in progress, but not yet finished. It's not yet ready to be sold. Thank you very much for your presentation. <clears throat> Autre intervenant, je vous en prie. Le plaisir d'accueillir. Next speaker, I have the pleasure of welcoming Professor de Led, Victor de Lettingen, a pathology professor at the uh, Bordeaux Teaching Hospital. He specializes in uh, non-invasive follow-up of uh, chronic uh, liver diseases, and he also coordinates uh, the uh, project uh, for Metropolis without viral uh, hepatic disease. And he's going to talk about eradication of uh, hepatitis C virus. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the ANRS Scientific Committee and the organizers for giving me a chance to talk about a disease that doesn't have any symptoms and is not even an infectious disease. So I'll try to draw your attention to something completely different that has nothing to do with infectious diseases. I'll try to interest you, catch your attention. Recent history starts in 2016. WHO, for the first time, uh, publishes who work on uh, viral hepatitis, it keeps us on our toes 24 hours a day. Now, the ad as a whole, it will take a century, but it's a double definition. We want to reduce by 90% the number of new infections for hepatitis B and C, and reduce by 60% the mortality due to those diseases. In France and in many countries across the world in 2020, we had reached a reduction in mortality by 10%, mainly due to the new treatments available for the cure of hepatitis. He published article that reviews the situation, the current situation. And in the conclusion, the authors write that mortality from hepatitis C has declined since 2019 only, although the new treatments were available as of 2014. And um, on the globe, there are still 78% of undiagnosed infections. Now, that figure struck me because in France, fortunately, we're nowhere near that kind of figure. This is the recent evolution regarding patients uh, who are carriers of hepatitis C. In, on the left is before 2015, on the right is after 2015. Now, in China, it hasn't changed. A few patients were treated, nothing has moved. But I would like to focus on the green line, Egypt because Egypt took hold of this WHO program and started vaccinating the population. Millions of Egyptians were contaminated in Egypt. It was a high prevalence country, it was number five in the list of prevalent countries. And thanks, the USA do not have a proactive policy regarding hepatitis C. Now it's going to change because Joe Biden said that they were going to invest a lot to eradicate hepatitis C. But countries whom we believed were on their way to eliminating the disease actually aren't. Here I am showing you that patients have been treated. It's very expensive to treat hepatitis C even with generic drugs, but Egypt treated massively its population. In other countries treated their population such as Pakistan. Pakistan is the second country who treated massively uh, patients suffering from hepatitis C. And there are other countries where patients were not so uh, treated in such large numbers. The USA, we were told that the COVID epidemic decreased the number of uh, screening campaigns and the number of patients treated. Now, if the, the decline in the number of patients treated started just before the COVID, so we can't really tell whether it was actually the pandemic that decreased the number of patients or whether that was going to happen anyway. The uh, fall in the curve over time is about Americans who have social, who have health insurance. We, it does not represent homeless people or people, poor people who don't have health insurance. And it seems that two thirds of the people who don't have an insurance in the United States and have hepatitis C have not yet been treated. I uh, added this graph, uh, which has been updated in 2022. The country with the highest uh, prevalence is Pakistan. Pakistan and China, more or less on the same level. France is green, not 
to bad, uh, less than 0.4% uh, prevalence. And the U.S. are in blue. So in the U.S., we have more than 1% prevalence. Which countries uh, will are on their way to eliminating the disease uh, between now and 2030? In green, we have the countries who are on their way towards eliminating the disease. And in red, the countries that are not going in the right direction. They're not on their way to eliminating the uh, disease. So we're very far away from the uh, WHO target, which seemed uh, easily reachable. The countries in green will probably eliminate hepatitis C before 2030, and happily, France is one of them. There's Egypt. Although Egypt started uh, initially with the highest prevalence across the world. To eliminate a disease, you need a strategy, and the strategy has to be political. If funding is not found, if things are not organized, nothing happens. And Egypt is the best model. What about Europe? There were plan plans in Europe. There were many plans to eliminate hepatitis and viral hepatitis uh, diseases. <coughs> the one in the middle was uh, published in France and coordinated by Damiel Dumau. There was a plan, a strategy to eliminate hepatitis C in France. This is the current situation. Light green, the countries with a policy to eliminate hepatitis C. Dark blue, the countries that do not have uh, implemented an elimination policy. That's quite encouraging. We see that the largest number of European countries have implemented a strategy, a political strategy to el eliminate uh, hepatitis C. And to achieve this, they have uh, eight coordinated actions. Now, if one action is missing, we know for a fact that it decreases the chances of reaching elimination. Now, in red, political will. And that's what we hope uh, Joe Biden is going to uh, give in the US. He has announced it recently. Number two is funding. What we observed in Egypt and in France as well, the government published a plan in 2018. At the time, the prime minister was Edouard Philippe. And they said they would invest towards eliminating hepatitis C. Number three, programs to reduce the risks. For instance, uh, syringe available free of charge for, for drug users uh, so that they don't use the same syringe again. We also want to involve the hepatologists, uh, and we don't want them to be the only ones prescribing the drugs. So there are several countries, including France, where all several types of uh, doctors uh, can prescribe the treatment for hepatitis C. Access to treatment. France was the first country to authorize the treatment for any patients, regardless of the severity of the disease. And that is a victory. That is a success. Then we have to be able to monitor the evolution. We have to organize information awareness campaigns for the community, for the population, for the healthcare staff and professionals. I, I don't know if it worked, but it was a lot of advertising a few years ago. And we have, uh, we need a program with a specific pathway that the patients have to follow. What we call pathway is what we can do, because everything else depends on uh, government uh, decisions. But improving the patient's pathway is what we're supposed to do as healthcare professionals. We need to start with micro elimination. Say we take a place, a location, and we make sure that there are no more hepatitis C cases there. Sometimes we have patients lost of sight, lost from sight. People whom uh, we treated 15 years ago, and uh, no, 15 years ago, we couldn't treat them because we didn't have the drugs. And we said, well, come back in a few years time, we will have a treatment, except we never see them again for many years until they come back uh, when uh, when it's uh, when they're very ill we also have um uh msms we have prisoners we have uh, co-infections although because we have uh, treatments available now many patients who have been co-infected were fun, fun, were finally cured of their hepatitis c why did we need to uh, implement a uh, healthcare pathway for the patient to follow. I guess this is true for all of you who are treating infectious diseases. Because at every stage we lose some patients. If you take 100 infected patients, 
Some have not been diagnosed or screened. Some have been screened but have never been given the result of the screening. Some uh, who uh, were screened but never gained access to treatment. Others who were not treated for long enough. So you start with 100 patients infected and at the end you only have a handful of patients who have actually been cured of their hepatitis C. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, hepatitis C treatment uh, protocol, it's an oral treatment for 8 or 12 weeks. So well tolerated, good efficacy, more than 98%. So it's easy, easy to use uh, and there are generic drugs now, so it's available in all the countries across the world. First thing you need to do if you want to uh, apply an elimination program you have to screen because the percentage of patients who are infected and do not know are the issue. So where do we screen? Everywhere. <clears throat> we should be able to screen people in pharmacies. I mean, it's a drop of blood and that's it. In addiction, uh, in centers taking care of addict, um, addictions, it's already being done, but we should be able to do it in pharmacies. And also have we have to uh, uh, do an NRA uh, analysis uh, in point of care in, in, in a few minutes. And uh, once you're, you've validated uh, your screening capacities, you can uh, start screening if you have your certification to use TRONS and you can do it, you, you can screen people. Also, we should insist on the immediate screening. I mean, an RNA uh, assay can be done in a matter of minutes. This is a meta-analysis showing that if you want to screen a patient, you take a blood sample. Between the blood sample and the patient coming back to the uh, appointment again, 67 days. Whereas if you have a point of care, you can treat the patient within 19 days. You've saved two thirds of the time. It, you, have, you just have to have uh, Nogzapa or something to do and RNA analysis immediately. There's, then you have to test and treat. You test and you start the treatment and you check the cure. You confirm the cure. This is already being done in well-organized structures and it encourages micro-eradication. Where are the patients? There are two main categories. There are the ones on the left-hand side, people who are at risk, drug users, prisoners, migrant populations, vulnerable populations. They have been identified, but they are not always screened. In France, very often people are not being uh, screened for, by lack of resources, lack of manpower. We are all facing a shortage of manpower in France and the same applies to Exeba. The other part of the population are psychiatric hospitals, people who had surgery in the 90s. <clears throat> And that is like looking for a needle in a stack of hay because people do not necessarily remember they got a transfusion in 1978. And recently, last week, uh, I uh, saw a patient who had an accident uh, with a motorcycle in 1978 and received a blood transfusion and was never screened. And now we have just found out that he has hepatitis C. So screening is only uh, performed based on uh, risk factors, but not everything else. This was Edouard Philippe's program in uh, 2018 and everybody acknowledges that we have to do it that way. We have to go towards, quote unquote, is, as we say in French, aller vers, go towards. So get out of the hospital and go towards the people, go and get them. It could be anywhere in Exapa, in Exapa centers where they take care of drug users. It could be uh, medical centers. Why not organize the screening campaigns or information campaigns in uh, medical centers, prisons? Based, depending on where you are, you can uh, go to a structure and perform micro-elimination tasks. Anything works. You can't say that one program is better than the others. As soon as you have a program to micro-eradicate the disease, you should go for it. This is what we did in Bordeaux in 2017. We are reaching the five-year mark. And uh, progressively, we created a network. The people who were in the various centers did not know where to refer, who to refer your patients to. They worked for an association, there was a homeless guy, and they did not know who to refer the homeless uh, man to. 
So we gave them an email address and a very quick appointment. So we started seeing the uh, networks we knew, Exabar, Prison. And then every time we went to a center, we said, you know, are you aware of other associations taking care of peop vulnerable people? And we went to visit those associations as well. We're, we're talking about medical social work and not medical work. On the right hand side, you have a large square. I discovered that in Bordeaux, a provincial town, all of these associations took care of unaccompanied minors. I discovered that. I had no idea. I knew nothing in 2017. I recently discovered, discovered one yesterday. At the bottom of the slide, you have all the associations taking care of homeless people. I did not know there were so many associations looking after homeless people. And thanks to the money given by the government, I managed to have enough staff to do this. Otherwise, I would not have been able to do it. Now I have two people who work full time to simply maintain the network, keep it running and motivate the people and encourage people to get screened. So it's a generic email address. And every time somebody says a patient, sees a patient in the center and discovers that the patient has hepatitis C with a serology or a Tron, they send an email. And the two nurses who work with me answer within 15 minutes and give them an appointment for the next Friday. Not waiting for an explanation. And now with WhatsApp, they can translate in many different languages. So it just works. And we started looking and we found that the, the rate of uh, people coming to the center is more than 98%. And yet these are homeless people. They have to get on the tram and come to us, but they do come. And obviously we have to be on social media as well. And so they come to the appointment on the Friday morning and they are given a package. Everything we can do in one go. They see a nurse. There's a scan, there is uh, somebody also giving them uh, uh, all kinds of counseling. They see a hepatologist and they, uh, we, uh, in, we organize the follow up for them. They don't go home without the next appointment, without counseling. Some of them are completely vulnerable. They sleep in the street. They are totally homeless, but we organize follow up and the follow up will be left to the nurse to organize this and them text and, and ask them to come back for the appointment. Just to close, we have to screen everybody, everywhere, all the people who are at risk and not just. Everybody should be able to do the screening. And if you'll allow me a couple more minutes, I would like to close talking about hepatitis B because I cannot limit myself to hepatitis C. Hepatitis B actually kills more people than hepatitis B. The prevalence is higher. This is where we stand to eliminate uh, hepatitis B as of 2022. So no single, not a single country across the world is uh, our route for to eradicate um, hepatitis B. It's difficult. It's complicated. These are the strategies that are being uh, suggested to treat hepatitis B. The more we uh, extend indications for treatment, there are very few patients who are not being treated, the ones on the right hand side. And if they have a low viral load, the less than 20,000, uh, 20, and some uh, patients who are 30 but have very high viral load, all the others are treated. So you can see now we have increased our indications for treatment and I'm happy about that. I hope that someday we will be able to treat everyone. But eradication also relies on vaccination. These are the countries that are, well, that's a way to know whether we are going to eliminate hepatitis B. It's, a, it's about checking that children have been uh, vaccinated before the age of five. So prevalence of the HBS uh, gene before the age of five. We're optimistic in 25 years time, when all the vaccinated children will become adults, uh, we will see a decrease in the hepatitis B prevalence. But there is still a problem on the African continent, uh, the Af African continent being where the prevalence is highest. Unfortunately, a vaccination of uh, infected uh, mothers at birth is still a problem. In conclusion, we are on our on the way to eliminate hepatitis C. You will not invite me again in five years time to talk about hepatitis C. It will have been eradicated. It will be the first time that an infectious disease has had been eradicated. And we're happy about that, but we have to continue talking about screening. 
before we can achieve this, screen at-risk people, but also screen many other people, screen everybody we can screen, treat very quickly and prevent reinfection because it happens. It happens especially for drug users. Thank you very much for your attention. Congratulations. Getting a response in 15 minutes and, a, and an appointment in a week. Amazing. <coughs> Let me see who's raising their hands and who wants to ask a question. Do you have a microphone, sir? Yes. Hello, Laurent Mondelro. I'm an OBGYN. I have a question about pregnant women. It's one population for whom we suggest a routine uh, hep C screening. But when you say that you need to screen in order to treat as quickly as possible within 19 days, we prefer to defer treatment until after delivery. So what do you think about that? We have very few pregnant women, so we can't generate that kind of data, but there's a strong epidemic in the U.S. and an opioid uh, disease that affects a lot of pregnant women, so there's a lot of discussions on treatment and no treatment during pregnancy. So this is a product that is contraindicated in case of pregnancy, so we cannot prescribe it. So yes, yes, it does happen. Two things. So there's one woman and we detected hep C during pregnancy. That means her awareness has been raised and she will come she will go to her appointments because when you screen for a disease then the person wants to be wants to hear wants to be cured and the second thing why don't we set up a screening for all young women who come in for the first time because they need the pill and that way we wouldn't have to uh, screen for hep c in pregnant women my name is michael i have a question on behalf of Hugh fisher Via WhatsApp, he's asking me to ask the following question. What about RDR in prison? Does everyone know that the CNS, the National AIDS Council, has uh, issued uh, a, a, a recommendation? Yes, RDR in prison has it to be set up across the board. It does exist in some prisons. Obviously, France is well ahead of the curve. Now, by RDR, I mean risk and harm reduction. Another, a number of countries have started, but uh, it's not mainstream. And as the CNS Council said, we need to go further because we can't deny the evidence that there's no drugs in prison. Now, obviously, there's drugs in prison. And if there's drugs and, and you want to reduce uh, risk and harm, what you need is political will. Who wants to ask the next question? Microphone, please. I have the microphone. Thank you. OK, I'm not looking at the right person then. Sorry. Because of the spotlights, I can't see. OK, the person who has the microphone, go ahead. Show yourself and ask a question. Oh, you're all the way at the back, of course. Hello, I'm from Cameroon. Thank you for your talk. I have a feeling that we haven't much learned. We haven't learned much from HIV. In order to eradicate hep C, we need to draw inspiration from how we dealt with HIV. Treatments are, av treatments are available. And why do we always need to go through a gastroenterologist? Why not engage with the community to fast track our eradication efforts? Um, good question. And maybe this is something that I did not say clearly, but the authorization for prescribing hep C, anti-hep C drugs, that should apply to all caregivers. It's the case in France, other EU countries, Australia. So yes, needless to say, that treatment should not solely be prescribed by specialists in, in, in a hospital setting. Roland Dumina, uh, screen and treat. I'm speaking for our friends from countries where that's not always available. Um, you need a viral load, you need a PCR testing. What about the least advanced countries? Uh, have you talked to access to, have you talked to them about access to PCR? Yeah, it's even better if you can do PCR at the point of care. So it's not just about drawing blood and you send the sample to the lab. There aren't many countries where rapid RNA testing is paid for by social security. 
a lot of CSAPA uh, centers do it. They reimburse that cost because they get funding elsewhere. But I think the law is extremely complex. And maybe we need to change the legislative framework to facilitate the setting up those machines. A question just came in from a remote attendee. What about the preventative strategy? Prevention. Well, prevention in high-risk individuals, including, well, the, there's a risk of parenteral transmission. In order to prevent those risks, we need to destroy the reservoir. And I mean drug users. That is the main reservoir for viral hepatitis. Obviously, another reservoir is the prison environment. I do consults in both uh, settings, and I see patients in both settings. And there's another minor reservoir, and that's MSMs, men who have sex with men. Now, proportionally speaking, it has nothing to do with the kind of thing you see in CSAPA centers. So what we need to do is uh, risk and harm reduction, screening, and treatment. My takeaway from what you said before, uh, in terms of loss to follow up, there are patients that you didn't see for years, even though treatments became available. Why is that? Is it because there's a lack of awareness raising, information uh, did not circulate. Obviously, I am biased in my, in my thinking, but what's the reason? Yeah, very often it is because they're stuck to the interferon treatment. Maybe some of them had milder diseases and this come back next year, come back in two years. And then, you know, when obviously it's easy to, when, when, when there's something that you need to do once a year, or every two years, it's easy to forget and let time go by. So we did the work and we recalled all those patients. We had a database with 800 different patients between 2003 and 2019. We had 800 patients who'd come, they had a positive viral load and they had not returned. So it took a while before we tracked them down. We tracked down 40% of them. And at the end, we were able to heal 8% of them. But this took a lot of work. And everyone said, oh, well, we didn't know there were new treatments. So information is key. We need to provide information to doctors, caregivers, the general population. Everyone needs to know that you can heal from hepatitis. I hope the doctors know about that. Okay. One last question. Thank you very much for this brilliant talk. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm a researcher. I'm a retiree, actually. I did a lot of work on Hep B, but I did take an interest in Hep C. In France, do we know the share of people who become reinfected? They've healed, but they become reinfected, particularly in uh, among drug users. Yeah. Well, it depends when. Um, five percent at five years, approximately. It depends on the center. There are some addictology prevention and supportive care centers where they're really good at risk and harm reduction. Other centers don't know how to do it as well. So usually 5% at five years. No other questions? Excellent. Thank you so much for your talk. The next speaker is Olivier Robineau. He's a lecturer in Lille. He's a hospital practitioner as or any works on infectious diseases in Tourcoing. He's also in charge of facilitating and coordinating long COVID management at ANRSMIE. And today he's going to talk about long COVID. How do you understand it? How to cure it? Hello, everyone. Many thanks to ANRS for inviting me and also for funding two calls for projects dedicated to long COVID management, and this means 40 different research teams who have focused their efforts on the same topic. I think we will hear more about that. As you can see, as you will see from this presentation, I usually I usually start my talks with this photo. I got it out of Twitter. The, there is a real question when it comes to epistemology, uh, the definition of the terms that we use in science and medicine. You need to know that that term emerged in the foreground via social media. And so this definition uh, originates with patients and people who were not in hospitalized during the initial phase of the disease. So these are not severe patients uh, from the point of view of uh, 
mortality and oxygen requirements, but they're still severe patients because of their significant symptoms, even though they did not need uh, oxygen supplementation in the beginning. So this is an important term. Long COVID, what does that imply? That what already existed at the beginning actually continues. So the term itself says it all. Long COVID, it's a long term to know the impact, find the physiopathological mechanisms and experiment with therapeutic strategies. This is an emerging phenomenon, even though it's part of post-infection symptoms. And we don't really know what it's all about. One thing is sure, however, research takes time. But patients are here, and as they're here, from the beginning, we need to alleviate their pain. So we need a pragmatic approach. As a, and I hope that's what we've done with uh, the HAS uh, Healthcare Authority. So coming up with the definition. I know this is a busy slide, I apologize. OMS looked at that. And in 2021, they proposed a definition. Well, it can be credited with coming up with that definition, but that definition will probably evolve based on uh, knowledge. But we need to be really humble here. So the terminology is this. This is the post, we call it a post-COVID condition. COVID condition, that's the WHO definition. So we're looking at a history of infection and probable confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection that persists at least two months, cannot be explained by another diagnosis. Usually it appears, it emerges within three months. And those symptoms can be de novo. You may have recovered and then they happen again, or they can persist from the initial disease. They can fluctuate, relapse over time, and they have an impact on your daily life, usually. So the moment, as far as I know, there are no studies that actually meticulously tracks down that definition. Why? Several reasons. This dates back to 2021, and a lot of work actually began before 2021. And also, it is very difficult when you're involved in research to apply that definition. There are lots of questions. Uh, could it be the same symptom or several successive symptoms, etc., and also differential diagnosis when you do research on a general population to analyze prevalence? It's difficult to say, to say, did you see a doctor? Yes. What did the doctor say? Did they say there's a symptom? Can it be associated with something else? These are very difficult questions to put into a questionnaire and it's difficult to find an answer. So the, the definition is complicated, but it does exist and it's a good thing. And most of the work asks very simple questions. If you have persisting symptoms after two months, most of the works, most of the studies use that definition, okay? Two to three months. So this is the work that predates the definition. There was a dichotomy between outpatients and hospital patients when it comes to estimating prevalence. So before 2021, at the end of 2021, most of the studies performed in epidemiology in terms of uh, evaluating the importance of the phenomenon purely described the problem. I'd like to reference the uh, study in the Faroe Island because it's an island. They have it all. All the SARS-CoV-2 infections. They had 53 people of 53% of the population on that island they still had symptoms four months post-infection. Switzerland. 32% at day 45, the UK, 10% after three months or so. For a long time, there was a dichotomy between outpatients and hospital patients, and we thought maybe it's, it's a different problem. But if we look at the physiopathology, the underlying physiopathology, maybe there's all, maybe there are common denominators. And I need, we need, at least we need to compare the hospital patients and the outpatients. A major study in 2021 serves as a basis for the definition. Uh, this is a Geneva cohort by a and a Swiss team. At the top of the slide, what do you see? The most prevalent symptoms, including fatigue, anosmia, dyspnea, headache, cough, etc. And after seven or nine months, you have 20% of patients who have abnormal fatigue. Then anosmia, 11%, dyspnea, etc., which are very high rates. And if you look at the top five, asthenia, anosmia, headache, coughing, etc., those are the most prevalent symptoms. And we see that those symptoms are not specific to any kind of uh, health condition. And this begs the question 
are those uh, symptoms, can they all be ascribed to SARS-CoV-2 infection? Or do they also, maybe they're not connected, and maybe they're due to other underlying diseases, which can also cause symptoms. So it's very important to compare the data to establish the difference, but also to compare different populations. For example, those populations that have had zero infectious episodes and those who did have an infectious episode other than SARS-CoV-2. So you can compare contrast and determine whether the post-infectious uh, symptoms are all similar, yes or no. Now, last summer study was published in The Lancet, and because the symptoms are not very specific, for example, headaches, it's okay to have them even though you don't have COVID. So you look at shifts in those symptoms over time, depending on whether or not you've had COVID, adjust, while adjusting for a number of social and demographic uh, factors. So this is a study from the North of Europe. We look at the symptoms of the general population, and the participants respond to a series of questions on a regular basis uh, regarding their symptoms, irrespective of their health condition. Uh, do you have headaches? Uh, do you have a headache today? Uh, how long have you had the headache, etc.? So this study was underway at the time of the epidemic, so they were able to ask questions questions such as, did you contract uh, SARS-CoV-2? And then they were able to demonstrate the difference between those who did have COVID and those who did not. So you have the men and women, the baseline, people without COVID, and if there's a shift upward, these are people who did report a SARS-CoV-2 infection. And as you can see, the red curve is slightly above the blue curve, which shows one risk factor for developing COVID. Uh, let's just call it long COVID. And this is more frequent and more prevalent in women. And so it's been shown that there are more types of symptoms such as uh, uh, chest problems, dyspnea, agusia, etc., in patients with long COVID. One reservation, however, when it comes to this study, they did not have uh, data on neurocognitive complaints. That was not part of the scope initially. So one of the main complaints from those patients is actually missing from the study. So let me talk to you about the work done in France. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the main uh, general population uh, <laughs> uh, cohorts, including Constance, etc. From the very beginning, this was coordinated by Fabrice. And from the very beginning of the epidemic, these people took an interest in the health condition of the population as early as January. Pardon me, June 2020, we worked on adding new functional complaints to the questionnaires, including symptoms in people who were part of the uh, study, whether or not they contracted COVID. So longitudinal follow-up was performed. These are results that were published only for the Constance cohort. So that's one more questionnaire relative to the others. So the first questionnaires looked at patients from the first wave. At the beginning of the first wave, the questionnaires uh, uh, coincided with the peak of the epidemic. So there were questions on acute symptoms. So you classify the patients based on uh, symptoms that did evoke SARS-CoV-2 and those who did not. So in August, or between June and August, there was a, a serology test on blood paper. So zero, zero positive, zero negative patients. That was the economy. And in January 2021, we suggested questionnaires with a definition of persisting symptoms. So si persisting symptoms are symptoms that have lasted over two months. So ECDC minus, ECDC minus or plus that describe uh, the likelihood of contracting COVID, yes or no based on symptoms, few symptoms, a lot of symptoms, or no contact with SARS-CoV-2. So the previous study looked at a comparison, comparing COVID patients with the general population. We wanted to compare people who had one clinical, a viral respiratory clinical event during that period, but who had not been authenticated as SARS-CoV-2 patients, and compare them with people who had a respiratory clinical event and who were serologically positive. So we compared those two groups. And, well, these people are quite similar. And yet we do see differences. We see there's more dys dyskiusia and anosmia, more dyspnea, more asthenia, 1.5. And there's an increase in neurocognitive complaints, 1.5. And the uh, confidence interval is borderline. 
but maybe it has to do with the cohort, the numbers. Maybe there were more uh, cognitive complaints in those people. And the other symptoms, there didn't seem to be a higher prevalence in people who had had a SARS-CoV-2 uh, experience. So this hasn't been published yet, but it's already been introduced in Congress. Uh, combinations of symptoms. Are there differences between patients? On the left-hand side, you see the COVID patients that are serologically positive. And then the people who did have symptoms, but serologically negative, people without symptoms and seg positive, and then people who are negative on both sides, serologically negative and no symptoms. So you see different colors, amber or orange for neurological complaints, blue for digestive complaints, GI problems. And as you can see, there's a network of symptoms that is different. So we can think that maybe uh, presentation of the SARS-CoV-2 infection may be slightly different in terms of the combinations of symptoms. What's interesting is that uh, in what you see, the anosmia and dyscusia, which is not at all connected to the other symptoms. And maybe this means different mechanisms when it comes to combining symptoms together. If you look at the risk factors, known or discussed risk factors, uh, risk factors have been confirmed by different studies. In the lower left corner, you see hospitalization, contact with the hospital environment. Uh, what I mean by that is that there seems to be a higher prevalence among caregivers, hospital uh, personnel. Also, the clinical presentation, initial clinical presentation is loud. Age is a risk factor and also being a woman is a risk factor. Some studies show that uh, some studies show that uh, it's the young generation that's most at risk, and other studies show that it's mostly seniors. Maybe it's about the definition. When you introduce the impact of the pathology, uh, maybe the impact is higher in young people who are active. So, risk factors that have been discussed uh, are smoking, uh, ethnic origin, a low antibody ratio. But there's a lot of variability from one study to another. Evolution of symptoms. A paper came out on the same data, but used the three or four cohorts, we showed that the 90% of symptoms had disappeared after one year. It may seem reassuring that 10% who have persisting symptoms still have them after one year. That's a lot of people talking about a pandemic. So it's not really reassuring when you think about it. And then the right-hand corner, you see the proportion of people who no longer have symptoms after one year. What do you see? The neurocognitive problems are the last problems to disappear. Out of all the people who had cognitive problems, only 77 people, only 77% uh, no longer had cognitive problems after one year. But when you have cough, 93% uh, percent of them no longer had coughing after one year. So there's variability between symptoms in terms of the kinetics of them disappearing. Now, if we look at epidemiology, there are persistent symptoms associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's important. There is there are doubts when it comes to the existence of long COVID, whether in the general population or in uh, uh, hospital personnel. So yes, it's a real problem. Outside anosmia, there are many there, there are many differences with other uh, conditions. But uh, what matters is the initial presentation. This raises the question: initial severity of the immune reactions, which you need to factor in. And the post-COVID condition, is it specific to SARS-CoV-2? That's another question. Or the phenomena that lead to those symptoms, are they similar to other infections? So, physiopathological hypotheses. There are lots of them. Let's summarize the four hypotheses when it comes to uh, inflammatory immunology. This is still a pathogen, and that pathogen is a reservoir, and that leads to inflammation, and that inflammation causes symptoms. In the upper right corner, there's an immunity anomaly. The virus is no longer present, but there are autoantibodies, or there's a process, an inflammatory process that has become automated, and this means organ impairment. Also, dysbiosis. We talked about for SARS-CoV-2 with uh, abnormalities of the GI tract. Maybe this is due to the persistence of the virus in the GI tract. So uh, the whole axis 
between the GI tract and the brain and the whole global inflammation, microglia in the brain, which could cause a number of symptoms. Also, sequelae. That's an important idea. At the end of the day, couldn't there be minimum organ impairment, persisting minimum organ impairment, which causes symptoms, irrespective of whether there's an active inflammatory or viral mechanism that persists? This raises question. Without the complaint, uh, what is it due to? A progressive disease, a connection with the initial event, a sequelae, or recovery? Long recovery. A couple of examples. These are the studies that I thought were the most interesting on those various questions. If we look at peripheral blood with long COVID patients, the first study, the first serious study is this one. In the upper graph, you see red, long COVID, blue, short COVID, purple, other coronaviruses, and in green, people who did not report this type of symptoms. And as you can see, there are a number of cytokines and there are differences between groups. At M4, a four months post infection, if you look at the bottom, we look at uh, time points four and eight months, uh, red, long COVID, and blue, short COVID. COVID. If you look at the evolution of the inflammatory process, things are less clear. There are differences between long COVID and short COVID, but only for interferon beta and interferon gamma. And those differences are quite moderate. But this suggests a potential inflammatory process that may be uh, stimulated by an antigen or a virus that persists in the patient. So irrespective of the assumption, all those studies show that we don't know where the patients come from. There was a lot of heterogeneity in terms of clinical presentations and symptoms. So how do you choose the individuals? At the end of the day, are they representative of the event? Can you mainstream or generalize to all long COVIDs? A lymphocyte activation, T cell activation. This is a very short series and it shows that the activity profile in terms of T cells was reduced, or rather was increased for effector cells in long COVID patients. And also the B cell activity is stimulated. And also there is a non-specific activity which is maintained. The question is, is there persisting stimulation by antigens? Viral persistence. This caused quite a stir. Anthony Fauci, Fauci uh, talked about that in Nature. Uh, biopsies, brain biopsies in particular, and biopsies from uh, organs of uh, dead patients. And this showed viral RNA in various tissues. And also precursor RNA in certain tissues. And this could show replication. The virus was still replicating at the time of death. A number of uh, studies showed that the virus was found in the GI tract. But if you have a specific inflammation uh, profile and you undergo a coloscopy, well, you have to be careful with this type of result. And also viral it, DNA was also shown in the olfactory system several months after the viral infection. Persistence of antigens, the famous spike protein. And we know how important that is in terms of physiopathology of acute infections. On the left-hand side, you see the initial work published in CID. It's a small series, long COVID patients. And they showed that uh, over time, spike proteins are released into the blood flow in some patients. And again, this does not happen continuously. On the right hand side, you see the in vitro results report, which were published this month in cell report. No, they injected non specific and spike protein antibodies into those mice, and uh, they looked at what happened in terms of synapses after the injection. And when the spike protein is injected, it leads to a higher reduction in the number of synapses in those mice. And this means that they are less effective uh, at doing certain things. Now, the uh, endothelial impairment or microclots, etc. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the macro epidemiological results. One year post infection, there are pulmonary or clotting complications or cardiovascular impairment, which are prevalent uh, in those people, as opposed to people who did not contract SARS CoV 2. We know that uh, the spike protein connects to the endothelium, it binds to the endothelium. So this could mean there may be persisting abnormalities in the endothelium. And on the right hand side, you see the results of platelet 
activation uh, uh, after one year. And as you can see, uh, binding with polynuclear neutrophils and the endothelium, that binding, that connection remains abnormally activated in the plates of people who were infected uh, after uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So, as you can see, this is what we call a violin plot. And in red, you see the people who have moderate to severe forms, and there are two different types of distribution. This summarizes the problem very well. There are probably people with persisting symptoms who have those abnormalities and others who do not. So this may mean we have two different populations in that study. And on average, yes, there are differences, but maybe we need to be able to distinguish between those two groups. So uh, functional disorders, that's quite a conversation. There have been a lot of discussions about that. What does that mean, functional uh, disorders? Those are frequent disorders that are recognized by WHO, symptoms that are not explained, that is not, that cannot be explained by organ malfunction, uh, that are uh, promoting factors and triggering factors, uh, and there are reasons why some of the symptoms actually persist, and also that are cognitive maintenance factors. Some of those symptoms, uh, or all of those symptoms, are they due to or they due to functional disorders. So there are two French studies, one on the general population that have shown, again, this is a small series, and they've shown that when you use diagnostic tools for uh, functional symptoms or somatic problems at the end of the day in a long COVID population, you have 10% of people who present that condition. And in other series uh, that focus more on neurological problems, uh, the ratio is closer to 60%, 60. On the right hand side, you see the score for functional somatic uh, uh, disorders. And as you can see, that score increases. So just because you have functional disorders, disorders doesn't mean there aren't other factors at play. The other question is, how do you connect to symptoms with organ impairment? At the moment, there are no studies that can establish that this symptom is due to this particular mechanism. They say it's a long COVID or it's a post-COVID symptom, but we don't know where that comes from. Usually, there's a sense of fatigue, but we don't know how to explain uh, the connection between a, a biological abnormality and a symptom. So there are lots of reviews published in Frontier, for example, that are assumptions. So organ by organ, you have the symptoms on the left-hand side, in the middle, the physiopathological uh, mechanism, and on the right-hand side, the upstream mechanisms such as viral persistence, etc. What's important is that we focus on this, the central nervous system. A lot of symptoms can be explained by impairment of the CNS. And I'm talking about the whole CNS, whether functional disorders or inflammation of the microglia. All of those avenues should be explored. We need to explore them further. And they can help explain a wide variety of different symptoms. Now, this is something I already said. Are there something missing? from research. Well, we have very few patients that are being uh, followed uh, um, by self-employed uh, doctors. Uh, if we need to look at the kinetics in the studies, we see we see interesting things at four or six months. We need to look at severe patients and the others as well. So it's a real methodology problem. In If people don't go to the hospital, it's difficult to take, a, to take blood. Okay, management. Rapid response is important. This is not a real consensus conference. We can't have dividends-based medicine when it comes to management of that condition because there's no literature. It's an emerging problem, obviously, so we need to bring together experts. A lot of experts have come in, worked on that, a lot of nonprofits as well. Uh, as part of HAS, the goal is to improve management. So the main principle behind management is that you need to evaluate the initial episode. The intensity of the symptoms was significant. Evaluate the current condition, the impact of symptoms as well. This is part of the definition. We need to look for uh, COVID, the complications that we all know, embolism, myocarditis, etc. It's possible even without an initial hospital admission. Look for comorbidity uh, decompensation. Look for differential diagnostics, etc. And also uh, look for diagnostics that can explain uh, several symptoms or uh, syndromes such as hyperventilation, which are very frequent in such populations. Then we need a holistic management uh, with symptomatic treatment. There are no contraindications. Provide patient information. We need to tell them what we know, what we don't know. Uh, rehabilitation is key. Uh, 
And these are patients who are experiencing extreme fatigue, so we need to adjust accordingly and also uh, handling their mental health. So support care uh, uh, when it comes to depress depression, whether associated with the symptoms or uh, as a reaction to COVID. So it's pretty complicated. You need an underlying assumption. You need homogeneous uh, uh, design. Uh, so there are multiple assumptions, underlying assumptions. Uh, if you want to set up a therapeutic uh, trial on one molecule on one product, you need to f find patients for whom that molecule will work, uh, for whom it's more likely to work. So we need patient clusters, and that's very hard. At the end of the day, a couple of examples. These are the products currently being tested. There are lots of them, as you can see. Uh, mostly drugs against allergies, and monoclonal antibodies with symptoms. What's interesting is that the evaluation is done on symptoms and also on quality of life, QOL. Uh, it's true for some treatments. And as you can see, you explain the the proposed mechanism is extremely varied in terms of the mode of action. Some of that stuff came out in January and there's more recent data. So a management of uh, actually a behavioral management that are protocols for readapting the healthcare pathway. A lot of trust on that. It's interesting to see that the crisis has been an opportunity to intensify post-infection management. I think it's useful and it will probably help with other clinical conditions as opposed to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2. So there is such a thing as long COVID. Not everything can be associated with the infection, but there's actual real suffering of physiological, physiopathological mechanisms has yet to be uh, explored. Uh, we need to give the patient time and we need to uh, look at post-infection uh, symptoms. And all of this was based on a literature review, which shows that, well, they have and a lot of uh, studies on emerging diseases, Ebola, SARS-CoV-2, chikungunya, West Nile virus, SARS-CoV-2, et cetera. And the symptoms are pretty similar for one emerging disease to another. So I think we need to do cross-cutting research, looking at the different diseases to look at uh, uh, the common denominators and the differences. Thank you very much. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you, thank you, Olivier Robineau. That was a very interesting presentation and topic. <coughs> We're still discussing a lot. Are there any questions? Moderators from the audience also, two hands have been raised. Uh, microphones, please. The first one who gets the microphone wins the race. Go ahead, ma'am. Brigitte Autran. Yes, that was very, very interesting. Uh, and Kovas was uh, thinking of inviting you anyway. The biologic hypothesis is important. It should be taken in consideration. But how can we estimate the proportion of people who have a viral persistence? One might be tempted to start uh, trials with antiviral drugs. Well, of course, it's difficult because there's been a single work on general population clusterizing patients based on an hypothesis saying, okay, with this and that symptom, maybe we should go in this or that direction. Only one trial in the general population. The others um, have failed. And personally, I have failed in my analysis to clusterize symptoms. It's extremely difficult if, only, if you only see the patient. We uh, discussed uh, interferon assays. Uh, it might be interesting to screen the patients initially. There is work that can be done. In uh, Geneva, they don't look into the viral persistence. They look into a protein that seems to block mitochondria and therefore the energy mechanism. They select patients who they believe are sufficiently affected. They screen them with a blood assay looking for that protein. And if the protein is found, then they start the protocol as a randomized trial. Question, how do we find symbol, simple virology markers from blood samples that would steer us towards a viral orientation towards uh, versus another. And it would be on the scale of a small population rather than one individual. And obviously we don't have a threshold uh, as far as the blood tests are concerned. A, uh, a treatment to test, well, treatment of the, the evidence, of course, but that's based on the assumption that all patients have a viral persistence. Two trials have been launched in the US. 
However, if there is only a part of those, a proportion of those people that have viral persistence and we do a trial, then we might miss the opportunity of a drug that would have been efficient for a subgroup. So I have a rather pessimistic uh, vision. And if the viral persistence does not affect all of the patients and only a minority of them, then it would be important to sh make them stand out, except it's very difficult uh, with virology. Okay. The lady first, Clotilde Lavena, I'm a clinician in Nantes. Congratulations, Olivier. It was really interesting. Now, have uh, variants, uh, differences been uh, observed uh, regarding the, 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 the variants of, for instance, uh, long COVID or not long COVID? Well, clinical manifestations, no, we don't have any data. But decreased prevalence, yes. I mean, I did not focus on that, but uh, vaccination is also an argument that will decrease the intensity of the symptoms and therefore the prevalence also of uh, long COVID. But the intensity, the severity of the symptoms, there are very few trials looking to the intensity, uh, the intensity level of the symptoms. It's, it's usually yes or no, fatigue or no fatigue, but not how intense the fatigue is. And sometimes we feel like it's uh, going down with the variance and vaccination. But if we measure the intensity, well, we think uh, it might decrease the intensity of the symptoms. We hardly ever see people now coming to the uh, clinic uh, in a wheelchair where, while we used to. Jérôme Estakin, Sam, you were talking about patients uh, with a long-term follow-up. Uh, and, and there are elements we have observed with Pierre Corbeau in Nîmes. People who had a uh, deficiency in the early CD8 response were people who had the most severe alterations, although their ulterior immunity response was the equivalent. So the uh, initial lymphopenia was one of the elements that uh, explained the process. And to answer the question asked by Brigitte regarding biomarkers, we have a press, uh, a paper who's uh, under embargo for press release. We, we have found biomarkers who might identify people who have long COVID forms after six months and one year. And a part of what we have observed is that even patients who do not develop a long COVID form can still have signs after one year. So that's something that maybe we don't measure for other infections. If we're talking about influenza, for instance, we all have uh, immuno immunology symptoms even after a few months. But yes, but that covers another issue more than just the long COVID. It's a long-term uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2. Some uh, trials have been conducted in the US in, uh, in veteran cohorts. Mm -hmm. You know, the guys who went to war, or veterans, veteran cohorts. And uh, we see that there is an increase of the uh, number of cardiovascular events in the following months. And yet those people do not necessarily show symptoms of long COVID. So there really is a question uh, regarding the persistent pro-inflammatory uh, characteristic uh, and the immunological abnormalities uh, besides uh, the symptoms. The lady had raised her hand. Thank you, Sophie from Lyon. Short question. You said earlier that vaccination protected. There are people with long COVID and who are vaccinated. I have uh, read uh, a trial that says that it amplifies the symptoms. Well, it's a contradictory trial. It's a well-selected, it's an extremely selected population. Uh, I don't know, we have to really go back to general population studies before we can answer this question. And, uh, you know, I don't think it actually has an influence. I don't think. That's my opinion. Vaccination protects. It protects from the risk of, I mean, the, the first risk is to catch COVID and it protects from infection. I have an observation, if you'll allow me. The question is, uh, has medical recognition improved, uh, medical acknowledgement improved? Uh, recently, I uh, have read a paper titled Help. The uh, myth of hysterics uh, is coming back. Hysterical people is coming back. It, like people who said that if everybody, if everybody practiced uh, Tai Chi and meditation, uh, things would go better. Now, medical acknowledgement, has it improved? Well, there are several levels. 
there is always a problem uh, when you face something you don't know. Uh, we're not talking about uh, showing uh, radiological stigmata with additional uh, imaging uh, tests. So the shortcut is always to say, if we don't see anything, there's nothing. And yet people are suffering. Or people say, it's all in your head, so get lost. You know, no, no, it's not necessarily in the head. And the symptoms are there. So the fact that people are hysterical is uh, means that uh, people have a psychiatry issue, but it's not a psychiatric issue. We're talking about a neurology issue and it affects women more than men. Yes, of course. What well, does a matter of gender, obviously, but it really raises questions uh, for neuropsychiatric issues, inflammatory uh, issues and genetics also. There may be different due to genetic origin. Thank you very much. No more questions, we move on. <clears throat> Last uh, presentation for this afternoon, for this session, Fernando Real, researcher at CNRS, he has worked uh, in Megan Bonsel's uh, team in Institut Cochin, and he recently reached the uh, joined the Institut Pasteur de Lille. He works on the uh, persistence mechanism, macrophages and mega megakaryocytes, uh, hot persistent. Uh, great opportunity to present this work. Uh, so today I'm going to tell a tale of two giants of our organism, the macrophage and megakaryocytes that can uh, host persistent viruses uh, in this presentation, uh, HIV-1. So I will begin with our first giant here, which is the macrophage, big eaters of our immune system. Uh, they are large tissue residents specialized in myeloid cells uh, that are that which hold its to engulf and destroy infectious microorganisms, also dead cells or dying cells. I was always puzzled by the fact that several pathogens multiply and persist in the very same cell supposed to kill these pathogens. And here is an example that I took from a PhD student of mine in Brazil um, in my project with immunoparasitology. This is a macrophage hosting several uh, parasites inside a huge pathogen containing vacuums. This is quite beautiful and also puzzling. And when I learned that HIV also formed this virus containing compartments, I decided to uh, investigate a little bit further this interaction and the participation of macrophages into HIV persistence. So I was, I'm quite proud and honored to have contributed to Morgan Bone Cell's um, demonstration that mucosal macrophages are really HIV reservoirs in vivo. Uh, all this story um, uh, started with a very nice um, in vitro model established at the beginning um, uh, by Jonathan Gano, also a member of Morgan Bonsell's lab, in which we could prove that an infected T cell, for example, can interact with the epithelium of the, 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 the mucosa and shed virus after virological synapses formed with the epithelium. This virus will reach the macrophages that are in the stroma. These macrophages will be productively infected until the latency. And the latency here is proved by the reactivation of the macrophage, reactivation of production of new virus by an inflammatory stimulus. We did that with uh, uh, ex vivo uh, uh, extracted macrophages, extracted from the mucosal uh, tissue from uh, antiretroviral treated uh, individuals. And here we can see a macrophage hosting uh, viruses compartmentalized in these virus containing compartments. We can take them out of, of the, the, the tissue, uh, treat with an inflammatory stimulus, in this case here lipo, lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of the bacterial membrane. And then we can resume uh, the production of the virus, proving that these macrophages were latent and that they can be reactivated by inflammatory stimulus. Recently, we have shown that an endogenous component that is inflam uh, inflammatory as well, the alamine S108, present in these uh, macrophage reservoirs, can also reactivate the production of the reservoir. And this is connected to a glycolysis. So there is a connection between immunometabolism and the, the, the maintenance of these reservoirs. Of course, we can think about different mechanisms of the maintenance of these reservoirs during the treatment. But one, of, one mechanism that I'm particularly interested in is the, the cell to cell spread. And I've been investigating that in the context of my work in the parasitology field. And this, for example, is it's an example that uh, Leishmania parasites can just 
get out of a dying cell and colonize a non-infected cell. So this kind of phenomenon also interested me. It's quite similar to a relay race. So I always do this kind of, of analogy. And then uh, at the context of all this work, we put forward a very uh, interesting original hypothesis that platelets could do this kind of transfer of the virus to the macrophages. First, because platelets are not only responsible for uh, the hemostasis and, and clotting, but they are being recognized as, as important immune components of the blood. Uh, second, because platelets can internalize HIV in vitro. And this is a very important input for the project given by Dr. Elizabeth Cromer Bordet, also a former uh, researcher in the Institute Cochin. So here is an image from uh, Elizabeth's group showing HIV inside a vesicle formed in the, in the platelet. Uh, Interestingly, the platelets are short-lived and are scavenged by macrophages that could be a root of infection of macrophages as well. And this could, of course, be a mechanism of HIV persistence. So we took some platelets from uh, uh, antiretroviral uh, treated uh, patients and we discovered that these platelets can host uh, uh, viruses at frequency of 0.1%, it could be, uh, it could seem negligible, but it would represent an input, a daily input of 20,000, uh, around 20,000 uh, platelets containing the virus into the circulation. Important to say that these patients are, uh, un uh, have an undetectable viral load. Uh, in ex vivo experiments, we can take these platelets, put in contact with the macrophages, and these macrophages engulf the platelet and become infected. This could be prevented we're using antibodies that will tag specific platelets, but some, uh, some individuals will present it, especially the immunological non-responders, which are individuals that cannot mount, regain an immunocompetent status despite the therapy, uh, which poses us, uh, the question that perhaps HIV-containing platelets are, are causing this uh, immunological failure. We tested that also in vitro by putting these platelets in contact with T cells and seeing an aberrant uh, metabolism. I invite you to read these papers for more details. Uh, and this comes the story about the second giant, because the fact that we can find HIV in platelets in individuals that have undetectable viral load indicate that there is no uh, endocytosis of free virus by the platelets, that probably these platelets are generated with the virus from an infected megakarocyte. And this is our second giant of the story. We could find that uh, megakarocytes are uh, infected by the HIV, we could find integrated DNA uh, in these megakarocytes in people treated by the therapy. And we are now investigating whether these megakarocytes are central immune controllers that are hijacked by the HIV, either by spreading the virus toward the tissues by mac mac macrophage interaction or by immunomodulating the function of these cells. So uh, we are beginning uh, our studies by proving a very uh, basic concept that an infected megakarocyte could generate platelets with the virus. So we are investigating the inheritance of uh, virus-containing compartments by the platelets produced by an infected megakarocyte. We could prove that these megakarocytes can have integrated DNA. They have a self-limiting viral production, which is typical of the myeloid compartment when infected by the HIV. We could show that uh, mature megakarocytes, around 3% of these mature megakarocytes can host uh, viral components, RNA and also P24. And we can see that a megakarocyte that is infected in vitro can also have these structures suggestive of viral, sorry, containing compartments. So this story is only at the beginning, but I would like to show you my last slide doing some kind of overview of lymphoid versus myeloid compartments. Uh, we know that uh, latently infected memory T cells is the best described HIV reservoir. They have HIV integrated into the genomes. They are long lived uh, in, in the circulation. They stop replication under the therapy and they are susceptible to HIV cytopathic effects and also cytotoxic lymphocyte mediated killing. So this is known, it's quite established. It's, it's a very simplistic way to summarize the, the issue of the reservoirs. The macrophages, on the other hand, can be also uh, latently affected by HIV forming reservoirs. They also display HIV integrated into the genomes. They have a wide tissue distribution. They are localized in tissues. They, are, uh, they, they can have a long lifespan and self-renewal capacity, so they could really be uh, uh, reservoirs. 
uh, in contrast to T cells, they store, uh, this is a mark of the myeloid <coughs> reservoir. They will store viruses in, uh, in vesicles and they can be reactivated quickly with inflammatory stimulus. They are susceptible to each of infection, of course, and in contrast to C cell, they are resistant to its cytopathic effects and CTL. And now what we are proposing here is that infected megakaryocytes could be new players in HIV persistence because they can also have HIV integrated in, the, in their genomes. They are hyploidy. We don't know exactly what's the impact of hyploidy in the reservoir. So this is a very interesting open question. Uh, they are short-lived unless a precursor or a progenitor is infected. So this is also an, uh, an issue that we are investigating now. And they can produce platelets that will circulate and they can inherit uh, viral components. Uh, susceptibility to HIV cytopathic effects and CTL, it's unknown. So my take home message here is that marketed for efficient therapeutics in HIV AIDS. So let's think big. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. That was a short presentation. There will be no questions. And we will take a 10 minute break before we move on to the fifth session, which is not going to be the least, although it will be the last. Last session for today, and uh, last but not the least, because we're going to talk uh, about the One Health approach, which is obviously a hot topic. What about collaboration and modalities? How the various uh, players of human and animal and environmental health can, must work together. And uh, without uh, leaving aside civil society, citizens, and the local level. The moderators will be uh, Marie Marie Olive, researcher at uh, IRAD, and Stefan Ziantara, INRAE ANSES uh, Veterinary School, uh, the Virology Unit of Maison Alfort. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you both for being here until the end of the two days because they were very. Uh, interesting, although we are probably going to face some transportation issues. And I'm going to give the floor to Marie-Marie, who is going to introduce the first uh, speaker. Introduce Dr. L uh, Raina Prowright. Dr. Prowright is a former clinical and field veterinarian. She is now professor of epidemiology and disease ecology at the Cornell University. Her research program develops the science of pandemic prevention through a transdisciplinary leadership and innovation. Her work advances a one health approach by bridging science in, in disease dynamics with public health practices and meaningful policies. Her research focuses on different areas such as link between land use change and pathogen spillover and the prevention of epidemic and the implementation of science for the protection of ecosystem and human health. She will talk about how and with whom should we conduct one health research. Raina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And it's wonderful to um, be here virtually talking to you all. I Il faut qu'on monte un peu le niveau sonore, pardonnez-moi. Can we increase the uh, sound level, please? Because we don't hear you much. Could we please uh, raise the uh, volume uh, level? We can't hear you very well. See, um, I don't know if I can adjust. We don't hear you. No, there's nothing for the moment. Do it uh, as you did before. It, it was better. Now we can hear you. Ah, petit problème de connexion. On va essayer de régler. We clearly have a connection issue. We're going to try and solve it rapidly. Uh, Professor Plowright is calling us from Cornell University. Which state is that? 
Okay, I'm just using the microphone on my computer now. So um, I hope that that works okay. Let me know if you cannot hear me. Um, I, I'm going to talk about the connections between wildlife animals who host infectious diseases, the forests that provide food for these animals, and the health of, of human communities. I'm in particular going to be talking about these creatures that you can see here. This is a, a flying fox. Sometimes we call them fruit bats, but they actually prefer nectar. As you can see, they're feeding on a, um, a eucalyptus nectar from Australia here right now. I'd like to start by acknowledging this extraordinary group of collaborators, Bat One Health, and we're all working together to try to understand how pathogens spill over from one species to another. And we're particularly focused on pathogens that come from bats. And bats are really extraordinary creatures. There are over 1,400 species. They're incredibly important for our ecosystems. Bats, uh, they eat insects, they disperse the seeds for fruit, they disperse pollen, uh, and they cover an incredibly wide range of niches. In fact, a fifth of mammalian species are bats, and two thirds of all individual land mammals are bats. But bats are rather small, and so only a tenth of the biomass of wild land mammals are bats. And bats are also understood to be an extremely important reservoir of zoonotic pathogens. So, for example, uh, we, we understand that this the current pandemic originated in bats, but we also know that Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the first SARS outbreak, Ebola, Nipah, and Hendra all come from bats. However, it's very difficult to study the spillover of these pathogens because often we don't we don't actually know what the reservoir host species is, and we often don't detect the spillover events until the outbreaks are, are well on their way in humans. We work on Hendra virus and Nipah virus because there are many spillover events and we're able to track them in time and then try to understand how they happen. I'm going to talk particularly today about some empirical data that we just published, looking at the connections between changes in bat ecology and the emergence of Hendra virus, and also looking at some of the, the, the work on excretion of Hendra virus from these bats and some work that's already in progress and not yet published. Hendra virus is a, a, a lethal pathogen for humans with a 60% fatality rate, and we understand the epidemiology very well. We understand that the bats in Australia are endemically infected with Hendra virus. When a bat comes and it feeds in a tree in a horse paddock and excretes the virus into the grass, and a horse comes along and consumes that virus, then the horse can become infected, and then people become infected from sick horses. The fatality rate in horses is 80% and about 60% in people. I'm going to start this story in 2011. So at this point, we had already discovered Hendra virus. This is the east coast of Australia. This is time. We'd had sporadic outbreaks. Each one of these is a spillover event. But in 2011, we had this unprecedented cluster of 18 spillover events in a short period of time. All of these were in winter, and we always see the spillovers in winter in the subtropics of Australia. There were, uh, gosh, multiple um, um, news headlines. It was a, a national disaster at the time during these spillover events because people were getting or being exposed to a virus from their pet horses. So it was very scary for people. Thankfully, no people were actually infected during this outbreak, but um, many horses died. Soon after this, this unprecedented cluster of Hendra virus, we gathered together a group of experts to try to understand why did this suddenly happen? Why now? Why so many outbreaks? And essentially, we had people who were experts on bats, people who are experts on trees and their flowering, people who are experts on, on the horses and their behavior, people who are experts on virus. 
And we came out of three days of meeting with really, I, I realized afterwards, everyone really had the answer. Everyone thought they had the answer. The virologists thought it was all about the viral survival. The bat ecologists, it was all about the bat behavior. The horse managers, it was all about the horses. We even had an expert on grass there, the grass that grows in horse paddocks. And he thought really this was about the grass and how it grows in tree under the trees during cold conditions. And after many months of thinking about this, I realized eventually, actually, they're all right. Everything actually that they, everything that people proposed was really in, involved in this outbreak and that you actually had to have a whole lot of conditions aligned. You had to have the bats there. They had to be shedding the virus. The virus had to survive on the grass for long enough for horses to consume it. Horses had to have the behavior to be under the tree consuming the grass and they had to be susceptible. And then we followed that study by looking more carefully at spillover and what, how could we then apply this to all zoonotic pathogens, not Hendra virus? And we came up with this, um, this, this, this conceptual understanding of spillover where we had factors related to the, the host, the virus, behavior, and then things that happened within the next host, whether the pathogen was compatible or not with the next host. And we showed that many of these factors are extremely dynamic in space and time. And to get a spillover event, you really had to have everything line up at the one point in, in place and time. So the one observation really stood out from that meeting, and that was a biologist, Peggy Eby, who had been on in the horse paddocks where spillover events had happened. And she had noticed that the bats were feeding strain, they were feeding on strange foods. So as I mentioned, these bats, they prefer nectar from native forests. But during this outbreak, they were eating weeds like camphor laurel and cocos palms, like we would call them starvation avoidance foods. And curiously, I had also worked on bats previously and had noticed this connection between nutritional stress, so food shortage, and Hendra virus in the past. And so we started to work together to think about how could food shortage perhaps have led to these outbreaks. So my colleague, Peggy Eby, she had been working with beekeepers for actually now for 30 years, looking at when bees have food and when bats have food, because actually they eat, they, they generally eat, uh, feed on the same species. And we were able to look at um, when the bees didn't have food and find out that when the bees had no food, there were these signs of food shortages in bats. Their reproductive rate was very low compared to when there was no food shortage. And we found bats were coming into rehabilitation centers at high rates when there were food shortages. And we found that the bat food shortage and the bee food shortage were simultaneous. They happened at the same time. And this was consistent over what ended up being a 25 year study period. So one thing then we discovered, and this is a nice um, illustration that was done by The Economist on our paper, is that here we have these food shortages for bees and bats, that these food shortages, they followed strong El Nino events. This is when the, the temperature in the Pacific Ocean is high. So we have this undulating El Nino cycle. And when we have these very strong El Nino events, the following year, we have a food shortage for bats and for bees. And then later in our study period, each of these food shortages was followed by a cluster of spillover events. And here you can see these are the um, 2011 events. So if, every time there was a food shortage, there was a cluster of spillover events the following winter, except for in 2020, and I'll come back to that at the end. What we now understand is happening is that these previously nomadic animals who had big populations, uh, when they experience a food shortage, so no nectar in native forests, there's no flowering or nectar, they then fission into small populations and they then reside in, in um, agricultural and urban areas. And what this looks like is this explosion in the number of roosts, the number of bat populations, but all quite small. We looked at where these new populations were forming during these food shortages, and they're forming in agricultural areas and urban areas. Each dot is a bat roost there. But the spillovers are happening in the agricultural areas because that is where horses are. And we need the horse as the intermediate host for this virus. 
We think that the underlying reason for this change in the bat biology is the loss of the food that feeds them in winter. There's only like four to five species that provide nectar in winter, and they've almost entirely been cleared. In fact, we looked through our 25 year study period and a third of what they had remaining was lost just during the last 25 years. You can see there's very little winter habitat, but abundant summer habitat. So if we come back then to this framing of spillover, essentially what we've seen is this shift in host distribution from native forests into these agricultural areas. But what about then the pathogen infection and shedding? So in other studies, we've been looking at how the bats are excreting the virus over time. And interestingly, we actually have found through these studies, this is the, um, the, this is the amount or the number of the, the percentage of bats that are shedding virus. What we've found is actually it's the amount of virus the bats are shedding that really correlates with spillover. And so if we use different thresholds for virus, where red means that there's just a very high viral load there, you can see quite a different pattern of shedding over time. And these peaks then correspond with when we see spillover to horses. We think a lot of the other time, a lot of the time they're shedding low levels of virus, maybe just RNA, maybe not even infectious virus. So this is, this is a really interesting finding that we're following up on. We also have been looking at the excretion of virus from these bat populations that now have moved into these urban and agricultural areas and comparing them to bats that have remained in their traditional habitat over winter. And what we find, this is the amount of virus or the proportion of bats shedding virus. What we've found is that it's the bats in these novel overwintering habitats like agricultural areas that are shedding the virus, particularly in winter, but after a food shortage, all of the bats are shedding virus. All of the bats are shedding more virus. So now we can add another layer here where we've got the viral shedding, which is really probably about the amount of virus they're shedding. So we know host distribution is important. We've actually shown in other studies the, the host density may not be important. It's small populations of stressed bats that are shedding the virus. Maybe prevalence is not important. It's actually the infection intensity, the amount of virus they're shedding that is really important. And in other studies, we've shown that the excretion and survival of the virus is also important. And then behaviors of the bats and behaviors of, of horses and humans within these modified environments are really important as well. So now we have, we know that we have these climate oscillations. So high ONI is this high El Nino years, leads to a food shortage, leads to spillover. Food shortages lead to the fission of roosts into agricultural areas. And it's the bats in these agricultural areas that are responsible for spillover. But I'm going to come back now to 2020, where I said we, we actually predicted there should be spillover events, but there wasn't. There were no spillover events. There was an early spillover event, and then they stopped. So we sent our field teams out to figure out what was happening. And what we found is that there was this extraordinary pulse of flowering of blue gum in Queensland within our study area. And 200,000 bats had actually come to this pulse. That was three quarters of polio, uh, Terupus polyocephalus, one of the bat species, three quarters of the individuals that beats bat species aggregated around this one flowering pulse. And we thought this was very interesting because we had noticed this pattern that every four years when spotted gum flowers, another big flowering event, there was never a spillover event. So we thought we need to look very carefully at this, but let's do it in a structured systematic way. So we went back in time and we looked at when there were flowering pulses measured by huge aggregations of bats on the landscape. And in the gray here, each one of these is a, a winter in Australia and subtropical Australia. You can see there is flowering, 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 flowering. And then we have gaps where there's no flowering. And we also have gaps where there is also no data. These data are extremely hard to get. But then we put the spillover events on this graph and what we found is that there was never a spillover event when there was flowering. We only saw Hendra virus spillover events when there was no flowering in winter of these 
what are becoming now rare winter flowering pulses. So we can then add to this that we now think that these winter flowering pulses in remnant patches of forest actually stop spillover. And we were able to put this into a Bayesian network model and correctly predict whether there was a cluster of spillover events or not in every one of the 25 years of our study period which looks like this. So the 2011 cluster and, and then other clusters through time. So this, this really um, proposes a potential solution to spillover. If the underlying root cause of this problem is that the forests that feed bats in winter have been cleared, and when remaining habitat flowers, the spillovers stop, then why not replant those winter flowering habitats? As I said, there's only a few species that flower in winter. They happen to be good habitat for koalas and boars. And really this is a win-win situation. There's no reason we should not be doing this. So we're proposing that we should be replanting forests to stop spillover as a one health solution to spillover. Another issue that I, I, I have not mentioned, and it's been very interesting, we've had a lot of press coverage of this, this, this paper, and um, it's been very good to see the headlines are habitat loss uh, leads to spillover, replant habitats and stop spillover. But one thing that just hasn't got attention, even though I keep mentioning it, and I think is one of the scariest parts of this system, is that as those bats stop feeding in native forest and they come into agricultural areas, they remain in those agricultural areas and they eat weeds. They eat things that are not, not actually food that bats would, would naturally eat. In doing that, they're no longer moving genetic material of our forests around. So previously they had huge, huge aggregations, often tens to hundreds of thousands of animals, and they would move from one patch of forest covered in nectar, covered in pollen, and then move to another patch of forest and pollinate those forests. And they were able to move this genetic material over huge fragmented landscapes and are really one of the only species that can do that. But we're losing that pollination, we're losing that ecosystem service, and it doesn't seem to be even catching attention that this is happening. So the health of plants and forests is really tied up with also the health of these animals, but our health as well. So now I'm going to expand this conceptual understanding of spillover with this, this concept of land use induced spillover, where we have historically animals are largely separated, the wildlife is separated from humans. We have perhaps uh, undulating dynamics of infection, but really no, no huge peaks, but these infections are shed away from humans. With land use induced spillover, we have animals moving to find food in areas with humans. We have animals that are more likely to be stressed, uh, whether it's through food shortages or physiological stress, so peaks in shedding virus. And they're shedding virus in places where there are people and domestic animals. But this concept of an ecological countermeasure where we replant this critical habitat that bats need in winter or whatever it is for this, the particular system, move animals back into native habitat, uh, make sure animals are not stressed and food uh, short of nutrition and a shedding virus away from people. And this is a concept of ecological countermeasures and we feel this should be a critical part of pandemic prevention. So we avoid wildlife being displaced into human habitat we avoid stress and we make sure animals have the food they need, particularly during critical times of year, like when they're lactating or pregnant or there's very little food available. And uh, at the moment, this, this type of pandemic prevention is rarely being discussed. Right now, people are generally focused on uh, countermeasures that include uh, vaccines and therapeutics, which are incredibly important, and early detection of pathogens, which is absolutely critical. But we're saying we should at least include the prevention of the actual spillover events within our pandemic prevention strategies, along with these medical countermeasures. Thank you.
Merci, merci beaucoup sur, euh, pour cette présentation très intéressante. Thank you so much for this most interesting presentation. Are there any questions in the audience or from our remote attendees or from our moderators? Please raise your hand. Euh, voilà, avec la lumière dans les yeux, je ne vois pas bien. Je vous en prie. Uh, I'm Hervé Raoul from uh, INSERM. Uh, I have a question concerning the, the comparison you could make with Nipah uh, outbreaks. So uh, it's, it was very impressive to the demonstration that uh, the spillover can match uh, with flooring or not flooring period. Uh, do you think the same uh, could be uh, could happen with Nipa in India or in Bangladesh? That's a really wonderful question. We also work on Nipah virus in Bangladesh. So I think the very interesting thing here is that in Australia, we've caught this system in this rapid transition where we've gone from bats feeding in native forests to bats now feeding in agricultural and urban areas and being essentially associated with humans. So we looked in Bangladesh and we looked at the history of land clearing and all of the forests, almost all forests in Bangladesh were cleared actually hundreds of years ago. And Bangladesh is a densely populated country. And if you look at the bat populations, almost every bat population is associated with a human community. And so I think Bangladesh is at the other end of this spectrum. And I suspect that maybe in 50 years time, Australia will be just like Bangladesh, where every population of bats is associated with humans. And then talking with my colleagues who work in East Africa, West Africa and India, they all talk about the same phenomenon of the bats becoming more and more human associated and less associated with native forest. But in very few parts of the world is data being collected and certainly no long-term data. So unfortunately, these, these events are happening. We'll, we'll have a spillover and we will we'll wonder how it, how it came to be. But without the long-term data, it's very difficult to say. So, and I think with, with bats, there's also with, with Nipah virus, the really critical um, part of that system is the drinking of date palm sap. So Nipah virus is transmitted from bats to humans when bats go to the tree where date palm sap is being collected. They, they, um, they slash a hole in the tree and the, 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 the sap drips out. The bats come along and they lick at the sap and then contaminate the pot that, that is collecting the sap. And so what we need to know is, do they drink that sap as a food of preference or as a starvation avoidance food? So we actually think they like the sap and they, they might eat it as a preference, but the systematic, careful ecological studies to show that have not been done. And that's really a critical next step with the Nipah virus system. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? Are there other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, do we know how much, um, uh, why bats are such a good uh, host for zoonotic pathogens? Yes, that's, a, that's the big question right now. It's so amazing, really, that they have so many pathogens. I mean, there are many, many species of bats, so we'd expect them to have many viruses, but the viruses that they have tend to be very serious for humans. They, they cause uh, high fatality rates in humans, yet they cause no disease in the bats. So we think that bats have very special mechanisms for dealing with viruses, and uh, we don't know exactly what those mechanisms are yet, but there's a couple of clues. So bats are the only mammals that fly, and to be able to fly, they have to sustain these incredibly high metabolic rates. So it'd be like a human running the 100 meters, but then keeping that up for like hours and hours in a row. And bats do this without experiencing oxidative stress, which should be causing free radicals that uh, damage DNA. And we think bats might have DNA repair mechanisms that actually allow them to sustain these metabolic rates without oxidative stress. And this may be tied up with their ability to host viruses. The other thing about bats that is really interesting is they have a very long lifespan 
compared to their body size. So a bat that is five grams, like the, the, the weight of a nickel in the US, a coin, uh, can live up to 40 years. And that shouldn't be the case. The smaller the animal, the less, the, 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 the fewer years they should live, but they must have some way to withstand senescence. And we think that's probably also tied up with their ability to repair DNA and therefore also host viruses. But, but this is a, a major frontier in science right now is to try to understand why this is. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? Are there any other questions? Many thanks. I think there's so much to learn from the connections, the relationship between bats, such small animals and human beings. They're so small and yet they're so pretty and so cute and yet they're so worrisome because they carry so many potential diseases. Thank you so much. Let's now hear the next speaker. Let's switch to a different virus. Uh, let's look at uh, avian influenza. We're going to hear from Beatrice Graland. She's in charge of the virology, parasitology, and immunology uh, unit at uh, ANSYS. Uh, she's been working at ANSYS since 2003 in animal virology. She's working on circoviruses, uh, coronaviruses since 2018 including Newcastle disease, influenza, and she's trying to characterize in vitro, in vivo viruses, virulence factors, uh, diagnostic methods, and looking at the changes in viral genomes. Beatrice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Many thanks to the organizers for putting together this scientific uh, seminar and also for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about avian influenza. The challenges related to avian influenza, the challenge when it comes to health, animal health, not just bird health, and also human health. A couple of general considerations. Let's take stock. Influenza virus. Well, Many of you are very familiar with influenza virus, but let's focus specifically on avian influenza, bird flu, particularly type A, bird flu. So they are characterized based on subtype, based on hemagglutinin. There are 16 different hemagglutinins in birds and, are, and also neuraminidase. So there are none different types in birds. So. When you combine H and N, you end up with a bunch of different subtypes. And there is another classification which is based on the genome, which is segmented on the basis of eight chromosomes, and this gives us the different genotypes. So in birds, contrary to mammals, multiplication happens in the GI tract and also in the respiratory tract, and this means more spillover. The virus is more transmitted among birds. So you have different types of birds. It's a wild reservoir, waterfowl, palmipeds, waders, etc. We have also identified that for specific virus subtypes, particularly H5 and H7, those viruses may uh, have different forms. Uh, they can be low pathogenic or highly pathogenic, but only for birds. And we keep a close eye on H5 and H7 because we've realized that their zoonotic potential is uh, very favorable. But, it's, but there are other subtypes besides H5 and H7 that are zoonotic. There are other strains as well. But those uh, are what we clearly watch out for, particularly in terms of human health and animal health. So direct transmission is a possibility, aerosols, or indirect transmission if you operate in a soiled environment because the GI tract uh, is, uh, plays, an, plays an important role in terms of shedding uh, in birds. In terms of transmission, as I said before, waterfowls serve as a wild reservoir for the uh, <coughs> viruses. So I'm talking about ducks and, and geese, uh, and they can transmit the virus to other members of their kind, but also other species as well. So if we take an interest in other birds, other wild birds, and poultry, 
farm animals, farm poultry, then we can see that the virus can be transmitted between farms and within a single farm and also between wild animals, wild birds and domestic birds, farm animals. Animals, animals that we know can be potentially sensitive to certain strains for, for such as horses and pigs and dogs and cats, but also in terms of wildlife, seals and whales, as well as human beings. So there's a significant risk to human health. This is true in France. Uh, farm animals are particularly at risk when they come into contact with diseased wild birds. This is true for pig farms and poultry farms. Uh, uh, pigs are a potential reservoir, <coughs> which can be sensitive to avian influenza, but also pig viruses and human viruses. Pigs can be an excellent host for what we call genetic uh, reassortment. So, Turkeys stand apart. As far as birds are concerned, turkeys are also sensitive to some pig viruses, a little bit more sensitive than other birds. And they're also sensitive to avian viruses. By genetic resortment, I mean in case of infection of the same individual by two avian flu viruses. So we need to look at evolution of those viruses. They evolve quickly, either with a cumulative, uh, uh, with a, an accumulation of uh, point mutations over time. And if you have a single animal, a single individual that can be influenced or rather uh, infected by two different uh, influenza, avian influenza viruses, this is what I mean by genetic resorbent. So. So much for my general considerations. When it comes to the avian influenza situation in birds, I decided to focus on one avian flu virus that is currently circulating, and it's been a concern for a number of years now, whether in France, in the rest of Europe, or in the rest of the world. And there is a strong zoonotic potential. So those are viruses that are part of a particular lineage, a particular line. It's an H5 subtype, and it's highly pathogenic for burns, and those viruses are all come from a virus that was first isolated in China. That's the that's the common ancestor. It's the Agus Guangdong virus. It's an H5N1 virus that was discovered in 1996 in poultry farms in China. And it then spread and infected human beings. There were several cases of human contamination, and it also spread to uh, wild birds. Up until 2019, or rather up until 2012, 65 countries were contaminated by that strain. There were sporadic cases of human infection, but that was still a cause for concern. And the evolutionary potential of those viruses is significant. As you can see on the right hand side, this is the phylogenetic tree, and you can see the significant and quick diversity of those viruses, genetic diversity. There's so much genetic diversity because they have their very own classification. So now we've ended up to the uh, clay 2.3.4 or even clay 2.3.4b. That's how much genetic diversity we're talking about. Clay 2.3.4.4b, which started spreading very broadly across the world. And also there's genetic uh, reassortment with other avian flu viruses, and this caused the emergence of H5N6 in Asia with sporadic human uh, contaminations in China, and waves of, of epi new episodic waves, etc. So every time you add a new letter or a new digit to the clay, that means the, there's been a genetic mutation. So the Americas were also affected. So there was a small H5N6 uh, episodic wave and then things calmed down for various reasons. Again, starting 2019, there were several introductions of H5N8 and since 2019, every single winter, avian influenza 
that particular strain of avian influenza comes back, particularly in the past two years. And France has been hard hit in the past two years. So I'm not going to get back to what happened in 2006 or 2007. That was the first epizootic episode in France. There were several cases of wild birds being infected and a single poultry farm was affected. So in 2017, that was the first epizootic wave of H5N8 of that particular uh, clade. 484 poultry farms were affected and this means preventive culling or you need to cull the infected birds so as to contain the uh, the, the the spread we're talking 3.5 million poultry birds culled in france so in 2020 2021 there were signs in asia that seemed to show a strong prevalence rate and detection levels in wild birds which seemed to indicate that uh, as uh, birds migrate in winter, they cross Europe on their way to Africa, they, they fly over France. So France is a major transit country for wild birds. So in 2020, 2021, there were 492 cases in, 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 in farms. 2021, 2022, again, we broke every record, 1,378 outbreaks in farms, 63% uh, of them ducks. In the past, it was mostly ducks, but it makes sense because ducks are uh, a, a leading reservoir animal. Even in farms, it is the animal for which we have the highest number of uh, cases detected. And last year, this spread to two major uh, poultry producing regions in France, uh, the Loire country, lots of outbreaks there, and this uh, led to the culling of over 16 million birds uh, last year. And this year again, we're being affected, and what's specific is that there's never been an interruption. Usually, this all ties in with uh, wild birds migrating in winter, and uh, uh, there's an introduction at sensitive times of year, starting in November, into February and then when it comes to ascending migrations once they're done with Africa you got to understand that ascending migration up until then was much less risky we had assumptions we thought maybe most birds have now acquired immunity to the virus and also they didn't tend to congregate as much uh, as 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 much as they do for descending migration so but now we are changing our minds because last year there were introductions as early as March and April and this kept happening and happening, and we started seeing infections in May and July and September. So this has gone on unabated. Detection of those viruses has gone unabated. And also massive mortality rates in wild birds with a significant impact. You must have heard about it. Uh, in the gannets, in the, um, the largest gannet colony in Europe is in Brittany, and 70% was just decimated. That 70% of that Ghana colony died. And, and seagulls uh, were hurt back in May, and now we have a different type of seagull, the laughing kind, that it's, it's just dying in droves. So huge mortality rates in, uh, in seagulls. And also, there may be more opportunities for contact between those diseased animals and human populations. Now, in terms of genetic diversity, of those uh, viruses. In France, there are 13 different genotypes. They're all H5N1, and all 13 virus genotypes have been detected between November 2021 and 2023. And this suggests specific or distinct primary introductions. So we use, so there are six different subtypes and over 60 genotypes that have been detected in Europe uh, since October 2020 in different EU countries. So significant genetic variations have been detected within a single genotype and sometimes you may find this genotype in france but we see that there are introductions taking place even at a local level introductions into farms 
And it's not just that once one uh, farm is affected, then the virus spreads from one farm to another. No, when there's is a strong, when when the virus spreads significantly among wild birds, then there's a significant risk of transmission between farms and cross-contamination as well. So it is really important to look at that. So we have a, a virus and different viral strains that can lead to significant uh, genetic intervariability. And there's genetic resorbent with many other viruses, avian influenza viruses. FR9 is a, a FR9 is the ninth uh, phen genotype that actually emerged in France. That's why we called it that, FR9. And that's the that's the update since uh, August 2022. There are eight genotypes that have been in circulation since then. And on the left hand side, you see the wild birds and you see a lot of purple triangles. That's the FR9 genotype and most of them have been found in mostly in wild birds, wild birds such as uh, uh, gannets and lots of introductions in the north of France. And at the moment, this is having a major effect on uh, domestic seagulls. Also, we're seeing strong mortality in other types of seagulls. There's one particular genotype, for example, that cannot, hasn't been found much this winter. Uh, in, the, in past winters, we saw it a lot in the farms uh, uh, and uh, in farms and in, the, in, in wildlife. And there are genotypes that we used to find only in wild birds, and now we find them in farms, but in farms that have been a number of primary introductions, as well as a lot of transmission from one farm to another. Once uh, you move into an area where there are lots of farms, for example, the Loire region. This is the H5N1 map. Look at all the red dots. As you can see, it's not just France or Europe that are being impacted, Asia as well. And North America, Canada, the US are faced with a major epizootic. In the US, I think they called as many as 50 million birds, poultry birds. And in South America as well, we monitored the situation and it spread to Ecuador, Peru, uh, Argentina now with high mortality rates when it comes to other species as well. And also, the impact is being felt in Africa. In Peru, for example, mortality for pelicans is over 55,000 pelicans that died in just a few weeks. And the same thing happened last year in African countries. Very high mortality rates. Brains. So the mortality rate for those viruses is unprecedented. On this map, you see other colorful dots, which you may not see because they're lying behind the red dots. So these are other influenza sub subtypes with uh, zoonotic potential. And as you can see, you also have H9N2, which circulates in uh, poultry farms in Asia, Africa, and the zoonotic potential of H9N2 is also important, is significant. <laughs> There's a viruses that could cause a problem because they love genetic reassortment and they like to give other viruses their own internal uh, properties and capabilities. And you can end up with uh, a, a, a merged virus that could have an even bigger and even higher uh, mortality rate or zoonotic potential. So let's not specifically focus on that. But I simply want to say that there are other avian influenza viruses that also have that strong zoonotic potential. So getting back to highly pathogenic uh, uh, avian flu virus, H5N1 or N8. Uh, since 2020, there have been many opportunities for the virus to cross the species barrier between December uh, 2022 and March 2023. So there's a number of land and marine mammals found in the world that have been uh, infected. Over 28 different species have been contaminated, including fox, mink, ferret, 
bear, lynx, badger, sea lion, seal, dolphin, cats, and pigs. So the list is getting longer and longer. See those uh, little red stars? Those are the massive mortality rates due to H5N1 infections, whether in wild birds or in uh, poultry farms. So there's a mink farm that was contaminated in Spain, and uh, the virus was transmitted from mink to mink after being introduced into the farm. And that particular that's that was that happened to be that genotype that is affecting various types of seagulls. And potentially this means that are markers that are increasing transmission to mammals. And there are uh, two other uh, stars. And since 2022, there's been potential transmission between mammals. The mortality rates are significant in seals and sea lions in Peru. In particular, to give you an example, we have 3,500 sea lions that died in the course of a few weeks. At the same time as uh, as the pelicans were dying in droves. So most of those uh, sea lion colonies were decimated by the virus. As I said before, there are several transmission markers that are known to be associated with increased pathogenicity or adaptation to mammalian hosts, uh, including mutations uh, on the PB2 protein, the position 627, 271. With regard to the 271 position, uh, this was particularly true for the virus that was isolated in minks. This is another map that shows the the level of diversity in the U.S. following the mass epizootic that began in December last year. As you can see, we have significant detection levels of highly pathogenic avian influenza in mammals such as coyotes, badgers, raccoons, but also foxes, bears. So just like in Europe, <clears throat> The level of detection is increasing. So what about the situation in France? So far, only three infections have been detected. Mammal infections. We're talking H5N1. And that's a recent thing. The first time was a cat, a domestic cat, who lived in a house next to a duck farm. And the duck farm was infected. So that was a, a NHP uh, influenza A uh, outbreak and so the cat was affected as well so that was in december 2022 and the cat be developed nerve disorders uh, the owner took him to the to the to the vet the cat's health deteriorated they asked to detect they asked for uh, an influenza virus uh, test and uh, the cat tested positive i'm showing you the sequence that we detected in ducks, the duck farm, and that sequence is pretty close to what we found in the cat. There's only two mutations, only two nucleotide differences between the duck and the cat. So two nucleotides which showed two mutations found on the PB2 protein, particularly in position 67. And this increases polymerase activity in mammals. This is worrisome because it means you don't even need uh, for the virus to transmit from one mammal to another. One infection is enough. The mutation is selected. And, and also, other mutations could have a, a potential role in viral adaptation to temperature. It's also been at the end of October or November 2022. Uh, we found out about it later down the line, and the virus detected was close to the virus found in birds pretty much at the same time. And more recently, several red foxes were found dead next to seagulls, and we know there was a high mortality rate in those seagulls in wetlands. So what happens? We perform analyses, and as for the cats, we looked at whether other animals were in contact with the cat, and all of the animals, the other cats and dogs, were found, uh, they tested negative, serologically and virologically as well. 
So we also tested the owners and the, the we did contact tracing and we sent a memo together, a joint memo with the CNR and France, Santé Publique France to investigate those cases. So these are cases of human infection that are caused by those viruses. We need to evaluate the risk posed by that clay 2344B. The risk is considered as low for the general population and also weak to moderate for uh, people exposed to infected birds. But when it comes to mammal populations, there we need to be more vigilant when it comes to those viruses. There are other viruses that have been listed, but in red you have uh, H5N1 for this particular clade. As you can see, there have been five detections at a global level for this clade and recent cases of confirmed infections for this particular virus. So the five detections uh, involved 14 individuals working in non-productive environments. So they were either asymptomatic or symptomatic. So these individuals were found in Russia. So H5N8 was found in uh, Russia, three people in, in Algeria, Nigeria rather. Um, there were four severe cases of confirmed infection one in Ecuador, one in Vietnam, and two in China, and that was in March 2023. So those cases have a major impact on children. Children may be more exposed to developing severe symptoms, at least that's one of our assumptions. So more recently in Cambodia, there were severe uh, infections it's the same line, but it's not the same clay, 2344B, but it does circulate in Asia at the moment. And that's a cause for concern. So every time the severe cases uh, are, are due to uh, close contact with birds that were infected or dead, prolonged exposure, close contact with diseased birds. What's important is that no secondary transmission has been reported around those confirmed human cases. So, now in terms of avian influenza, what are the challenges? How do we control the zoonotic risk? We find that there is a, uh, that we find there's an increasing number of species barrier crossing events. Uh, the prevalence at global level is unprecedented. The dynamics for circulation of the virus is based on the viral load and the viral load found to the environment and then excreted massively shed. Mammalian passage raises the issue of selection, selection of AI virus strains. And this could mean increased virulence and increased transmission capacity in mammal species. As a result, we need uh, to pay close eye on the situation and detect any case of a uh, so that we can step in and do something about it right away. And this means increased vigilance is required at the interface between humans and animals. Obviously, you those people exposed during outbreak management, a dead bird collection, they need to wear PPEs, they need to wear personal protective equipment. It's important, particularly if you work in a, uh, in a, in a, in a poultry farm, and also the medical response to suspected human infection by avian and or swine influenza flu virus uh, has been updated. I told you that pigs are sensitive to those viruses as well. So this joint work was updated in December 2021. So like I said, it's joint work uh, between uh, Santé Publique France and the CNR, National Reference Center, etc. So professionals exposed to swine and avian influenza viruses are now eligible. They're being targeted for the first time by the French National Authority for Health as part of the 2022-23 vaccination campaign against a seasonal human influenza. Ongoing collaboration is necessary between CNR, Santé Publique France. It's important in order to analyze the zoonotic risk every time the virus is found in other animals besides mammals, or you find markers in birds that could be worrisome. Obviously, we need to work together closely with the CNR, as well as uh, Santé Publique France, SPF. So what do we recommend? Well, there are things that are being done. Oh, perfect. 
I was afraid of talking too much, but um, I'm getting to the end of my talk. Uh, we need to strengthen vigilance at the pig poultry interface. Uh, so we're also, um, we're already monitoring pig farms. Um, when there are pigs that are held in the same place, in the farm, in the same place as a... Uh, when it's a mixed farm, for example, that uh, rears both pigs and, and poultry, there's a higher risk. So we need to strengthen vigilance. And also, we also need to look at farms that are close by, close by to pig farms or pig farms that are close to uh, outbreaks in uh, poultry farms, for example. We also need to ensure surveillance of wild carnivorous mammals, such as foxes or seals. There are things we've done already with different entities. With with uh, a network that uh, monitors uh, beached uh, mammals and beached uh, sea animals. Uh, we're working with the General Directorate for Food on a pilot project uh, for the surveillance of symptomatic captive domestic carnivores in contact with infected birds, domestic birds. So like I said, the Santé Publique France is working on it, the CNR as well, the different health authorities. So. Obviously, to address those challenges, it's everybody's business. We all need to work together. After all, we do have a one health strategy. So how do we manage the outbreaks at farm level, poultry farm level? We need backup. We need better equipment. We need guidelines, recommendations for the people exposed. Everybody, every individual needs to uh, be empowered, informed, and we need to take action over the long term. And this means paying closer attention to the interface between animals and human beings. In some regions of France, particularly Brittany, it's particularly important because there are so many farms, whether poultry farms or swine farms that are located in the same place. And also PPEs are key to avoid potential contamination. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a couple more questions because it's very interesting. Please keep your questions short and the answers as well. Thank you very much for your talk. That was extremely clear and very interesting. The new H5N1 uh, avian strains. It seems to me that one assumption... Uh, to explain the recent propagation is that severity is less in birds. Now, it's still a big problem, but not as big as before. Uh, do you confirm? It depends on the type of bird. If you look at the high mortality rate in that uh, population of garnets or northern organets, um, it's a big problem. We know that there are certain types of birds that can better resist those uh, high pathogenic infections. And this could actually continue to spread the virus. They don't get sick, but they're contaminated, and so they spread the disease further. So it's what we find is that there's a change in tropism, quote-unquote, which means that there were species that used to die quickly. Uh, broilers, for example, they used to die quickly, and now they're no longer showing clinical signs, and which means that we fail to detect them quickly because our surveillance is event-based. We monitor the emergence of clinical signs. And if the chickens are, are asymptomatic, but they carry the disease, uh, the shedding can take place over a long period of time, and this means the virus will spread even more. Now, we wonder, immunity, we suspect that immunity may not last that long. We don't know why for this particular virus. We don't know why, because it, it's been circulating for over two years now, and we expect uh, adult bird populations to be immune by now. And because they're exposed on an ongoing basis to this virus, this means the equivalent to booster shots. And it's not the case. They're not, it's not the case. So we need to uh, monitor that uh, gannet colony. It's zero surveillance is difficult with wild birds to actually uh, draw blood. So we're looking at the serology. 
but for that you need permits. So I'm sorry, was, this was meant to be a short answer and I'm taking too long. It's difficult. We don't have much data regarding how long immunity lasts in wild birds, but it seems that uh, it's not that long. I have a short question if you have a short answer. We don't really know why there are no breaks in the infections. There was time there would be breaks between the infections. Do you have any explanation well we did ask ourselves because we thought that it was connected with migrations and it is still connected with migrations however what we have observed is that because the virus has the capacity to reassort itself the one that we observe in gulls it has reassorted with a gull virus and it seems now to be very well adapted to gull type birds and it circulates more easily in those birds whereas normally they're not very susceptible to that kind of uh, virus so the virus by reassorting itself with another virus uh, which is more specific for certain types of birds will survive in some reservoirs which it didn't use to do <clears throat> increased surveillance so one very quick question Yes, I'm from ANRS. I don't think uh, we have had any demonstration of internal uh, spillover with mammals. I mean, if it were to happen, yes, yes, yes. Well, if it were, would it be an alert for spillover in man? You mean uh, spillover between man, but between mammals, it has been demonstrated with that virus. Mink, seals, although it's wild, animals we have reasons to believe it must happen we also have uh, experiments with minks uh, with the ferret sorry so it depends on the genotype but uh, sometimes we feel like it's the same virus but there are differences and depending on the pheno genotype it could increase or not the uh, spillover between mammals it has not happened in men fortunately not yet but if it continues circulating that way i mean we're you know we're going through new stages every time with this uh, epidemic that is amplifying. We are paying more attention than before the COVID. That is also true. So we look for the viruses and we, but still there is a new infectious dynamic process at play. If the more viruses you have, the greater the chance that at some stage the spillover would happen. Well, thank you very much. That was extremely interesting. Now we will listen to Dr. Placid Badakin Kebini, who is a professor at the Medical School of the Kinshasa University and also the chairman of the uh, Epidemiology and Global Health uh, Institution at the Biomedical Institute in the, Republic in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Dr. Mbala Kingebeni has a PhD in virology and more than 10 years experience as a project manager for viral uh, zoonoses of, uh, such as uh, Ebola and he focuses on uh, the passive and active uh, surveillance uh, and uh, the uh, quick switch to uh, outbreaks caused by these diseases. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to talk about a different virus. I uh, was under a bit of pressure from uh, Professor Eric to talk about Ebola, but that will be next time. No, no, you shouldn't give in to pressure. We're going to talk about MPOX. We'll try to talk about human infection as it can be observed in our country and also the way the disease is perceived by the community in the Democratic Republic of Congo because we know that the disease is unfortunately endemic in Congo. The first human case of MPOX was identified in our country in 1970. It's 70 in French, septante for those who were colonized by the Belgians. Mpox uh, is prevalent in areas such as uh, Central Africa and Western Africa. So the areas that are close to the equatorial forest on the left hand side of the slide, you see two maps. The first map shows the epidemiology. 
situation of MPOX in uh, the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Congo in 2022. We have uh, three areas. Almost all the country was affected and several suspicious cases were reported. On the right hand side, we have the situation this year. So starting January until last week. And uh, the total number of cases was more than 1400 and uh, cases and 58 deaths. 17 provinces uh, which were declared as being affected. During, uh, I mean, between 2007 and 2011, we conducted an observational study observ observing MPOX in the Democratic Republic of Congo. S this disease has been around for several decades now in Central Africa and in other Europe, uh, Western African countries. And for uh, Congo, we chose Kole. Kole is an area where the disease has been endemic for more than four decades. And uh, WHO conducted the uh, widest active surveillance campaign uh, until 2010. And the study was conducted uh, in the General Hospital in Kole in collaboration between our institution ERB, USAM Red, and the local hospital the local team. We included 244 patients, 216 of which had a uh, PCR positive confirmed MPOX infection. Three people died, five uh, women uh, were pregnant and four had a miscarriage. And as you can see, the majority of cases were under 30, so young people, usually 20 year old, and uh, there were many more children than adults in this study being affected by the disease. And even during the study that we're performing now, the clinical trial, we have more young people than adults. We have uh, teenagers under the age of 15 being affected by this disease more than adults. Regarding exposure, the disease, as you probably know, is a zoonotic viral disease. Initially, the zoonotic spillover comes from animals, small rodents, uh, small mammals. And regarding the exposure we observed during the study, we were able to show that the majority of patients mentioned two possible exposure methods, either with animals uh, and they reported having been in contact with all kinds of animals, so rats, uh, rodents, uh, monkeys, but also they reported having been in contact with a uh, sick member of their family, of their relatives. Clinically speaking, the patients were followed for 14 days in the Kole General Hospital. We uh, recorded symptoms, clinical signs, we took uh, blood samples to uh, measure the viral load and all the other biochemical and uh, hematological uh, parameters. Uh, I will summarize what we observed regarding uh, symptoms. And the majority of patients presented rash, sore throat, uh, they were feeling dizzy and malaise, uh, lymphadenopathy, and the clinical signs, uh, there were also uh, cutaneous uh, lesions of skin rash and uh, lymphadenopathy in the vast majority of cases, 98%. Hyperalbuminemia or low albumin levels in the blood was a risk factor for severe diseases. And out of the three uh, deaths that were reported, <coughs> It was shown that uh, all of them had a high viral load. And uh, we also counted the skin uh, rash lesions to characterize them. And we found that the people who died also showed more than 1,000 uh, cutaneous uh, lesions. And we also observed they had a very high uh, transaminase level, 20 times higher than the normal 
readings. Clinical presentation, you can see that the uh, <coughs> lesions uh, can be observed as uh, is shown on the picture. It's a kind of centrifugal distribution. There are more lesions in the extremities, in the limbs, than uh, in the central part of the body. And this is also what helps us make the difference uh, with varicella. And it also is helping us differentiate uh, between mpox and smallpox, the uh, lymph nodes, uh, because the lymph nodes can really be seen uh, around the neck and uh, other areas can be uh, involved uh, wherever there are lymph nodes, uh, they can be seen and they usually appear two or three days following the prodrome and the skin rash or skin lesions appear in the following days. Regarding PCR on the various uh, samples we took, here we measure skin lesions, blood samples uh, and uh, neck lymph nodes, we see uh, the um, throat and, uh, and in the last position we have the uh, blood uh, samples. The clinical differential diagnosis is difficult. <clears throat> On the uh, upper left corner, we see a picture showing a secondary syphilis. On the right hand side, we have MPOX, and you see, I mean, the pictures are very similar. It's difficult to tell them apart. Right uh, bottom uh, is varicella, and sometimes uh, atypical varicella can mimic MPOX, <coughs> and it's very difficult to tell the difference between the two. Regarding complications, we did have uh, some complications, for instance, uh, adenopathy, lymph nodes were swollen, uh, there were abscesses, we had two uh, uh, incise and uh, dry. in some cases, uh, corneal uh, injury led to blindness, there was also secondary dermatitis, and in one case, the lesions uh, were present in the uh, eye, and were very similar to other ophthalmology uh, injuries. There is uh, a fetus uh, which we examined and we could find uh, skin lesions on the fetus. And on the graph at the top right hand corner, you can see a peak of the viral load in the mother, in the pregnant mother. When the uh, fetus uh, stops moving. So, how is uh, the community perceiving the disease in this area where MPOX is uh, endemic? We uh, asked help from our friends working on social sciences and they tried to organize focus groups and think tanks and uh, discussions with the community, with the, the local uh, traditional leaders, the uh, local medicine man. And uh, we understood that the community was uh, familiar with the disease. They were aware of the disease. I mean, the disease has been like, around for 40 years. So they call it in various ways. They say it's uh, a disease coming from monkeys, from animals. So they give it uh, names, but they also think it's uh, caused by witches. And uh, they believe that uh, the disease uh, is an evil spell cast by witches, uh, a giant demon, or they think it's uh, an epidemic uh, due to a contamination uh, from uh, animals or because they drank uh, contaminated water. Witchcraft is uh, always in first position. People believe that this uh, disease did not exist uh, 50 years ago and they say it's because our young people are no longer respecting uh, the uh, traditions uh, introduced by our ancestors and that's the reason why we are falling sick. But some of them say that the animals uh, are the origin of the disease and they say that uh, a witch uh, has actually used the animals to kill someone and there is the story of a woman who lost her child and she says that uh, she lost a child because uh, a spell was cast on her by neighbors with whom she'd had a, a, um, a fight. So 
you know, it, people fall sick and it uh, damages the community and uh, the richer people in the, the most influential people in the group say, yes, but it's due to the young people because the young people are no longer complying with the uh, traditions. And about prevention, the uh, sick people are kept in the prayer room for several days and they are fed water and soap or ashes, uh, a mixture of various products which allegedly should uh, cure them. And, you know, there are ancestral rites re being recommended. The, uh, the local shamans say that uh, we should ask mercy from our ancestors to get rid of the disease. But with everything happening now, communities uh, uh, no longer trust the healers so much because they see that uh, those uh, people who are held captive in the prayer room with the healer for several days actually walk out of the prayer room with complications and uh, even the healers themselves become contaminated and some of the healers have died after spending several days with the people in with the sick people in the prayer room so in the community there are an increasing number of people who say you should go to the hospital except that not everybody can afford going to the hospital and paying for healthcare services and about quarantine it's very difficult to, to comply with the quarantine uh, requirements because people stick together family members tend to stick together it's very difficult to quarantine a nine-year-old child and keep him apart from his parents. There was even a lady who died because she would not uh, stay away from her child. Actually, the child was uh, recovered, but the mother didn't. And you know, in our communities, uh, if you don't assist a family in need, a family who is sick, you're considered as having abandoned them. In my experience, when we take care of people suffering from MPOX, I remember one day we said, okay, all the confirmed cases will be quarantined and the other members of the family will be kept in a separate place so that they are not in contact. And the next day or the, the same night uh, when I came back, uh, I found them all together having dinner, sitting around the fire. And I understood it was very difficult to keep them separated. Just to illustrate how difficult it is sometimes to uh, apply uh, public health measures in some communities. In conclusion, MPOX is an endemic disease, has been an endemic disease for decades in some areas of the uh, Re Democratic Republic of Congo, especially close to the rainforest, and there is no approved specific treatment. The observational study uh, conducted in Kole allowed us to uh, collect uh, information on the natural uh, course of the disease in Central Africa and we were able to start a protocol for a clinical trial which is in progress and despite the uh, fact that the community is actually familiar with the disease, it has a good knowledge of the disease, we understand that they uh, still uh, tend to uh, turn to uh, uh, supernatural forces, healers and ancestors and the community will start with indigenous treatments and spiritual rights before they go to the hospital and that unfortunately delays management and uh, actually increases the mortality rate of the disease. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you, thank you for this uh, very accurate description of MPOX in your country. We have time for a couple of questions. Would somebody like to uh, ask uh, for more information on your presentation? Thank you very much for this presentation. Olivier Chiral, have you identified asymptomatic forms of the disease? Well, yes, during the trial, we identified a few asymptomatic cases. The PCR as was positive, but there were no cutaneous uh, lesions. <clears throat> you know, it's. I thought about that when I kept finding them together every night. I said, okay, I'm going to test uh, the other members in the family to see whether some of them might have an asymptomatic form of the disease and would develop the disease later. So we did find a few people with asymptomatic forms. There was one patient 
who moved from being asymptomatic to uh, developing the disease. And in this patient, we found that his viral load was very high one or two days before the rashes or the pustules appeared on the skin. So that was interesting, but that was one single isolated case out of the different cases that we followed. Did you observe um, an increase? Uh, I mean, the figures you showed uh, over the last few months, was there an increase in the last few months? Yes, absolutely. There are areas where there were no cases and now they are reporting cases. The only uh, problem is that most cases are suspicious. They are not confirmed. There is still a gap between the number of suspicious cases and confirmed cases. Because we don't have enough resources for diagnostic purposes. So there's a lack of diagnosis. List the lady here in that thing that will be the last one. Microphone, please. Could we have a microphone? Good afternoon. I'd like to know when you talk about community, who exactly are you referring to? Families, districts, villages? Are you talking about a group of people? Well, we uh, talked to two men, we talk to women, we talk to healers, we talk to families who uh, had once suffered from the disease, we talked to, with the local leaders, we talked to, with the uh, political and administrative authorities. So, I mean, we, we talked with just about everybody and what I'm telling you is a summary of the older discussions we've had. Yes, I understand, but when you say the community, it's the Kohli population you're referring to. Yes, absolutely. It's the Kohli population. I have a question regarding vaccination. I was wondering, are there vaccination campaigns being offered? Or does the population have access to some kind of vaccine? Well, unfortunately, uh, the vaccine has not been approved yet in uh, the country. We started a small trial with the healthcare professionals. And uh, following the trial, we will talk to the uh, local health ministry and ask them whether we can uh, extend the trial to other communities which we believe are at risk of uh, catching the disease. Thank you very much. Dernière intervention. The last speaker will be a short presentation. Guillaume Fournier is going, uh, Guillaume Fournier is a veterinarian epidemiologist uh, and he has a junior professorship in uh, the economy of uh, the health economy uh, in uh, in Rae, in Lyon, and he's also a honorary research for the Royal Veterinary College in London. And he will tell us about the influence in the uh, transmission and control of influence, avian influenza in the uh, commercial uh, networks. Uh, for the uh, zoonotic transmission. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for having given me the opportunity to introduce my work. Beatrice earlier talked about uh, avian influenza viruses. So in my presentation, I will focus on the systems which for more than 20 years have allowed to uh, maintain uh, multiple strains of avian influenza and the emergence of new variants. Some background. Mondial de volaille. Changes in the poultry output across the world. There's been a significant increase in recent decades, but things are different from one region to another. Asia is the main contributor to that increase in poultry output. And in Asia, we have Southern Asia, where output increased over 60 fold over the past 60 years. Now, such intensification comes with a transformation in example live poultry animals are sold on marketplaces in bangladesh this is where the photos were taken and this is responsible for over 95 percent of all poultry sales 
over 95% of poultry sold in that country or sold live. So that trade is important to the economy because we're dealing with poor populations and this is how they make a living. And those poor populations have access to a source of uh, affordable animal protein. Also, this is a source of a significant source of transmission for avian flu. When we try to control bird flu in those live poultry markets, uh, there's a paradox, a so-called presence paradox. This is a term that was used to describe the tensions that uh, a number of NGOs are faced with. They have access to a lot of data on the crisis that they're monitoring, but there's very little understanding in the field, very little understanding of the behaviors that led to that data. And this means that the technical recommendations may not have the expected uh, effect on the populations targeted. It all depends on the different uh, uh, political, social, and economic factors. So. This presence paradox means there's a large quantity of data available at the macro level and also at the micro level. At a micro level, when it comes to molecular um, characterization of the viruses, but there's very little understanding of the underlying systems behind uh, virus transmission. So in order for us to understand the emergence of new viral variants, we first need to understand it and need to understand how uh, high-risk uh, environments emerge. We need to understand the zoonotic risk. The One Health, the One Have One Health Poultry Project is a partnership with 25 different organizations in Europe, in Asia, particularly Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. That's where the research efforts are being made, and this research program involves a joint research efforts. Uh, uh, in biological sciences and social sciences. So samples are taken from poultry and human beings. Well, the human beings that are caring for the poultry uh, along the different nodes, the production and distribution centers. So not just avian flu, other health risks as well. So same animals, same humans are being tested for various uh, diseases. Uh, uh, various viruses, bacteria, chem campylobacter, for example, avian flu virus. And in those sites that have been selected for sampling, there are also ethnographic and economic studies that are carried out in order to characterize uh, the different interactions between players, regulation thereof, and network governance. Now, as the main example, because this is a short presentation, let's take Bangladesh. As an example, this is where part of the work was carried out. We started out by characterizing the different types of uh, players involved and how they were being connected by, we needed to characterize the, the dynamics of those transactions between the different stakeholders, in particular, how their behavior is being influenced by different factors. For example, lack of access to finance, uh, price fluctuations, multiple roles, more and more competition in networks, and also constant pressure from integrators who are trying to more effectively and efficiently capture the value being generated in the different nodes within the center distribution and production nodes. So what emerges is that in the face of such uh, factors, most stakeholders prefer short-term objectives as opposed to long-term goals. They implement reactive measures as opposed to preventative measures because of the constraints, because they see those as constraints. So based on a quality-driven evaluation of systems, we perform a quantitative evaluation. We quantify the animal flows from production to distribution centers, and also the networks of different sites among which there are trading flows, or animal flows, marketplaces in particular, and how those connections mean epidemiological relationships between zones that are remote from each other uh, geographically, and also uh, the population, the poultry populations in the different zones. So traditional questionnaires were used, and more recently we've been using apps dedicated phone apps so that users, participants to the project can input 
data uh, directly. So we have more longitudinal and more fine-tuned data. So in addition to network characterization, we performed observational studies and characterized viral amplification various avian, uh, various bird flu subtypes uh, in areas where prevalence is very low, for example, sometimes even undetectable. And sometimes in marketplace, uh, the virus is everywhere. And the prevalence rate is very high among poultry. It's also found in the atmosphere and in the nasal cavity of the people working there without necessarily uh, uh, causing zero conversion. So we need to determine the mechanism behind viral amplification. And so the epidemiological data is then used to adjust dynamic viral transmission models, which factor in the population dynamics, the poultry population dynamics, so we can estimate uh, uh, epidemiological parameters that are not being observed. For example, the rate of transmission of the virus in marketplaces or upstream from marketplaces. So we've been able to determine that there's significant transmission at the marketplace, but there's a major contribution to that amplification. There's transmission going on before the poultry gets to the marketplace. And that's not just in Bangladesh. And usually during control measures, when they're being set up, that's something that you forget or you neglect. And this means that you're unable to substantially reduce the level of contamination. So the samples are also sequenced so that we can understand the structure of such genetic diversity. We have phylodynamic indexes, and we've been able to show the importance of location. The source of supply is a predictive factor for viral amplification, and also the role played by trading practices, commercial practices, uh, What? Uh, where traders travel from one marketplace to another. This has an impact on me, the major impact on genetic uh, uh, diversity. You have much more genetic diversity in a single marketplace than between marketplaces. So we need to optimize surveillance. And usually this relies on economic and financial resources that are relatively limited. So we need to better optimize detection. And we do it, we need to do it as early as possible. We need to optimize detection of new variants. We also need to identify new mutations, which may have an impact on anti-genicity virulence and the zoonotic potential of those variants, those different variants, which are currently being evaluated in labs. Let's take a step further. How do we combine our understanding of those networks? those production and distribution networks, and also the epidemiological and genetic data. Well, to that effect, we have developed a model. We created an in silico network model with the different stakeholders, and we follow the trajectories followed by the poultry along those networks, and also we simulate viral circulation between the different birds and the, the, the various strains to evaluate the risk of co-infection and the risk of genetic reassortment, the, the, the risk of genetic reassortment, which plays a major role in viral transmission. Also, we are able to rebuild the transmission lines. That way we can adjust the models based on follow dynamic results and that way we can assess the impact of various network characteristics whether or not they're fictional or observed the impact on evolutionary dynamics transmission dynamics and also the genetic structure of the virus lastly viral amplification and mixing is significant along those networks this causes there is uh, the power situations in those marketplaces. And that's something that we need to target uh, with our control measures. It's not being done yet. That's the only way to limit transmission of those viruses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Many thanks to the moderators for this last session. This. Uh, we're getting closer to the end of this uh, seminar. We've heard a lot of uh, speakers, uh, a lot of papers. Uh, We've had a lot of participants, whether in person or remotely. Let us hear from Didier Samuel, Chairman and CEO of INSERM, as well as Yazdan Pazdampana.
Thank you. Thank you for your kind invitation. Thank you, Yastin. Thank you, everyone, for your warm welcome. We're bringing to a close of this uh, scientific uh, seminar uh, organized by ANRSMIE. Soon we will hear a video address uh, from the minister. Uh, over the past two days, we've heard a lot of interesting things. We talked about vaccination. There are major challenges, both for INSERM and for ANRS. We need to develop vaccination strategies, coordinate research, develop new vaccine concepts. These are major challenges for INSERM, particularly post-COVID, particularly when it comes to the need to fight future health crises. In addition, session number two showcased the work of nonprofits and academic researchers on interventional research priorities, uh, focusing on vulnerable populations, community research, interventional research. We talked about uh, EU level and international research priorities, the need to network, pool our technical platforms or skills, particularly in the face of epidemics. And this afternoon, there was a session on advances in treatments of acute infections such as Hep C, Ebola, uh, HIV, long COVID, the whole cure concept. And this last session looked at One Health, the One Health strategy, which means we have more fields of collaborative research and new terms and conditions for making it happen. So ANRSMIE was created in January 2021. It was created as part of INSERM. It is born out of a uh, ANRS, so the agency in charge of managing HIV research, but also research on TB and HEP and hepatitis. Clearly, this is a strong signal from the government. They trusted ANRS and INSERM to be responsible for EIDs following the COVID crisis. And this is very meaningful. And so ANRSMIE now has a broader scope of operations. And they work effectively, efficiently, dynamically. It is in charge of implementing a science policy as part of an institutional organization such as INSERM. So the agency has scored a number of successes. And how is this reflected? Very clearly, INSERM manages a number of priority research equipment programs, particularly the PEPR for emerging, emerg emerging diseases, which is a project that is being driven by both INSERM and ANRS. And this reflects the expertise and research resources that are absolutely key to making strides forward in that field. So congratulations to ANRS and Yazdan for uh, starting out that PEPR on emerging diseases. The first uh, request for projects uh, was initiated a couple of days ago. Out of the six PPR PBRs uh, started by INSERM, that's the first one, uh, 20 million euros already. And it's important for us to, to be successful. In addition, this PEPR PR will happen concurrently to the uh, Présa de PEPR on zoonotic diseases. Clearly, we need coordination between the two PEPR programs because there are clear bridges from one disease to another, even flu, monkeypox, and of course, COVID. Clear connections. So against this backdrop, INSERM provides uh, a dense uh, national network uh, has a partnership with uh, teaching hospitals, universities, and this is where there's more room for platforms, for new collaborations on emerging diseases. ANRS MIE as an INSERM structure and together with INSERM structure are working together with PSC, Paris Santé Campus. Congratulations to ANRS. This is an agency that I know very well. I congratulate ANRS for its international commitment, everything that it's doing in terms of cooperation between North and South. For INSERM, this is very important. And we have a clear commitment to working together with ANRS to develop innovating 
innovative terms and ref terms of reference for collaboration partnerships, north-south partnerships that will be based on shared values <coughs> and the need to ensure effective and efficient research. Mm. Also, we have worked on collaborating joint international global health uh, platforms in Guinea, Ivory Coast, and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And this effort is called PRISM, PRISMA. Uh, two, two weeks ago, Yazdan and myself signed in the presence of the president, uh, the agreement for PRISM in the DRC. Of course, this lays the groundwork for further partnerships. And as far as INSERM is concerned, uh, we love to benefit from ANRS's experience when it comes to developing partnerships, even outside the realm of infectious diseases. So post COVID, there are key challenges for both entities. We need to spearhead research spearhead treatments. We also need to be able to watch the situation, provide our scientific skills uh, as a baseline, but also in case of emerging crises. And we know those crises are going to happen. We know that new emerging infectious diseases are going to break out. I would like to thank Yazdan, Yazdan Pana, every team at ANRS. Many thanks for this two-day seminar. Many thanks for your invitation and for all the hard work you've been doing, all the hard work that you will be doing. Enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And without further ado, a video address from our health minister. Mr. Chairman and CEO, dear Didier Samuel, Director, dear Yazdan, Yazdan Pana, ladies and gentlemen, in your capacity as such, I relish this opportunity to address you at the close of this most informative seminar. This event is an important meeting to spread the good word of science and fuel our collective discussions on research advances, as well as the ANRS's scope of research, looking at different things, uh, emerging infectious diseases from different points of view, cure prevention interventions, all within a One Health approach. ANRS MIE was created on January 1st, 2021, in the midst of the health crisis, uh, complementing ANRS, which has since 1988 been leading research on AIDS and viral hepatitis. And the creation of this new standalone agency of the INSERM Institute under the joint supervision of the Ministries of Health and Research has several goals, financing, coordinating, and leading research on infectious diseases. Today, this places France at the forefront of one of the key health issues of our time, the emergence of new infections. I would like to reiterate how much we rely on ANRS MIE. It is a pillar of our resilience. So while the possibility of new health crises caused by new emerging and disruptive coronavirus variants or new zoonotic and infectious diseases remains a very real threat. I take home the theme of one of your morning lectures, collaborate to innovate the France 2030 program and the National Acceleration Strategy. The Ministry of Health and Prevention fully supports the cooperative vision of the health issues addressed by ANRS MIE. Indeed, one of the major achievements in managing the COVID pandemic is the stronger cooperation between the different administrative, political and scientific bodies. The creation of the Health Risk Monitoring and Anticipation Committee in September 2022 is one concrete outcome. Therefore, my ministry will continue to invest fully in research with and through its operators while also supporting all initiatives for progress, especially those that allow us to advance on vaccine innovations. I know that this is a priority theme for ANRS MIE. Uh, practically speaking, this means a government investment of 7.5 billion euros into the health component of France 2030, the Health Innovation Plan, which helps to shore up the progress already made uh, to maintain the scientific momentum born out of the pandemic and to modernize our health research system faster.
More specifically, the Ministry of Health and Prevention's investment is reflected in the Hospital and Clinical Research Program, the PHRC, for Emerging Infectious Diseases. With this tool, my ministry strongly promotes crisis preparedness and response efforts from the perspective of clinical research and supports the commitment of hospital teams Better anticipating health risks and dealing with the emergence of new diseases is at the heart of ANRSMIE's mission. The science seminar reflects the wide range of scientific research fields and emerging issues. The common denominator behind those different issues, as I'm sure you understand perfectly, is the importance of understanding these questions as part of a One Health approach at the global level. Indeed. Amid the threats of climate change, which increases the risk of zoonotic diseases and the effects of pollution on health, more than ever, we must conduct all our research work in line with the global environmental rationale that reflects our lifestyles and our relationship with all living things. We must be aware that animal pathogens are a significant risk whether they be bacterial, viral, or parasitic, or whether they spread to humans by direct contact through food, water, or even the air around us. Avian flu, for example, is now a major threat. But emerging infectious diseases are not the only thing within the agency scope. Let us not forget HIV, hepatitis, or tuberculosis. This year, is an important milestone for healthcare professionals who care for patients and people living with HIV, particularly in the context of collaboration between my ministry, ANRSMIE, the National AIDS Council, and the HAS top health authority around new guidelines for HIV and hepatitis management. In addition, the fight against tuberculosis will take pride of place in the national and international agenda in 2023. And I am pleased to see, as shown by this science seminar, that French research on that front is extremely active. I also want to say that although all indicators are now green worldwide, we should continue to bear COVID-19 top of mind, especially with regard to long COVID. I am counting on the work of ANRSMIE to advance knowledge in this area. To my mind, research, science, and medicine serve as vectors for rethinking our relationship with ecosystems and the living world by relearning the meaning of its limits, considering its fragility, its dynamics, and looking at it systemically. This one health approach is also what makes scientists true humanists who see medicine as a collective health movement. Ladies and gentlemen, this science seminar is a highlight in the life of ANRSMIE and in the scientific ecosystem in general, not only in France, but also in Europe and in the rest of the world. I know what a strong driving force your agency is in coordinating research globally. And this is evidenced by the recent strengthening of the scientific partnership between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and France around the creation of an international global health research platform in which the media at best plays a central role. I would like to thank Yazdan Yazdan Pana, as well as all those who have worked hard to organize the seminar and devote their daily efforts to promoting and advancing French medical research. Once again, thank you. Et le mot de la fin, évidemment, direct. And finally, the concluding remark uh, for the director of ANRS, Yastan Yastampana. Thank you very much. I will be quick. Two days spent together. I told you at the beginning that the uh, agency and the program were actually articulated around a strategy and a program. That's in our DNA, and I, I hope you understand this by now, and you will understand that this is, a, this is something we're going to push even further because it's in our DNA. And, you know, my uh, friend here was involved in the agency a long time ago, so he knows that he's going to be even more involved, and we're very happy about that. I told you that we are currently developing this. It's not a short-term perspective. It's a medium-term or even long-term perspective. We'll do, we'll go as quick as we can, but we don't have a short-term goal. It's a mid-term or long-term goal. I told you there was so much to do 
And the uh, aim for the two days was to cover as many subjects as we could, but we can't cover them all. We have to define priorities. And you're going to set the priorities. I know it's not easy for some of you to set priorities, but that's the way it is. We can't do everything. ANRS is not only an agency for funding. It's a different kind of model. It's a different way to coordinate projects and fund them. And again, animation is between your hands. So I'm going to repeat this because DJ is here. I believe that we have to set a number one priority, young people. We have to be ambitious for the sake of young people, the younger generations. A few figures, yesterday 350 attendees, today 250. We thought that because of the strikes here in France, many people would uh, cancel the trip, but no, actually many people came. There were 300 people following us online anyway, so I'd like to say hello to them as well. And I would like to thank the ANRS team it's been tough. The minister said it. We had to go through the crisis and we actually were developed during the crisis. So I have to pay tribute with them to my, the whole team because they really gave it all. I'd like to thank the scientific committee, the speakers, the audience, the communication team with Cécile Nicole, Jenny Diane, Cécile Pinot who have uh, worked hard and also those who write uh, a summary every night. Very, very uh, nice resumes, high quality. Daniel Messager, who's also been uh, helping us. Idea Com, uh, who's uh, done a lot during the two days. And I'd like to thank the ministries because for the last two days, they have been giving us resources the health ministry is also in charge of research. There is also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry for Environmental Transition. They attended our meeting and that's interesting because we want to collaborate with everybody. And again, at, at the same time, we have to set priorities. And finally, I'd like to thank INSER. ANRS is at the heart of INSERM, has very strong links with INSERM. I think that's vital. Although we we still have the uh, agency uh, to uh, serve all researchers, uh, but it's your agency. We're here for you.